many worlds, set in a dystopian future where Earth is overpopulated but colonization of reachable planets has proved impossible. Although Nobody Living has gone to another planet, a new SF VRMMORPG, science fiction virtual reality massively multiplayer online role-playing game, and I'm only saying that once, has been produced by a mysterious company. The game is called Mini Worlds and is said to have accurate simulations of multiple, real planet-sized zones. Many Worlds Chapter 1 Jules Verne looked down on a book written by his namesake. There were actually quite a few of those, and he'd read none of them. He wasn't interested in 300-year-old science fiction, since modern times were more interesting than that by far. Still, the books were considered classics. He put it on the shelf with the rest. He looked at the shelves all around him and sighed. Nobody would ever read any of these books. It seemed like a waste. Not that people didn't read, that would have been a tragedy to Jules. It was also not that the same words contained in these pages would not be read. No, it was just that these specific books would never be read. One reason was that, specifically, they were books. Physical medium had more than just fallen out of style. It was practically unheard of. Most of them were here, in this massive library. Deep underground, made to last throughout the centuries. A vault, really. Jules couldn't see that it would ever be needed, except if there were a complete collapse of electronic media, but he didn't complain about it much. After all, he still got paid to organize, collect, and sometimes print these books. Not alone, of course. There were far too many books for one person to do that, even in a lifetime. Still, he didn't run into his co-workers much. After all, the science fiction section was his, mostly. Sure, some others came through to toss a book or two on the shelves, but he was the one who spent all his time here, finding them, cataloging them, and sometimes reading them. Almost never at work, though. If anyone asked, it was definitely never at work. Even then, he only read an electronic copy. No point in turning pages. That was for people from the past. Jules went back to shelving and organizing books. There was still a lot of room on these shelves. This was a massive project, meant to be expandable, if necessary. The books were made, specially, to last. Printing techniques had developed to the point where books could last almost indefinitely, even more so if they weren't touched at all. Not that such technology was necessary outside of this kind of project. Even if one is an avid reader, most will not spend all their entertainment time reading. People prefer variety and Jules was no exception to this. In addition to reading, Jules enjoyed watching some shows, tabletop games with friends, and computer games. For computer games, he preferred role-playing games, RPGs, and sometimes online versions of the same. Currently, he wasn't ensnared in any of those online ones that are such great time sinks, since all of them lost his interest after some time. He was chatting with some friends online about the reasons for this. Mostly, there was only so much they could do. They just repeated the same formula. Sure, the formula was well hidden in some, but eventually it showed through. Even ones that said they offered AI-generated content ended up just repeating things. Maybe it wasn't that noticeable, but Jules was somewhat cynical. So, are you gonna play many worlds? One of Jules' friends asked. What's that? What do you mean, what's that? His friend Isaac responded incredulously. It's been the biggest news for the past few months. Full immersion virtual reality. What's more, exclusive cutting-edge technology. It suddenly popped up a few months ago. No news of a beta test or anything before then. It comes out today. It's big news. What, do you live in a cave? Jules didn't technically live in a cave. However, he did live deep underground in some housing attached to the library. It was free, and he didn't particularly care about going out much. Especially not with how out was. The reason he hadn't heard, though, was probably because he'd been extremely busy at work for a while. Surprisingly, someone had uncovered an ancient library, and a large number of forgotten or lost or unknown works had miraculously survived. After those books had been scanned, they'd been printed and needed to be sorted. Jules was one of the ones who had to read through to determine key factors of each book so they could be properly cataloged. Fortunately, most of it was done by AI but it still required human confirmation, and there had been so many books. Um, I guess I kind of live in a cave, he responded quite belatedly. So, what kind of features are there in this game? 
His friend spent the next half hour explaining various facets that would make it, apparently, the best game ever. The only drawback was that it was expensive. Apparently, there was special hardware necessary. Well, not like Jules had anything else he was going to spend his money on. Yes, he was going to spend his money on it. It sounded too good to be true, but he had to try. Full immersion virtual reality. Spanning multiple actual planet-sized areas. Science fiction. These were all music to Jules' ears. The real kicker, though, was the complexity. He liked complexity, and apparently there would be so many choices available no two characters would ever be the same. Not just probably won't be, but never would. Even ignoring the fact that it would create a unique secondary class for each player, which he definitely wasn't, it was said to have a very complex statistic and skill system that would allow players to do virtually anything. So, he had to try. If it was even a tiny fraction as awesome as it sounded, it would be worth it. If it wasn't worth it, well, he'd be out a month's salary for nothing. Again, though, he wasn't spending it anywhere else anyway. Jules really wanted this game. Unfortunately, apparently there were limited copies available, strictly because of the special hardware required. Furthermore, it came out at midnight. He rushed off to the store to get in line. Hopefully, there would still be some available because of the high cost. People hadn't had much time to save up for it, either, with its surprise announcement. That would help with preventing those who weren't working adults from purchasing it. Hopefully, that would be enough. Many Worlds Chapter 2 Jules walked through the dark streets, glad that the nearest store that would have many worlds wasn't far. He hated paying for a taxi, and he didn't have the funds or the need for his own car. Jules sighed, looking up at the sky. Well, what there was. The streets weren't dark just because it was nighttime. Instead, it was because of the excessive need for power and the solar panels that almost blocked out the sun for most cities. The rich lived at the tops of tall buildings where they could still see the sun, if they even cared. Jules breathed heavily through his filtration mask. That was another reason he worked and lived at the library. He didn't have to go outside, into the pollution. Apparently, it had been even worse, before the switch to almost entirely clean power sources had been necessitated for survival. The pollution was caused by massive overpopulation, and the overpopulation had been caused, quite simply, by Earth running out of room. The dreams of going to the stars, or even other planets, had died centuries before. Sure, there had been several successful attempts to land on the Moon and Mars. However, nobody came back from Mars. The technology just wasn't available. The last people who had landed on Mars had died several decades before Jules was born. Jules sighed, thinking about it, and stepped into the store. Jules arrived to find a very long line. It wasn't the worst line he'd ever seen but it was the worst line he'd seen in person. He counted maybe 50 people. He wasn't sure exactly how many would be available, as there was no indication of what the cutoff would be. Now, Jules was nervous. Not so much at anxiety that he wouldn't get the game. If he didn't get it, he would move on. Well, he'd still try to purchase it again when they produced more hardware, but he hadn't even known it existed earlier that day. His life didn't hinge on it. No, he was nervous because of the number of people. He suffered somewhat from social anxiety. That was another part of the reason he worked at the library, although he did like it there. He would be fine, as long as nobody really talked to him. Talking to new people was extremely awkward. Once he knew them, it wasn't a problem, as long as there weren't too many people around at once. Jules much preferred to talk to people via the internet, though. Of course, it came to pass that someone did talk to him. Directly in front of him in line was a woman, one of the few in the line. There wasn't too much of a difference in population between the male and female gaming communities, but there was probably a combination of factors as to the makeup of the line. So, any idea what class you're going to play? The woman asked conversationally. Jules froze. He could have just responded no, but that would have required him to think rationally. His first thought would have been to say, I only heard about the game today and came here on a whim, but he didn't say that either. He just stood there. He actually came closest to running away, but managed to just stand awkwardly for a minute before finally saying, sorta, this wasn't true, of course. However, a half-hearted response was all he could muster through his jaw and voice box that refused to work. That, apparently, was enough for him to be in a conversation. The woman may have been nervous or bored, 
But whatever she was, she was talkative. Jules didn't really hear any of it. He was mostly concentrating on not looking at her. Not because she wasn't attractive, but because she was. He really would have liked to listen, but he was panicking inside, and keeping a calm appearance was all he could muster. Somehow, that seemed to be enough. Eventually, it was midnight, and only then did the woman stop talking, as the line started to move. Jules followed along, and hoped there were enough copies available. It was a somewhat odd situation. There was an employee of the store tracking the purchases, but it seemed like someone else entirely was supplying the hardware. Jules couldn't tell from the back of the line, but it didn't seem to come in a large package, whatever it was. The line moved quickly, as everyone was prepared to pay, and there was no doubt at to what they were there for. As the line got shorter, Jules saw that the hardware seemed to be some kind of wristband. It seemed rather small for the power it was said to have. Maybe this was just a placeholder, and the real system was obtained elsewhere. Jules watched the packages get opened, and wristbands were pulled out and handed to people. Each box contained ten, it seemed. Five boxes. Approximately fifty people. Was he soon enough? Down to the last box. Jules counted. Eleven people, counting him. Maybe, maybe there was another box. Or he could have miscounted. No point in leaving just now, but now he was extremely nervous. Five people. Four. Three. Two. Last one, said the employee of the mysterious corporation. Well, maybe Jules would have known what corporation they were if he'd been paying attention earlier, but he didn't care about such details. Last one. The woman in front of him stepped forward and paid for it with credit. Jules just stood there awkwardly. The last one, huh? That's right. Sorry, maybe you can get one in the next batch. Yeah, I'll do that, Jules said. He was somehow much more disappointed than he thought he'd be. Maybe because he'd just been one person too late. He turned slowly to leave and started walking away. Give him yours. Jules paused. That hadn't been the voice of either the store employee or the man from the corporation. He turned to look. The corporation employee held his wrist up to his mouth and spoke. What was that, sir? I said give him yours. We'll get you a new one, came a voice from the man's wrist. He was wearing one of the systems for the game. The man hesitated only briefly before taking it off his wrist and handing it to Jules. Here you go, sir. Have a nice day. Um, don't I have to pay for it? The voice spoke up once more. I'll cover it. The store doesn't have that one in its inventory anyway. Ah, uh, thanks, Jules said. More than awkwardly, he turned around again and walked away. He kept expecting one of them to call out to him, saying it was a prank or a mistake or something else. He felt like he was doing something wrong. All the way home, to his room. Nobody stopped him, though. Jules arrived back at his room. He realized he didn't have a proof of purchase or a manual or anything. On the other hand, he hadn't paid anything for the strange wristband. So, he wouldn't lose anything if he couldn't make it work or had to give it back, except time and maybe pride. He set about figuring out how to use it. Instantly, he was done. There was a single button. So, he put on the wristband and pressed the button. It projected an image in front of him. Welcome to many worlds, it read. Please lie down somewhere safe, and then confirm the command to start the game. Well, that seemed pretty simple, he guessed. He lay on his bed. Now, how did he confirm? His vision was filled with white light, and he threw his hand in front of his face. Many Worlds Chapter 3 Jules moved his arm away from his face. Now that there was no longer a bright light blinding him, he supposed he'd entered the game. It seemed there really wasn't a character creation process. Weird. He looked around. Blue star. Maybe. Purple sky. Rugged terrain. Also stained slightly purple by the light. Normal gravity. At least, normal as far as he could tell. The colors were strange. But the air. The air was strange in a different way. It wasn't like the processed air in buildings or the polluted air he was used to outside. Instead, it was fresh. It was a novel feeling. He wasn't sure if this was a perfect simulation of fresh air, but he really liked it. In addition to the terrain, Jules also saw other players looking around. If they looked at him, he waved vaguely, but didn't start any conversations. Where all the players were appearing was a large platform, of sorts. That is, it was a respawn point. 
It had glowy stuff and pedestals around it and something like a barrier. Fancy. Theoretically, he should be able to activate a waypoint to the nearest city. As he thought about that, he saw one. It was weird, seeing such a thing not on a monitor. Well, before he headed that way, he wanted to check his stats. The stats were surprisingly simplistic overall. Basic RPG stats, mostly. Physical and mental categories each had four attributes, affecting power, finesse, durability, and quantity. Quantity was theoretically HP and MP, health and mental energy. Pretty normal, except there were two luck stats. He had heard the system was more complex than 10 statistics could represent, but perhaps the information was hidden. He was somewhat disappointed, but not surprised, to see below average physical attributes. He grinned to see above average mental attributes. Since, theoretically, the attributes reflected the real person somewhat, he was happy the game confirmed he was smart. His luck was exactly a 99, which was basically average. The other luck stat, Quantum Flux, was at 123. From the description, that meant he would get better good luck and worse bad luck. It wasn't too far off of normal to be bothered about it, though. Then, he checked out his classes. Everyone had a, theoretically, unique secondary class, as well as starting as a level zero adventurer. The adventurer class, it was said, got a decent amount of everything as they leveled up, but didn't specialize in anything and couldn't get some of the more unique skills or abilities. Well, basically what one would expect from a starter class. He could change class later. Then, Jules Verne looked at his secondary class. All he had was information, as the name of the class and one ability. View data. That was a class? That sounded terrible and useless. Well, he might as well try it. He spoke, unnecessarily, the name of his skill, intending to affect a rock he'd picked up. An information screen popped into his view behind it. It said, quite plainly, Rock. Object. This is a rock. That was all. The rock got thrown pretty far, as he vented his frustration. Of course I get a useless secondary class. Why wouldn't I? He checked his inventory. Space Adventurer's Outfit, Worn. Space Canteen, Full. Space Combat Knife. None of the items actually said, Space. He just added that in his head, because this was a sci-fi game. Everything has to be space, or laser. Also, the inventory showed him where each item was carried on his person. The canteen wasn't in a weird alternate space pretending to be a backpack. Jules sighed at his meager, but expected, equipment. He thought he might as well head to town. Normally, an MMORPG should start you in town, but it seemed this one decided to throw expected rules out the window. The first thing he noticed on his trek was that the world was big. Sure, games like to advertise how big they were, but generally you could see the whole thing if you stood on the right mountain, or even a large hill. Maybe it just felt bigger because he was walking it himself though. Well, walking may have been a poor way to phrase it. First, he started running, since in games that was the quickest way to get around. Characters never seemed to get really tired either. He soon learned this was not true in this game. Maybe the characters were actually just exhausted all the time with no way to communicate it. Jules got tired just as quickly as he would running in real life. That is, before he finished going over the nearest hill. He could have gone further, but he didn't want to actually exhaust himself and collapse on the ground in this strange area. He thought he would, too. In addition to attempting to run, he also climbed over things. Nothing was a really hard climb, but most games wouldn't allow you to get over those normally, unless you could do something like a double jump. Climbing always seemed to be one of those things that were ignored. Well, that may have been because it would be easy to go off the edge of the world that way. However, it would have been very odd if he couldn't move his body as he imagined in a virtual reality game. Fortunately, they held to realism. Then he got tired enough to take a break. While he was sitting on a rock, because walking slowly was no way to take a break, he used his view data skill on things nearby. There was a reddish, gnarled, thorny plant that had no leaves. Shrub. Plant. This is a shrub. Great help that. There was a blue-violet flower that was growing directly out of a rock. Flower. Plant. This is a flower. Great. What detail. But was it edible? Poisonous? Used for dyes? As his thoughts lingered on this, he noticed a change in the window. While not helpful in the slightest, the change in the menu told him something. 
He'd have to acquire at least some of the data on his own. It seemed like a pretty useless ability, except that it might remember things for him. Just to experiment, he checked a rock next. He held his face in his hands. He didn't need that kind of information for everything. He fiddled with some, mental, settings, and thought he managed to convince the game he didn't care about whether or not rocks were edible or poisonous. He did manage to make it show the weight. At first, the value was blank, but after picking up the rock and testing its weight, he got it to display that it was 10 in, approximately, apparently. By virtue of just being the way things worked, that was about a kilogram, but Jules was aware that kilograms didn't actually measure weight, which would be relevant if gravity was different. He sighed. This skill still hadn't come up with any information he hadn't figured out or guessed on his own. It might not even be accurate. Time to walk on. Despite the apparent lack of any game-like features, Jules Verne was rather enjoying his time in many worlds. It was like an exotic nature hike, except he didn't have to take a long ride to get there, and it wasn't polluted. He wished he had some snacks, though. Since it was a game, he figured it wouldn't hurt to eat some random flowers. Because why not? The general result of that experiment was bleh. Most of them didn't taste any good at all. The blue-violet ones, however, had petals that tasted faintly of citrus. He couldn't think of any blue citrus, so he decided to just call them citrus flowers until he found out their actual name. Assuming the game designers bothered to name the random flowers that were around. Just as the walking and climbing and such was starting to get extremely old, Jules crossed one last rise. There, he was struck by the sight of a city. It was definitely a city. That said, it was completely unexpected. Strange architecture built of many differently colored rocks. Around that, a wall. Actually, instead of a city, it looked more like a castle surrounded by a medieval village. If medieval villages had access to purple and blue rocks, bright green wood, or laser gates, well, at least the gate shouted out science fiction, if not the rest. Jules thought he saw one or two others, probably new players as well, heading towards the gate. Many Worlds Chapter 4 Upon closer inspection, the buildings of the city only looked medieval because they were made out of stone. However, they were quite well made, from what he saw, and looked much more modern up close. Jules also corrected his initial thoughts about the gate. It wasn't a laser gate, but rather a lightning portcullis. Where you'd expect crossing metal bars, there was electricity. Jules wondered if it were somehow solid, and stopped people from moving through. He decided not to test it. To his delight, someone else did. From what he could tell at the distance he was standing at, it had appeared quite solid. Also, it had enough kick to knock the player back three meters. Jules looked at the guards on top of the wall. They seemed rather neutral about the whole affair. Although they didn't open the gates or anything, they didn't shoot their guns. Maybe laser guns? Jules hoped they were laser guns. At any of the players milling about in front of the gates, the player who died from the gate eventually disappeared, theoretically to go through whatever respawn process there was. Somebody tried to climb the wall. That was met with the first real response from the guards. Yelling, followed shortly by laser fire. Jules secretly laughed with joy, but he kept his outer appearance mostly neutral. Laser guns. They were pretty cool. He felt a little bad for the dead guy though. Not very, though. Eventually, everyone milling around the gate gave up getting in, and Jules moved closer. He waved to the guards. Hello, I don't suppose you'd let me in? All he got was a glance in his direction when he waved. He sat down near the laser gate, in view of both it and the guards. So, do you speak English at all? The guards ignored him. Since he was basically alone, he got bolder. Hey, down here. He started shouting whatever came to mind. After a minute, he got a response. One of the guards said something that sounded like a rebuke. Jules stopped yelling. He confirmed they didn't speak English and he didn't speak whatever they spoke. It didn't sound like anything he'd heard, so he supposed the game creators made up at least one language. He immediately wondered how complete it was. Jules wondered if the guards were allowed to shoot people who weren't trying to get in. He made an attempt to find out. Additionally, he also tried to find out what they called the laser gate. He did this by pointing at it and asking, what do you call that? Repeatedly. Eventually, one of the guards pointed his gun at him and said something. Probably, shut up. Jules kept pushing. 
Eventually, the guard gave an exasperated sigh and said something to the other guard. Jules was guessing, but he thought it might have meant either, why does that fool keep pointing at our laser gate? Or, you won't mention I shot this guy if I get him to go away, right? Jules repeated the part he thought might have been laser gate, or possibly fool. The guard vaguely gestured toward the gate, and might have said, duh, it's a laser gate. To which Jules responded, laser gate, and the guard replied with the same. Jules then pointed at the wall. What do you call that? The guard sighed. After a long while of prompting, Jules thought he knew the words for laser gate, wall, guard, laser gun, and either foreigner or imbecile. Jules turned to leave. Bye-bye, he waved. The guard responded with either, have a nice day, or good riddance. Jules didn't even seriously consider the first one. Jules left the gate, not because he gave up on learning the language or new words, but because he was hungry. He was beginning to see the downside of realism. He hadn't seen any other players around and almost wondered what they were up to. Then he thought about his friends and decided he needed to find out how to contact them. After he ate something, being the non-practical sort, Jules decided to eat random plants. He gave names to them and sometimes revised former names. He considered hunting animals, but he seriously doubted he could catch any. Plus, he didn't want to make the bet that they wouldn't be venomous. The few things he'd seen looked weird. Jules eventually stumbled upon some root vegetables of some kind. After washing them in a nearby stream, he ate the weird, lumpy things. They kind of looked like potatoes, but they seemed to be edible without cooking. That was good for Jules. They tasted alright too. They also appeared to not be poisonous, so that was a plus. Eventually, hunger sated. He returned to the gate. The shift of guards had changed, and both of these were boring. That is, neither of them would respond to Jules' prompts. He got tired and gave up. Speaking of tired, he would be tired at work tomorrow. He logged off. November 28, 2184, 6 o'clock, Sunday. He wasn't actually that tired at work, although he was disappointed that he had to work on a Sunday. That he wasn't tired was definitely for the best since he could have easily fallen asleep against a shelf of books if he were tired. The smell of books was very relaxing. That was the only benefit of physical books, as far as Jules was concerned. Other than that, they were just heavy and clumsy, plus there weren't any search functions. He didn't even know how people found what they were looking for. Not that there was much need for that in his section, since these were stories meant to be read, not mined for knowledge. Jules spent most of the day going over the words he had learned in his head. He wished he could open the menu where he'd stored all that information inside the game. Sadly, he'd have to make do with his memory. He wondered if he could get a copy onto his computer somehow. He looked down at the wristband he was still wearing. It didn't seem like it had any kind of ports to connect to anything, so it must connect to the game servers wirelessly. That would require some pretty powerful hardware. It was amazing it fit into something so small. Then Jules got distracted by actually having to do his job. He spent the rest of the workday figuratively buried in books. They all fit in his pocket computer, after all, so it would have been extremely difficult to get buried. Many Worlds Chapter 5 Jules talked with his friends before heading into the game. It doesn't really feel like a game though, said Isaac. Jules thought about it for a bit. They were right, he supposed. Besides the fact that there was a status window and starting gear, the rest wasn't really like a game. Nobody had seen a tutorial or quests, and his friends hadn't even seen a town. Jules hadn't been let into the town, and that seemed like an important part of any game, having a hub to return to. Well, his friends had fought monsters and managed to gain some levels, so it was somewhat like what they were expecting. However, it had been a real effort to find the monsters, and they were really just animals. Jules learned something about the leveling system that he'd not learned about before since he'd literally only heard of the game yesterday. Each level gained a player 10 status points, which could be distributed in any combination among the 10 basic attributes. He already knew basic attributes averages 100 at the start, so after 10 levels, one could be twice as good as a normal human in a category, if it scaled how he thought it would. Extrapolating, someone could be twice as good as a normal human in every category at level 100. There was theoretically no level cap, too so it could happen, although Jules couldn't think of any class archetype that would use all attributes equally. Jules returned to the game, 
and was glad to find his favorite guard on duty again. That is, the guard who had responded to his pestering and actually taught him words. Jules spent more of the day pesting the guard. That is, learning the language, of course. He wasn't pestering him for fun, not just for fun anyway. After a little while, Jules noticed something odd. He didn't have any trouble remembering the words after one time. While Jules considered himself intelligent, he knew for a fact that it hadn't been this easy to learn a language before, in school. Obviously, the game system was helping him, and thus it was a thing that he was intended to try to do. This gave him the confidence to stay there learning it all day, except for a short break to find food. He was so focused on what he was doing, that he didn't notice the sun beginning to set. He did, however, notice a message window that popped up. Congratulations, you have learned a new skill. Uesmithy has been learned. As the first player to gain basic proficiency in a language, you have received five free points in wisdom. Immediately, Jules opened up his skill window. Skills. Uesmithy, 1.02, a very basic proficiency in the language. View data, 6.03C basic data. Request data, 2.15 obtain otherwise unknown data. Well, that didn't tell him much, but he knew that the one was the level of the skill. He figured the 0 .02 was experienced to the next level, effectively. The system had told him it was Uesmithy, but he wasn't sure why it was called that. Well, obviously he'd find out eventually. He then checked his attributes. He saw that the five points to wisdom had, indeed, been applied. However, he thought that wisdom and some of the other attributes were higher than he'd seen before, even counting the five points. Jules wondered if there was some way to find out. Then, suddenly, the window changed to show the change in stats from when he had started. He'd gained two points in intelligence and wisdom, as well as one in focus and willpower. He assumed this was because he'd been exercising his mental faculties, although the growth seemed pretty rapid. Well, it was a game after all. There had to be some progress easily visible. He wondered if there were partial attribute levels, like with skills. Then, he saw that it was. Indeed so. Jules thought this was a pretty convenient game menu. Then he remembered his class. Information. He thought that was probably what let him see all of this. This was confirmed when he saw that information had grown to level 5, and he'd gained a new skill, request data, which he seemed to have been using unconsciously. In an attempt to use it actively, he went back to the skill panel and looked at the experience progress. Then he tried to figure out if there was a more specific amount of progress available. Immediately, he saw the number go up to 2.67, and then a long string of digits that didn't seem to end. He quickly shortened it back to two decimal places. Too much data was worse than useless. He was glad to know he could control it and get however much he wanted, though. After a few minutes of fiddling around mentally, Jules went back to talking with the guard. It definitely wasn't at the level he would call a conversation, but the guard went with his whims of asking what things were which he could at least do proficiently. The guard stayed alert, though, and his partner pretty much ignored Jules. That was a perfectly fair response, especially since a bunch of weird people had shown up recently. Obviously, these were the other players, and not Jules, since Jules was perfectly normal. Well, he knew that he wasn't, sitting around talking at NPCs, non-player characters, hoping to get a response, literally for an entire day. Well, night not day as was the time in the real world, but still many hours. Jules logged off again, because he really needed to get some sleep. Many Worlds Chapter 6 November 29, 2184, 8 o'clock Jules found himself muttering in Uesmithy while at work. It was weird, though, because he couldn't remember most of it that well. Mostly, he just ended up repeating, what is that? And I don't know over and over. Well, his poor memory made some sense because while in game the system had probably been supporting his learning. It was weird how ingrained it was in his unconscious processes, but that was pretty much necessary for a truly immersive virtual reality. He took a deep breath, then sighed. He knew it wasn't real, but he really wanted to be back in the fresh air of many worlds. The purplish sky had been weird when he first started, but at least it had a strangely natural feel to it unlike the more normal but obviously artificial lights here. Jules thought that even if he didn't end up getting seriously into the game aspect of many worlds, he'd visit on his days off. It was a nice change.
Apparently a bunch of people have quit mini worlds already, saying it's hardly a game. Well, they're just selling their systems to other people, so they didn't really lose anything. Robert said, I kind of agree, but I still enjoy it. What are you up to anyway, Jules? Hmm, mostly. Sitting outside Fesmoilia and learning the language. Fesmoilia? The name of the city, obviously. How do you know the name of the city? I pestered the guards until they talked to me. They don't shoot anyone unless they try to get inside. So? Robert replied, Well, if you do get in eventually, let us know if there are any class trainers. We could use something besides adventurer. I guess I could ask to be let in. Maybe if I say please. His friends laughed for a second. Wait, you're serious? Isaac asked. How much of the language have you learned? Hmm, I'm not too bad. I've got about 20 hours of practice, and the game really makes it easy. Don't you sleep? Yeah, a little bit. Since Jules didn't have any reason to hesitate, the first thing he did upon logging in was ask, May I enter the city? The guards looked at each other. No. Jules had to think for a bit on how to form his next sentence. He said something like, How do I get permission? You have to get permission from someone important, probably. Jules didn't know what that word was, though. They're in the city, where I can't go, aren't they? The guards nodded. Then, can you? Jules wanted to say petition, but he didn't know the word, ask someone for me? The guards shrugged. Jules hoped that gesture held the same meaning as outside the game. That is, sadly not a yes, but fortunately not a no. Jules went back to pestering his favorite guard for more information. He would have thought of him using his name, but the guards all refused to tell him their names so far. Jules often got tired of sitting, so he would often walk around a bit, never getting close to the gate, but always close enough to talk to the guards. After a few hours of this, someone surprised him with a greeting from behind. Yo. Jules. He didn't immediately recognize the voice of one of his friends. In fact, he knew it couldn't have been one of them, because this was the voice of a woman. He turned to look. It was the woman who'd stood in front of him in line. He vaguely remembered that they'd exchanged names, but he couldn't remember hers or any of the conversation. He figured he might as well get it over with. E. I'm pretty bad with names, sorry. Yours was? Mary. Hanging around this city hoping the guards will go to sleep and you can sneak in? Ah. Uh, not likely. They're very diligent. They can't leave though so they are my captive audience for learning the language. That guy Dash he pointed to his favorite guard is my teacher. Not by choice though. What? You're actually trying to learn the language. It seems more likely players just aren't supposed to go here yet. Jules frowned. Why? Because there's an obstacle? Since this is supposed to be an open, exploration-type game, there's no reason not to go here. Besides, I'm doing pretty good. Oh, is that so? She looked doubtful, but maybe in a teasing way. Sure. Jules wondered if there was some way to show his progress. Maybe he could share the skill with her? As he thought that, something that happened after many of his idle thoughts in this game happened. The system responded, and this time, it had a window that said, do you wish to share the skill, Uesmithy? Yes slash no. It was quite convenient that wondering if there was a feature immediately revealed whether it existed or not. Jules chose yes. Mary looked surprised for a second, and Jules figured she saw a message asking her to learn the skill, because he soon got confirmation that she had. Then she frowned. My head hurts now. Really? Hmm, I didn't have that problem. Well, I imagine you didn't have all that much language inserted into your head all at once. True. Out of curiosity, what level is it? M. 3. What percentage to the next level? I can't tell. Many Worlds Chapter 6. November 29th, 2184, 8 o'clock. Jules found himself muttering in Uesmithy while at work. It was weird, though, because he couldn't remember most of it that well. Mostly, he just ended up repeating, what is that? And I don't know over and over. Well, his poor memory made some sense because while in game the system had probably been supporting his learning. It was weird how ingrained it was in his unconscious processes, but that was pretty much necessary for a truly immersive virtual reality. He took a deep breath, then sighed. He knew it wasn't real, but he really wanted to be back in the fresh air of many worlds. The purplish sky had been weird when he first started, 
but at least it had a strangely natural feel to it, unlike the more normal but obviously artificial lights here. Jules thought that even if he didn't end up getting seriously into the game aspect of many worlds, he'd visit on his days off. It was a nice change. Apparently a bunch of people have quit many worlds already, saying it's hardly a game. Well, they're just selling their systems to other people, so they didn't really lose anything. Robert said, I kind of agree, but I still enjoy it. What are you up to anyway, Jules? Hmm, mostly. Sitting outside Fesmoilia and learning the language. Fesmoilia? The name of the city, obviously. How do you know the name of the city? I pestered the guards until they talked to me. They don't shoot anyone unless they try to get inside. So? Robert replied, Well, if you do get in eventually, let us know if there are any class trainers. We could use something besides adventurers. I guess I could ask to be let in. Maybe if I say please. His friends laughed for a second. Wait, you're serious? Isaac asked. How much of the language have you learned? Hmm, I'm not too bad. I've got about 20 hours of practice, and the game really makes it easy. Don't you sleep? Yeah, a little bit. Since Jules didn't have any reason to hesitate, the first thing he did upon logging in was ask, May I enter the city? The guards looked at each other. No. Jules had to think for a bit on how to form his next sentence. He said something like, How do I get permission? You have to get permission from someone important, probably. Jules didn't know what that word was, though. They're in the city, where I can't go, aren't they? The guards nodded. Then, can you? Jules wanted to say petition, but he didn't know the word, ask someone for me? The guards shrugged. Jules hoped that gesture held the same meaning as outside the game. That is, sadly not a yes, but fortunately not a no. Jules went back to pestering his favorite guard for more information. He would have thought of him using his name, but the guards all refused to tell him their names so far. Jules often got tired of sitting, so he would often walk around a bit, never getting close to the gate, but always close enough to talk to the guards. After a few hours of this, someone surprised him with a greeting from behind. Yo. Jules. He didn't immediately recognize the voice of one of his friends. In fact, he knew it couldn't have been one of them, because this was the voice of a woman. He turned to look. It was the woman who'd stood in front of him in line. He vaguely remembered that they'd exchanged names, but he couldn't remember hers or any of the conversation. He figured he might as well get it over with. E. I'm pretty bad with names, sorry. Yours was? Mary. Hanging around this city hoping the guards will go to sleep and you can sneak in? Ah. Uh, not likely. They're very diligent. They can't leave though so they are my captive audience for learning the language. That guy Dash he pointed to his favorite guard is my teacher. Not by choice though. What? You're actually trying to learn the language. It seems more likely players just aren't supposed to go here yet. Jules frowned. Why? Because there's an obstacle? Since this is supposed to be an open, exploration-type game, there's no reason not to go here. Besides, I'm doing pretty good. Oh, is that so? She looked doubtful, but maybe in a teasing way. Sure. Jules wondered if there was some way to show his progress. Maybe he could share the skill with her? As he thought that, something that happened after many of his idle thoughts in this game happened. The system responded, and this time, it had a window that said, do you wish to share the skill, Uesmithy? Yes slash no. It was quite convenient that wondering if there was a feature immediately revealed whether it existed or not. Jules chose yes. Mary looked surprised for a second, and Jules figured she saw a message asking her to learn the skill, because he soon got confirmation that she had. Then she frowned. My head hurts now. Really? Hmm, I didn't have that problem. Well, I imagine you didn't have all that much language inserted into your head all at once. True. Out of curiosity, what level is it? M. 3. What percentage to the next level? I can't tell. This told Jules two things. Other players received the skill at the level he was at, at least up to a certain point, and they couldn't see their progress. The second piece was likely because of his information class. It seemed rather inconvenient for the other players, though. He wondered if, immediately, he shared the ability to see progress, although only up to two decimal places. Mary looked surprised again. How did you do that? It's related to my secondary class, I guess. 
I can unlock some extra information about things. That's super convenient. I wonder if I can share you Esmithy too. I haven't seen anybody with skills that aren't from their class yet. Jules shrugged. He thought it would be convenient if all the players could learn the language. Then, he knew he could share it automatically. He didn't really want the publicity, though. He discovered he could share it privately. People within a certain range would have the chance to learn it and could learn from each other too. Convenient. Was there anything he couldn't do in this system? He knew, of course, that there were many things he couldn't do. Like, apparently, transfer languages to people without giving them a headache. Well, he'd learned it properly, if at an accelerated rate. So it made sense that even more acceleration could cause issues. Jules wondered at how normally he'd been able to talk to Mary. Maybe it was because it was a game, but since it felt pretty much as real as reality, it couldn't be just that. Maybe it was because he'd actually been socializing more recently, if you counted pestering alien guards to learn their language. After thinking about it for a minute, Jules realized it had been because he'd been surprised. Now he was getting a little bit nervous again, realizing he was in conversation with an attractive woman. So, what have you been up to, Mary? Me? Well, instead of sitting outside of a city wasting my time, I've been looking for monsters to kill and dungeons to explore. Any luck? She sighed. Not really. The only structures around are the respawn areas and cities, at least that we've found. Some people found caves, but they're just caves that animals live in. Well, there's tons of area unexplored, especially since people die of hunger. Hmm, they should eat the green flowers and the potatoes. Green flowers and potatoes? Sure, let me show you. Jules got up and started moving to an area he knew they grew. They aren't exactly potatoes, but they look like them. Jules pointed out the flowers and ate the good parts as an example. It didn't particularly taste good, but it wasn't bad either. Um, how did you find out they're edible? Is there a guide or something? Jules tilted his head and looked at her. How? I just ate them. How else would you find out? Weren't you worried about them being poisonous? Jules shrugged his shoulders in an exaggerated fashion. If the choices are between eating something maybe poisonous and possibly dying quickly, or eating nothing and dying slowly, I choose the first. Good point, Mary admitted. But how did you figure out they were interactable items? Jules looked at her like she was crazy. This is an immersive virtual reality system. Everything is interactable. Even if it didn't have any specific nutritional properties before trying it, wouldn't the game's AI just generate something? That's true but then they have to save that information or have random effects. It could take a lot of data storage. Storage is cheap. Well, if they really are storing all the information for an entire planet, they have to have some pretty significant systems. Hmm, well, this is good information. I should go tell some people. I just messaged them, but for some reason this game doesn't have even that kind of basic convenience. Good luck. As Mary started to walk away, Jules remembered another piece of advice. Oh, one more thing. The ones that are purple with blue spots are bad. Just a tiny bit will make you vomit. I don't know if more will kill you. Thanks. Maybe you should put together a guide. Ooh, good idea. Jules reached for his pocket. Right. No computer. Jules was used to having a portable computer that could fit in his pocket, but he didn't have one with him in game. Well, he could write once he woke up, if he could remember the information. Before I go, Mary paused. Then, a window popped up in front of Jules. A player has sent you a friend request. Next to the text was a visual of Mary. Do you wish to accept? Yes slash no. Jules pressed yes. He had nothing against having more friends, although he did have something against large groups of people being around him, even if they were friends. He noticed the system didn't automatically fill in a name, so he put it in manually. Jules assumed that was so people could use pseudonyms if they wished to. That would be the only reason he could think of immediately, anyway. Mary went off to tell people they could pick up the plants. Honestly, Jules was astounded that more people hadn't tried. After all, it was pretty rare to get to see a real flower and breathe in clean air. Many Worlds Chapter 7 In the morning, Jules was somewhat more fluent in Uesmithy, and he'd spend all night playing again minus a couple hours. Then, he hadn't been able to fall asleep, because he hadn't been tired. This worried Jules a little bit. 
He messaged his friends about it. Have any of you felt tired after playing many worlds? Specifically, I haven't and still don't feel tired and I'm on 5 hours of sleep in 72 hours. The immediate response from Isaac was, go to sleep. Then, after a few moments, I haven't been tired either. Soon, all the results were in. None of Jules' friends had felt tired after playing many worlds. Maybe it's because it puts you in a dreamlike state while playing, Robert theorized. No way, Jules immediately rejected. My brain is way too active when I play for it to be that. I'm not sure what's going on though. It sure is convenient. Maybe you just can't tell you're tired, Isaac cautioned. It's best to get some sleep anyway. Well, Jules had tried, but maybe he'd devote more effort to that tomorrow. Maybe. When Jules logged in, he prepared himself for a somewhat repetitive 12 hours. Well, better make that 8, since he needed to try to sleep. Although it would be repetitive, it wasn't like he hadn't been having fun. It just got very Sammy. Plus, he was running out of things to point at. He checked his friend's list, although of course only Mary was on it. Jules still needed to find a way to meet up with the friends who had convinced him to play this. As he was looking at the icon for Mary showing she was logged in, he wondered where she was. Immediately, he got the vision of an arrow pointing off into the distance. That feature was somewhat creepy, actually. Jules turned it back off. He wondered if it was part of his information class or not. Probably, based on what he had seen. Jules looked up at the wall to see if his favorite guard was there. He wasn't, but there was an odd third member on the wall that was definitely not one of the guards. Specifically, the guards were covered in armor, and this person was definitely in civilian gear. It was the first time Jules had seen any of the inhabitants of the city without a helmet on, and only now did he realize that they were really aliens. They had all the expected facial features, but there was something a bit off about all of them. Placement of the eyes, shape of the nose and mouth, Everything was just far enough off to let Jules know they definitely weren't human. As he thought this, the person on the top of the wall spoke. Oh, they really do just come out of nowhere. Fascinating. The man turned to one of the guards. Is this the one trying to learn our language? Jules decided this was a good time to speak up. Yes, that's me. I'm Jules. The person on the wall clapped his hands together in excitement. Oh, wonderful. You speak so well already. I am Market. I'd been hoping to be able to meet one of you dash the word lunatics was probably a more accurate translation, but Jules chose to pretend it was adventurers. Well, here I am. Great. It is somewhat awkward to talk from this distance. Would you mind entering the city? I'd love to, but I don't really have permission. You do now. The man turned to look at the guards. The guards had helmets on, so Jules couldn't see their expressions but their body posture told him that they were trying not to sigh. They did turn off the laser gate slash lightning portcullis though. Jules took the chance to enter the city, since it seemed he had permission. Quest complete. Enter the city. You have gained experience. Level up. Jules completed a quest he didn't know he had, and gained a level. This put him at level 1. Actually, since many worlds started at level 0, it made sense, because otherwise at level 50, you would have 49 advancements, instead of 50, unless you started with some. However, starting with something is not really an advancement. In many worlds, what was gained at each level appeared to be 10 attribute points. Jules had no idea what to spend them on, so he saved them. Market, apparently some kind of scientist, sage, wise man, or just someone who liked learning, came down from the wall. Let me show you around the city. Very quickly, Jules ran into another barrier. Obviously, he was being introduced to buildings that had specific functions, but he could not tell what they were. In addition, they obviously had signs stating something, but that was not much help. I can't read, Jules admitted. Oh, well of course not. You've only been learning our language for a couple days after all. Here, let me show you some basics. He pulled out something that obviously fulfilled the role of a computer, quite advanced compared to the structures, Jules felt. It projected an image into the air, something Jules wished real computers could do. Well, affordable and portable ones, that is. Market showed Jules what appeared to be a phonetic alphabet and said the sound for each character. Then, he paused. Well, this is just the basics, 
but you do not seem to have a computer to copy this to? Jules was of course guessing about computer and some other words, but Market gestured to his thing that was obviously a kind of computer. I don't. Jules was trying to think of some way to store the information while he looked around the street. Then, he was surprised. All the signs were translated. That is, he still saw the actual characters, but his brain immediately was able to read it. What an amazing learning system. Jules wasn't sure why the game even bothered making him learn, if it was just going to make it instantaneous. Actually, looks like I've remembered it. Yes? Market tilted his head inquisitively. Already? That is impressive. Well, it's a feature of the game. Game was in English. Game? What is that? Hmm. It's kind of hard to explain. Jules probably could have explained, but he didn't want to get into the situation of explaining a game to a game character, even one run by a powerful AI system. Well, the other adventurers and I learn quickly. Fascinating. They continued the tour of the city, which Jules realized was quite functional and had many of the things games would usually leave out, such as grocery stores. Well, it still had some typical game elements such as weapon and armor shops. Then they went to Market's home. Jules was nervous about social niceties, but fortunately Fesmoilia's residents, and maybe everyone of the race, didn't have a strong focus on politeness nor a strict set of social rules. That was one bullet dodged for the adventurers. After discussion about various things, they finally got onto the topic of adventurers. Truthfully, we weren't, and still aren't, sure of your intentions. Some tried to climb the walls into the city, but most did not seem particularly violent. It is unfortunate we had to kill some of you before we could communicate. Don't worry about it, they'll come back to life at some nearby structures. Jules really said, undie, or become not dead. Market was obviously taken aback at this knowledge. Come back to life? How terrifying. Jules shrugged. For a game, something like that was obvious. Well, it seemed like NPCs wouldn't respawn though, which is why there was a strict prohibition against attacking them. There isn't really a good way to explain it. Well, what is the purpose of your adventurers coming here? Hmm, Jules thought for a moment. To gain classes and get quests, I guess. Classes? Quests? Air, to learn things and to do jobs. So, you are scholars and migrant workers from another planet? Why come here? Jules was really stumped, but then he remembered the backstory for the game. Well, our planet is running out of room, and we need to expand. Thus, we traveled here through warp gates. Jules was a bit fuzzy on the details of the story. Warp gates. Air, the places where we come back to life. Jules didn't know the correct words but he was pretty sure Merkit could understand the concept of teleportation. Not that it had been done in the real world, though. Well, the important thing is, the adventurers mean no harm? Yes, that is right. If we excessively harm NPCs, we'll get banned. So we really can't. NPCs? Banned? Air. If we harm natives, we'll be teleported off-world, basically. Oh, I see. Your planet wishes to be friends. Well, we do not wish to be enemies, and now that we know your intentions, we can allow adventurers to access the city, at least for now. Quest complete. Open up access to the city of Fesmoilia. You have gained experience. Level up. X2. Another accidental quest fulfillment. Even more, two levels. This was a pretty extreme amount of experience to be giving out. Well, it didn't hurt that gaining access to the city for all the adventurers was a pretty significant achievement. Jules continued to talk with Merkit and learn much more rapidly with someone who wanted to teach him than he had before. He spent too much time, though, and forgot to try to sleep. After about 11 more hours of practice, he had a very solid grasp on the language. November 30th, 2184, 7 o'clock. Many Worlds, Chapter 8. Unfortunately, Jules' grasp on the language only lasted while he was inside the game. It was a weird feeling, suddenly not understanding a language. Even knowing that the game system provided the information he wanted and knew, it was still weird to not know it outside of the game. Somewhere, on the inside, he still felt like he should know all the words by heart, but it was as if he had forgotten them. Really, though, he'd been learning the language for just a few days, so even his progress outside of the game was pretty good. Eventually, he had to stop thinking about alien languages in games 
and get back to focusing on work. Before he could get back to many worlds, Jules had some real-life things to take care of. While he didn't seem to need sleep after being in many worlds, or he was going crazy, he did still need to eat. He didn't have the spare funds to get groceries delivered, and he usually didn't know what he was going to buy beforehand anyway. Well, he did currently have the money, but if he let himself get complacent, he'd never leave the library building, since he lived and worked there. So, he took himself out onto the polluted, sunless streets, to the nearest supermarket. Normally, it wouldn't have been an event worth thinking about. He'd buy milk, cheese, and some kind of actual food to put cheese on. Indeed, the shopping itself went exactly like that. During the process, though, he saw Mary, and she saw him. Hi, Jules, she waved at him. Hello. You must live near here, since we've run into each other twice now. That's right, I do. Along with thousands of other people. And that's just within a few blocks. I haven't seen you around before, though. Jules didn't remember seeing anybody else more than once around here. Although if he didn't know them, he might have just ignored them. That's because I just moved here. What about you? I've been here for a while. Not that going anywhere else is any different. That's pretty skeptical. The pattern of the sky is different in different places after all. What sky? There's only solar panels. That's true, but you can see patterns where they don't cover, and it's unique to every city. Jules frowned. Well, I'd rather see a real sky, like in many worlds. Well, real as that can get. Anyway. Speaking of which, have you been inside Fesmoilia yet? Fesmoilia is? The city. The one with the lightning gates and trigger happy guards? Um, yeah, that one. You can enter the city now, though. What? I didn't see that on the forums or hear it from anyone. Where'd you learn that? Jules muttered. Well, I guess since you're the first person I told. Jules hadn't thought about the fact that players wouldn't automatically know that the city was open. Anyway, players can enter now. You can see for yourself and spread it on the forums and stuff. You still didn't explain how you know. I've spent almost the entirety of the last three days in front of the city. Of course I'd know. Hmm, good point. Well, I guess I should get back to shopping. She waved goodbye at that, and he did as well. Jules sighed in relief. He wasn't particularly good with women, and although he understood that they were human, if he wasn't speaking in one of his comfort zones such as games, he had a difficult time. Jules wasn't sure if he should have bragged, or at least acknowledged, that he'd been the one to convince the city to let players in. Well, he didn't really want to be famous for it, but he did want his friends to know. Even Jules liked to have his work acknowledged. Jules let his friends know about Fesmoilia being open to players. He didn't have any way to tell if they were near that city, though. Since they didn't know where they were specifically, there was no way to tell. Jules knew there must be some way to find out in the game, though. Although many worlds didn't seem to hand things to players, it seemed anything could be done with enough work. Finding out where one was should be relatively simple. Back inside the game, Jules thought about how to solve his friend's problems. If he could add them to his friend's list, he might be able to find out their relative location. So, the only question was whether he could. Since people didn't have usernames, he'd only tried adding Mary, in person. Still, the system was very robust so maybe he could invite them to be in-game friends from far apart. First, he thought of Isaac, remembering his face, voice, and things about him. Then Jules concentrated on adding Isaac to his friends list. You have sent a friend request. Well, that part was done. Now to wait for the reply. Your friend request has been accepted. Next was to try something else. He thought about the messaging system in most games. He thought about sending a message to Isaac. Instead of being able to send a message, a help box showed up. Messaging. In order to transmit messages to other players, please find appropriate equipment. Something that could transmit messages wasn't really a mystery. Although they had lightning portcullises and stone buildings, the technology level of this planet was quite high. Therefore, they should have cell phones, or some kind of equivalent. Since he didn't have one, he had one more idea. Since his ability had shown him where Mary was, it could theoretically work for Isaac, depending on the range. So, he tried to activate the floating arrow, theoretically one of his information class abilities. Indeed, it did work. The arrow pointed somewhere into the distance. How far? He wasn't sure. Until he tried to find out. Then, 
he obtained the information that it was approximately 1,000 kilometers. Well, he obviously wasn't near this same city. Jules took note of the direction and distance, using the sun as a guide. Then he went into the city and asked Merkit for a compass, which was much better. Jules did the same for his other friends, and their locations in many worlds seemed to be as geographically separate as in real life. Well, they could meet up eventually, Jules was sure. Many Worlds Chapter 9 After he finished fiddling around finding his friends, Jules decided to walk around Fesmoilia. He was hoping to find a class trainer. Not that he could currently pay them anything if they required such. Depending on the game, they would need money, a quest, or both. That said, unlike most games, they weren't all cramped together in one corner of the city map. Everything was laid out like a real city. Unfortunately, that meant things could be almost anywhere. Jules was perfectly content to explore a city that had an actual sky, though, even if it was weird colored. Mostly, he wandered around, practicing reading. Although he'd been given the ability to read quite easily, he still needed to figure out how words were spelled. Plus, he saw some new words, though some of them were easy to figure out. Then, he saw a sign for a small shop, or something that he couldn't figure out at all. Therefore, he went inside to ask about it. Excuse me, but what does your sign say? Inside, it wasn't really any kind of shop that Jules had ever seen. There were a variety of random objects strewn about, but they didn't seem like they were merchandise. The proprietor of the establishment sat in a chair in the middle of the otherwise almost empty room. It says, Jules could read, so he knew that quite well. Um, I meant, what does it mean? I've never heard that word. This time, the man just pointed to the air near his head. At first, Jules was confused. Then, he actually paid attention. Several of the assortment of random objects were spinning around the man in the air. Jules walked closer and around the man, just to be sure. Oh, I get it now. Telekinetic. At least, that was the word Jules was going to equate it to, even though it wasn't quite the right word word. It could be thought of as one who practices telekinesis. Other words could be used, such as the infuriatingly vague psychic, but that wasn't as specific. Telekinetic would work, but Jules felt that the word was more one who studies and masters telekinesis than just one who can use telekinesis. The man nods. So, I presume you don't have any reason to be here, other than to ask. It doesn't seem like he's particularly trying to get Jules to leave, just stating the obvious. I didn't. Now I have to ask if you can teach me to do that. I can, the man stated. Jules waited. Oh, um, will you then? For 100 dash another word Jules didn't know, but he presumed was a unit of money. In this case, space currency should be credits, he thought. 100 credits. Jules sighed. Well, I'm sure it would be worth it if I had money. I don't though. The man stared at Jules for a second, squinting his eyes. You? Are the one market talked to before opening the city, aren't you? I am. How'd you know? Your first request upon entering was to learn a new word. Market certainly described you as inquisitive. Jules thought the inquisitive could have also meant something like someone who asks questions without restraint. Well, it's helpful to know things. I guess I'll be going now. The man smiled. You may if you wish, but I can teach you for free. A special service for one who seeks knowledge for its own sake. Do you wish to learn the skill telekinesis? Yes slash no. You will? That's wonderful, thank you. Instead of an instant pop-up and knowing how to use the skill, he spent an actual period of time listening to a basic explanation. After an hour, he finally got the message that he had learned telekinesis. Immediately, he picked up the lightest of the various objects lying around on the floor. He couldn't keep it up in the air for long, and soon let it drop. The telekinetic narrowed his eyes. You learned that exceptionally fast. Normally, you would have to meditate for months before attempting that. Well, I think it's a trait of adventurers. Even so, I sense you have some talent for it. I have more to teach you if you wish. Do you want to change class to telekinetic? Yes slash no. Absolutely. Jules had always imagined what having telekinesis would be like so he took that chance when he could. It was possible that he would regret his quick decision later, but Jules didn't think so. After all, it was telekinesis. 
It took Jules the rest of the night to learn the basics, and his teacher marveled again at the speed adventurers could learn. Jules thought to himself that generally in games you would learn instantly upon transfer of money, which was pretty much the least realistic way possible. In many worlds, at least, you had to put some time and effort into, if not as much as it should normally take. Not that Jules thought you could learn telekinesis somewhere in the reality, but the point remained. So, what were the benefits of the telekinetic class? It seemed to be an increase in all telekinetic abilities, starting at around 20% and improving with level. In addition, at higher levels he should naturally come to understand more methods of using telekinesis, such as making a shockwave. In addition, he got the skill, Object Sense, which let him determine where things were without looking at them, very useful for picking them up with telekinesis. That said, at this point Jules could barely pick up a small rock for a minute before he was tired. However, he knew that it would improve significantly with skill level, class level, and his mental stats, especially focus and willpower, since that should increase his mental durability. December 2nd, 2184, 7 o'clock Thursday. At work, Jules tried to use telekinesis to move a book. Not surprisingly, nothing happened. At least, it shouldn't have been surprising that nothing happened, but for some reason Jules felt like it should have worked. He'd been that convinced of his abilities. Jules made a note to himself that he should work harder to distinguish game from reality. He didn't want to become one of those crazy people who thought fiction was real. Still, it felt like it should have worked. Many Worlds Chapter 10 Jules was talking, through video chat of course, with Robert, Isaac, and his other friends that played Many Worlds. He sighed. It's just, it feels so real, you know? The air feels more real than here. The sky. Well, it's honestly a bit odd, but it's nicer than the bottom of solar panels. I honestly can't tell if a sensation is from the game or real life, if I'm not looking around. Except, my clothes in game are softer. Yeah, Robert agreed. It's almost too real. Almost. Hey, did you guys hear? Isaac interjected. Other cities have started opening up. Though, most players are still having trouble communicating. They should come see me. I'd teach them, Jules said, almost jokingly. Really? Can you? Well, it'd have to be in-game. Here, I can barely remember how to say hello. Jules frowned as his head started hurting from trying to recall Uesmithy. It's like, I remember it, but I can't get to the memory. Or something. His friends had nothing to say about that point. Did you hear? Asked Douglas, who had been quiet. Hear about what? About the lore, man. The lore. Douglas had a big grin on his face. Jules sighed. For effect. Douglas liked to learn all the little bits of lore behind the games. Most of the rest of the friends weren't as interested. Of course, Douglas knew that, thus he only shared most of the best tidbits. What about the lore? They messed up, man. You know the bracelets? They appear in the lore as the reason, somehow, that people can travel to these worlds. Yet, they don't appear in game. How could they miss that? A. Jules responded. I mean, it would be kinda annoying to have to wear those things in game. It's probably just for convenience. Douglas humphed. You say that now, but if they leave out telekinesis you'll be mad. Nah, don't worry, said Jules. I've got it. Look. Jules' head suddenly hurt, and the pin he'd held up did nothing. I mean, I already got it in game. So, they're safe on that front. Isaac responded. Man, I want to get a class too. Guess we have to get into the city first though. Jules nodded. Well, it shouldn't take long if you actually try. Good luck guys. Jules got back in game just about as fast as possible after the chat was over. He immediately picked up a nearby rock with telekinesis. He grinned. He attempted to have it float around his head in a circle, but ended up flinging it away. Good control was harder than anticipated. He went down to the river to try some more experiments. First, he tried to lift some water with telekinesis. Nothing happened, except maybe a slight disturbance in the surface. It could have been natural, though. He took out his space canteen. The water in it wasn't already moving, so he could tell for sure that he only slightly disturbed the surface of the water instead of lifting it. Why was that? He tried some more things. Eventually, he discovered the problem. He didn't just move whatever he wanted with telekinesis. Instead, 
he created a force to push things around. He knew that, but the area of the force was somewhat ill-defined. Thus, water would just roll off the force. Solid objects stuck together. So as long as he kept the force pushing on the object, it would work. Next, he tried creating a bowl to lift water in. He did that by making several forces, one pushing from the bottom, and several pushing at angles up, until they formed what he imagined was a bowl shape. It worked, partly. It seemed to have many holes in the areas it was controlling still, but he managed to get some water to visibly rise up out of the river before flowing through the various gaps. It was also very hard to do so many things at once. Well, that was what practice was for. Jules alternated between water and the heaviest thing he could find and lift, a small rock that he estimated was a bit over a kilogram. As he'd earlier calculated before he had telekinesis, this meant that he could create about 10 N newtons of force. Not great. However, he could obviously create more, since the rock lifted, instead of just not falling. He felt, maybe, 15 or 20 N was his limit for short bursts. He pressed against his hand, and his hand won easily, without trying. The force was stronger than what he could easily do with his fingers, though, but that didn't give him great accuracy. Granted, if he had a scale, he could probably measure pretty well. He wasn't sure if he could maintain the same amount of force over a larger area, or a smaller area either. He had trouble controlling the size. Well, he was a beginner. Jules supposed he could probably be doing something other than practicing telekinesis in a game such as this, but he couldn't think of anything he'd want to do more. Telekinesis was the dream. No more leaning down to go get the pin you dropped. No more walking to the fridge for a soda. If it was in the same room, Jules hoped that it burned calories, though, or he would get fat. Then he remembered it was a game, so he didn't have pins or soda. The point of it being awesome still stood, though. Jules fooled around for a while longer. Once, he dropped the rock onto his wrist. Clack. The sound of rock hitting metal. Jules definitely hadn't heard that sound. He was positive he didn't hear it, and yet, why was he thinking of that sound at all? He stared at his wrist and poked it, fleshy and weak, as expected. He wasn't sure what it was that interested him, then he thought about it. Douglas popped into his head. Ah, that was it. His conspiracy theory, or lazy game developer theory. There was supposed to be a wristband there, like he wore to get into the game. However, it was plain to see that it wasn't there. Even View Data said, Wristband. Technological item. This is a wristband. It has something to do with lore, probably. Huh. Weird. Many Worlds Chapter 11. Jules stared at the wristband. Well, at the information window for the wristband, since he couldn't actually see or feel it. Did he just trick himself into making an information window for something that didn't exist? Well, he could actually try to test that. He attempted to use view data, this time imagining the wristband was on his left wrist. If the same thing happened, he would try to imagine a different object and see if an information window about that came up too. Instead, he got nothing. Maybe it was because he doubted that it would work, but maybe it was really just that the wristband was on his right wrist. Wristband, equipped on right wrist. Technological item. This is a wristband. It has something to do with lore, probably. His ability persistently told him that it was real. Well, as real as anything here was. He looked around at the purple sky and everything else in the game. Still, since it was real, it theoretically had some purpose. What could he do with it? Did it do anything at all? Wristband, equipped on right wrist. Options. Invisibility, enabled. Restricted mode, enabled. That wasn't a lot of options. It didn't tell him much, but it was something. Could he change the options? Would you like to disable invisibility mode? Yes slash no. Mentally, he clicked yes. Suddenly, he felt the weight of a wristband on his right wrist. It was just the same as the one outside the game. He hadn't been able to feel or see it at all before. His hands had definitely passed through where it was earlier. Well, it wasn't that hard to spawn in items in games. Or, the feeling of them since the game was what told him what he was feeling anyway. Still, it was weirder when it felt real. Well, what was that other option? Would you like to disable restricted mode? Yes slash no. Yes. Are you sure you wish to disable restricted mode? Yes slash no. Yes. Warning. 
Disabling restricted mode will likely lessen immersion in the game. Are you sure you wish to disable restricted mode? Yes slash no. Jules felt like the game was trying to stop him from doing this. However, that made him want to do it even more. It had gone from idle curiosity at the option to a desire to uncover its secrets. He absolutely would find out. Yes, this time no message popped up, but Jules still felt that it had not succeeded. I strongly advise against what you are doing. A voice spoke out of nowhere. No, it came from the wristband. It felt familiar, somehow. Can I not do it? You can. However, the voice sounded hesitant. It's not against the rules or something, is it? I'm not using anything from outside the game. Jules wanted to know why there was a voice talking to him now. At the very least, he could keep it talking to figure out where he remembered the voice from. It isn't against the rules. However, it's still better to not change the setting. Just so you know, it won't give you a single bit of advantage in gameplay. In fact, it is quite likely to make it less fun. Well, if you tell me what it does, then maybe I won't. Though, why include a feature that you don't want to be used? Unfortunately, even telling you would have about the same results. Jules realized why it had taken so long to recognize the voice. He had only heard it once, almost a week earlier. Well, if you won't tell me, that's okay. After all, without you, I wouldn't be able to play this game. It's fun, thanks. You're welcome. Not going to deny it? Would you believe me? Besides, I have no interest in deception. It's a bad policy to lie to customers. I didn't give you guys any money though. It's the same as if you won a raffle. You have access to the game, so you are a customer. Well, since you had triggers set up to notify you that I was doing this, I bet it's a pretty important option. It's possible that I was browsing events and just happened to notice. At this time? Not likely. I thought you weren't interested in deception, or do only direct lies count? It doesn't count if I don't expect you to believe it. That's fair. Jules concentrated on the game again. I see you haven't given up. Not going to stop me? I won't. Won't or can't? Won't. However, don't say I didn't warn you. A lot. I won't accept any complaints. Oh, one last warning. It is in your best interest to not tell anybody about the results. I'd ask why, but... You're right. I won't tell you. So, Jules, for the final time, brought up the menu and pressed yes. This time, he was sure it worked. He could feel it. He just wasn't sure what it did. Absolutely nothing changed. He didn't even feel different. His stats were the same. Well, that was to be expected. He had been told that it wouldn't affect the way the game worked. Then what did it do? Jules experimented with everything he'd learned. View data still worked in the same way. Telekinesis. Speaking Uesmithy. Nothing was different. He tried everything until it was about time to get up for work. I don't suppose you will tell me what it did? Nope. I won't. Figure it out on your own. You were actually still listening? Sure. I don't always know when people are going to act like fools, so when I get the chance I definitely pay attention. You're weird. That is probably not untrue. It's almost seven, by the way. You should probably sleep. Jules logged off but he didn't sleep. He just stared at his real-life wristband until it was time to go to work. December 3rd, 2184, 7 o'clock Friday. Many Worlds Chapter 12. Jules was somewhat in a daze as he went to work that morning. Though he thought of it as going to work, he didn't really have to go very far. He lived in the same place that he worked. There were also others who lived in the rooms provided, but they didn't see each other often. All of the librarians were pretty reclusive, after all, most people wouldn't be content living underground. From Jules' perspective, though, it's not like he would see the sun even if he didn't live underground. It didn't matter to him. He got paid to do something he didn't hate, so it was worth it. Jules looked at the pile of books he had to work on shelving. He wasn't really sure why it wasn't a completely automatic process. However, if it was, he wouldn't have a job, so he didn't particularly complain about it. Sometimes, he would get books that weren't for his section in his pile. That really shouldn't have happened, but maybe it was someone's way of checking to see if he was doing his job. He picked up the top book and looked at its data. Title, Ender's Game. Author, Orson Scott Card. Publication date, January 15th, 1985. Below that were its classifications and summary. Well, 
it certainly fit under the category of science fiction. He checked all of the other books, organizing them into a few smaller piles, then pushed along the cart that they were on, placing books where they belonged as he came to where they belonged. As he was able to do his job almost subconsciously, he practiced uesmithy as he wandered along. Nobody was going to show up nearby, so he wouldn't be made fun of for talking to himself. Actually, he was pretty sure that not talking to himself might be weirder, down here all by himself. He supposed he could listen to music, but he'd rather be productive, even if it was just practicing a fictional language made up for a game. It was possible he was slightly addicted. Eventually, Jules reached the location for the last book in the current stack. However, it had to go on the top shelf. A shelf Jules couldn't reach. It wasn't that he was short, the shelves were just very tall. There was actually an extendable ladder on the cart, but it was a bit of a pain to get it out. Jules sighed and wished this were many worlds. He could just use his telekinesis to lift the book up, and it would slide neatly into the shelf. He wouldn't have to get out the ladder. Of course, that wasn't possible. Jules set up the ladder and then reached for the book, but he couldn't find it. He checked on the floor and under the cart. Then, he glanced around at the shelves. It would be pretty obvious if it had fallen anywhere nearby. Jules looked up. There it was, already on the shelf. He must have blanked and put it there already. He took down the ladder and put it away on the cart. Then, he slapped himself in the face. It hurt. That was to be expected. Jules reached into his pocket for his computer. It was very helpful for looking up the information on the books without being near the printers. He realized that he had forgotten the computer in his room. Then he thought about Uesmithy again. It came to him naturally. There was no trace of the headache that had happened before. Jules looked at the cart, then back up to where the book was. He knew he hadn't climbed the ladder. He searched his pockets for anything, but they were pretty much empty. The only loose item he had on him was the wristband. He took it off and concentrated. It floated into the air. That surprised Jules. First, that it floated. Was he still in the game, somehow? Though, he wasn't sure why they would have representations of his home and work. The other idea he had was that the wristband somehow gave him the powers he had in the game. Not that it made much sense to him, but it was his first thought. Except, then why would it work when he wasn't wearing the wristband? He left the wristband on the cart and moved several bookshelves, lengthwise, away from it. He took a book on the end of a row, and it still moved with telekinesis. He put it back on the right spot carefully, then slapped himself in the face again. It still hurt. No guarantees he wasn't in the game somehow still, though. Next, he tried to bring up his status window. Ah, there it was. None of the numbers had surprised him. Some of his attributes had slightly increased as he played. The plus tens were points he had distributed at level up. He wasn't sure why they were displayed in that manner. Attributes are displayed with the base, trained, value, plus any amplifications. Oh, helpful information. That was rare. What Jules took from that was that training his willpower from 134 to 135 would take the same amount of effort no matter how many bonus points he distributed to it. Nice. Oh wait, there was something more important than that right now wasn't there? Did the presence of the status screen mean he was still in the game, or somehow connected to it? Unfortunately, no helpful windows appeared to answer that question. What might not work if this were the real world with special powers, that would work if it was part of the game. The first thing that Jules thought of was the death and resurrection system. Obviously, he wasn't going to test that one. Perhaps, options? Options, not available. Yes, progress. Well, it could be that the options just couldn't be changed in the part of the game that now represented the real world or something. At some point, he'd just have to reach a conclusion and believe it, because reality was basically only knowable through the senses. Thus, if a game could replicate any senses, such as many worlds, it might as well be reality from certain perspectives. Jules went to get his wristband and entered the game. The options window worked. He thought about the easiest thing to test, then slapped himself. He then turned the pain settings down and slapped himself again. It certainly hurt less. Then he left many worlds and slapped himself again. It hurt normally. So, at the very least, the options didn't seem to transfer out of many worlds and couldn't be changed outside. Therefore, Jules decided to live as if he now had telekinesis in reality. If he didn't, 
and his reality had been replaced by something from the game, he couldn't really do anything about it. It was best not to worry about it. That was what he told himself. Over and over. It didn't stop him from worrying about it, though. Many Worlds Chapter 13 Jules didn't log on to Many Worlds until the next day. He was glad it was a Saturday, so he didn't have to work, because he was still stuck in a depressing cycle thinking about whether his world now was real. Though he did also skip out on the latter half of his work Friday, nobody would really check up on him regularly. Besides, he could just take it as a sick day or mental health day if anyone asked. After about a day of confusion, Jules settled down into a more normal state. He decided that he just wouldn't worry about such things at this time. Thus, he decided to once more enter many worlds. At least he could see the sky there, strange though it was. As he entered many worlds again, he took stock of himself. His equipment was the same as when he had started. He supposed that was probably a pretty pathetic state to be in after playing a game for almost a week. Though, he had learned telekinesis, which was pretty good. Still, he liked to have a real source of food instead of eating random plants. He'd been fortunate so far, but he really wanted something tasty. Though he could eat good food in real life too, he'd rather also have decent food where he currently spent the other half of his life. To do that, though, he needed money. Thus, he entered Fesmoilia to look for a job of some kind. Upon entering the city, he could tell that other players had gotten the message about its being open. Though they were less than 1% of the people, they stood out. Mostly, they were found in small groups, parties, probably. That was after all how people in a memo grouped themselves. Jules walked along until he reached the residence and perhaps place of business of the telekinetic who taught him. He realized he hadn't bothered to learn the man's name and hoped he hadn't come across as too rude. Of course, he hadn't asked Jules' name either. Maybe they were just both socially inept. Greetings, master, said Jules. The man smiled in response. Master, not to be rude, but I realize I have not learned your name. I am Jules Verne. Wachilius. Jules found he had little trouble when he tried to pronounce the name. It sounded like Wachilius, but not quite. However, he imagined that his language skill helped him do it correctly. I had some questions. Basically, Jules asked how one made money with telekinesis, besides teaching it to people. That wasn't something he was qualified for anyway. Well, with enough precision, it can be used for crafting certain things that can't be done without, such as a few things with internal attachments to hold things together. Not that there is much need for such things, since it's generally easier to design something that can be put together by a machine. Of course, there is also some application of telekinetic power in military matters, but we have little need for such at this time here. However, without a certain strength, Many just act as street performers. The Wachilius shrugged. I doubt I am much suited to those things. Plus, I'm not very skilled yet. I'd say that you are plenty skilled for someone who has only learned for a few days. After all, you have had some success, which is faster than I learned. It is a very interesting trait of you offworlders. Very quick to pick up the basics. If you continue to learn at that rate, then you might be ready for some more advanced techniques, if you have been practicing. Normally, I would charge, but as my first offworlder student, I am interested in your progress. Wachilius had Jules demonstrate his ability, and he was quite satisfied at the progress made. He did give Jules some hints on how to handle liquids better. Then, he helped Jules with his object sensibility, which Jules had to admit he hadn't been practicing much at all. Eventually, he got to the point where Jules could tell what item was put into a small box, at least in general terms a sphere, a cube, a pyramid, and so on. It was much easier to sense things when not looking through the outside of another object though. Sensing locations and shapes of objects was very different from the senses he was used to, and he had to concentrate for it to work. However, Wachilius assured him eventually it would come naturally. Then Wachilius had him spin the ball inside of the box, using telekinesis of course. At this point though, you are good enough that I can recommend you to my friend who makes various small toys. He likes to hide latching mechanisms on the inside, but I don't have enough free time to do it for him, and he is unable to do it himself. He can't pay too much, but since you offworlders don't seem to need to pay for lodgings, I imagine it will be sufficient. Thus, Jules found himself a second job. Though, this one was in the game. 
He would have to work out a flexible schedule after the meeting that had been arranged the next day. He didn't have a problem with the wages either, since he would be getting practice with a skill at the same time. Being paid to grind skills was a wonderful thing in an MMO. Outside of the game, Jules used his telekinesis whenever nobody was around. Not for anything significant, but just in all the situations he'd felt like using it before he thought it was real. Not that he was sure if it was exactly real now, but it worked, so he didn't care. Therefore, instead of bending down to pick up a dropped pin, or walking across the room to get something, he would use telekinesis. He wondered if he should tell his friends. However, ultimately, he decided, not yet. Maybe after he met up with them in-game, he would be able to see if he could unlock their features. Or maybe not. He would have to think about it. Hopefully before then he would have exactly what was going on figured out. At least, an acceptable amount. Whatever was going on, though, Jules couldn't deny that telekinesis was pretty awesome. Would he be willing to live in a world that wasn't real to have it? Jules wasn't sure about that. Not that he could do anything if this world wasn't real anyway. Many Worlds Chapter 14 Jules spent all day working with Wakilia's friend, Irokin, making various objects. Though he was technically working, Jules found it very engaging. Instead of making toys, he felt like he was making something magical, like a lightsaber. After all, these were things that couldn't be made without telekinesis. The parts securing the pieces of various things together were located inside and couldn't be connected until the final shape was formed. Thus, they would just fall apart on their own, since there would be no way to attach the parts. Jules actually thought it would be funny to make impossible puzzles. Certainly, it would be possible to do something similar by gluing something closed, but it wasn't the same. In the evening, Jules felt something strange. He was tired. Certainly, practicing telekinesis was mentally tiring. However, after resting for a while, he would recover. It was like exercise. No, he was sleepy. He hadn't felt like he needed to sleep even once since playing many worlds. Jules wasn't sure what was going on. However, he knew that he couldn't do much more in many worlds anyway. Jules logged out of many worlds to go to sleep. However, he suddenly didn't feel tired. He tried logging back in, and he was tired again. So, inside the game, he was tired, and outside he was not. However, he didn't have anywhere to sleep in many worlds. Plus, he didn't know if it would really help. Thus, he tried to convince himself to sleep. Instead, he ended up laying in bed with his eyes closed. That said, his senses weren't really cut off. He still knew where everything was. It was his object sensibility. He could choose to turn it off like closing his eyes. The fact that he had to choose to turn it off meant it had become natural. It wasn't extremely well-developed yet, but it was part of him. Even here, in the real world. If it was real. He didn't give up on the pretense of sleeping, but as he lay on the bed with his eyes closed, he started picking up random items from around the room and floating them in nice patterns. Occasionally the mental tiredness would come over him, and he would rest. However, he still never felt the need to sleep. Then, he went to work. After a full day of work, he was suddenly sleepy again. Why was that? It hadn't happened before. This time, though, he'd been awake for most of a day about 18 hours. He'd also spent a similarly large amount of time in many worlds, because it had been his day off. So, it wasn't that he didn't need to sleep. Rather, it was more that while he was in one place, he was effectively sleeping in the other. Jules understood why this would be true of his real body, though he wasn't sure if it was real anymore. After all, it should be staying where it was. However, in many worlds it was known that they disappeared when they logged off. Was there a body still there somehow, hidden like the bracelets? Jules rejected that idea. Many worlds seem to be based on some kind of actual rules. While it might be possible to hide a relatively small bracelet from sight, touch, and even the idea of interacting with it, thus making it seem as if your hand passed through the area instead of moving around it, it would be much harder to do with a body. So, if it really was still a real body, then it probably went somewhere else. Or, it just disappeared, and Jules was reading too much into it. In two days, on Wednesday, Jules went shopping again. Mostly, because it was a break from thinking about whether the world was real or not, even though it actually made him go out into the world. He wasn't technically tired, 
but he looked like he was. He wasn't really paying attention and almost bumped into Mary. She noticed him and smiled. Is this your regular shopping time then? She noticed his face. Are you all right? If Jules were a normal person or in a normal state of mind, he probably would have said, yes, I'm fine, whether he was or not. Maybe if he was close friends, he would tell the truth, but he'd known Mary for slightly more than a week and mostly casually. However, Jules wasn't a particularly normal person and he definitely wasn't in a normal state of mind. So, he said looking up at the lights above, how do you know if something is real? Mary tilted her head as if this was a silly question. Well, if you can see it, touch it, smell it, taste it, then it has to be real. At least, as far as anyone can tell. So, many worlds is real, then? What? No, it's a game. It's not real. Is it not? I can see it, touch it, smell it, taste it. All my senses tell me it's real. Yeah, but it's a game. Those are false sensations. Jules shook his head. Are they? They don't feel any different from here. Yeah, but how could that be real? Mary looked like she was doubting something. Do you really want to know if I'm all right? Or was that just idle conversation? I really do want to know. I feel like we could be good friends. Well, I'm crazy. That's all I can tell you right now. What's making you crazy? Doubting reality? Yes. She looked curious. So, what is it that caused you to doubt reality? Jules shook his head. If I tell you, you'll go crazy. Mary laughed. I'm serious though. You probably don't want to know. Mary turned serious again. I don't think you're crazy. Probably. Can't you just tell me? Jules shook his head again. Actually, I can't. I could show you. But, it's a tough choice. Like, the red pill or the blue pill. Um, what's this about pills? Are you on drugs? Jules laughed. Oh man, if only it were that easy to explain. No, I'm not on drugs. Also, you need to see the Matrix. 1999. Actually, I think this is a decision you shouldn't make until you watch the movie. Why? Because it's a good movie. That's it. Actually. Plus, you should take some time to think about whether you want my brand of crazy, because I'm pretty sure you're underestimating what believing stuff can do to you. So, if you want to ask, watch the movie and think about what I've said. Or, just think about it anyway. The movie isn't actually necessary. Then, in a few days, you can make your decision. And I'm supposed to contact you how? Jules paused, then awkwardly said, I guess you could call me? Thus it was that Jules exchanged phone numbers with a woman for the first time. He probably would have been a lot happier if he didn't have to walk outside through the polluted air looking up at the lack of sky, wondering if any of it were real. Approximate time, December 8, 2184, 1700 hours Wednesday. Many Worlds Chapter 15 Jules sat on a tree stump in the woods near Fesmoilia. He felt the sunlight beating down on him. That didn't help, because he didn't really know what sunlight felt like. He shifted, feeling his clothes slide across his skin. He pulled out his knife, and rubbed his finger along the side, feeling it. He pricked his finger and watched the blood flow. He tasted its iron. He listened to the sound of birds he had never seen. Jules picked up a flower and smelled it. He even sensed where everything around him, every blade of grass was. Then, he moved into the city and watched everyone go about their business. People bought and sold wares, guards patrolled the walls, children played in the streets. All in all, Everything that happened in a city was happening here. He thought about what Mary had said. Then, he pondered the lore behind many worlds. Earth was overpopulated, and after coming upon miraculous new technology, sent people to various planets with the hopes of colonizing them. A common setting, but one also not far from the truth. No, in fact, the only discrepancy from the truth was subtext. It was implied that sending people to other worlds involved them leaving Earth. However, that wasn't necessarily true. Jules couldn't find a single sensation that felt incomplete. Here, because he had gained powers from the game in the real world, he had started to doubt that it was even real to begin with. It was no more real than many worlds that had led him down the path of doubt, where he believed nothing was real. However, well, if you can see it, touch it, smell it, taste it, 
then it has to be real. At least, as far as anyone can tell, the real world was no more real than many worlds. This meant the real world was fake, or many worlds was real. Final conclusion. The bracelets for many worlds weren't computers, but some kind of conscious transference system. They were probably also capable of augmenting abilities. The spawning areas were some kind of cloning facilities. A new body had been created here. That was why he only felt tired after spending a lot of time in one place, because his body was always resting in the other. Well, the bodies here had to be stored somewhere when players were offline, but that probably wasn't much harder than making bodies to begin with. Some kind of teleportation, maybe. Jules tried to stabilize his new view of reality. He would have asked the mysterious voice for confirmation, but he probably wouldn't have gotten a useful response. Instead, he just decided to believe in what he had deduced. Maybe he was wrong. Upon finding proof, he would gladly change his worldview. However, although conspiracy theories were all well and good, he had a hard time believing that the most simple solution was that the world he knew wasn't real. Instead, he had to believe that some force, quite likely the world government, had sent many people's consciousnesses to another planet without informing them of what was going on. That would be somewhat ridiculous if the same government hadn't done such things as covering 90% of the land area of Earth and solar panels, among other things. Jules walked to the marketplace in Fesmoilia, such as there was. It was really more like a shopping district that had enough free space around for trading outside of the shops. Players, no. Adventurers was definitely the better term now. Often went there. Though, since they had only been around for a week and a half, often was perhaps not the correct word. However, there were players around now. Jules imagined that adventurers were somewhat of a headache for the city, buying and selling weapons to each other completely unrestrained, mostly without licenses. However, it seemed they let it happen, as any such items initially ending up in the hands of adventurers went through proper procedures. After that, it wasn't worth dealing with. They knew that players wouldn't attack citizens of Fesmoilia. No, they couldn't. Jules wandered around picking up what he could and heard of a couple incidents. Some people tried to ignore the don't attack NPCs rule, which Jules thought really meant don't attack natives, if this were real. It seemed some adventurers had intended to attack Fesmoilians, probably because the adventurers were arrogant and looked down on them. Then, as they raised their weapons to attack, zap their bodies disintegrated in a puff of smoke, never to be seen again, leaving behind only their items. The Fesmoilians were generally good-natured, but there had also been a couple instances of them starting fights, though just throwing punches. The adventurers defended themselves and weren't banned, or more specifically, disintegrated. It seemed various incidents actually had different results. It seemed that one person had the bright idea to intentionally provoke someone into attacking so that he could defend himself, and then they got turned into a pile of dust when they tried to attack with a weapon. Needless to say, these conflicts caused the Fesmoilians to not be completely happy at the presence of adventurers, but they certainly tolerated them. The ill-behaved ones were never seen again. Jules also looked over the various items people were trading. Mostly, they were the same. There weren't large differences in quality among the various weapons and gear that people had acquired, except damage that happened after purchase. Jules decided on various information he wanted to know about things and started gathering it. He couldn't come up with damage values or defense values for things, but there were certain features he could learn. He discovered that he could approximate how good he thought something would be, even without sorting through the little details, as long as he learned the details. He also discovered that details he hadn't specifically gathered started appearing. For example, he didn't have to find out the name of every type of gun around. After a certain point, the information just started appearing. He also managed to gather the prices things had been sold at, even though he was sure he hadn't overheard any transactions. Apparently, he'd somehow gained the ability to passively gather data around him. This made his information class more useful. Though, it still didn't seem like any kind of game class, but was rather more of a unique ability. Jules wondered what other people's were. Well, maybe this would let him find out. Many Worlds Chapter 16 Jules looked around and tried to use his view data ability on other people. What he came up with were a lot of screens that looked like this. Name. 
About half of the people had names he could see, the rest had. Class, adventurer, a small number of people had. Secondary class. Presumably, those with questions marks for their class had changed to something other than adventurer. Since each secondary class was unique, he wouldn't have knowledge of it yet. As for names, Jules had overheard some of them, but as for the rest, he wasn't sure where he got the information. As he was scanning the crowd, he suddenly came across someone with a secondary class that he could actually see. Name, Mary Shelley. Class, Soldier. Secondary class, Samurai. Oh, it was Mary. He looked at her and slightly tilted his head. Why did he know that information? Maybe because they were friends? She saw him looking towards her and waved, then walked up to him. Jules couldn't help but blurt out, Soldier? Samurai? He looked at her, and she seemed to have gotten a sword. A straight, long sword type weapon, and not a katana as would be expected of a samurai. Though, Jules wouldn't really expect a samurai in a science fiction game either. Mary looked at him in surprise. What? How did you know? I was just going to brag about it too. That lead to another option for how he got the information. If it was something people would freely tell him, he might be able to gain it beforehand. Though, it may also have been because they were friends. Jules planned to experiment later. It's my secret information network, also known as my class. So, is a sword actually more useful than a gun? Mary shrugged. I kind of got thrust on this path because of my secondary class. I enjoy it, and in certain situations it could be better. I've heard there are some beasts here that are quite resistant to bullets, but swords work better. Well, good swords, with mono edges. Plus, you can use a melee weapon in an energy shield, but not a gun. Not that I have a good sword or an energy shield. She paused for a few moments. You seem better today. Jules nodded. Yeah. I've basically gotten over my existential crisis. That was mostly true. Or at least he had stopped worrying about what was actually real. Mary smiled. That's good, but I was actually hoping you'd give me the red pill. I'm interested in what it was that upset you so much. You seem like you would be pretty stable, normally. I was thinking of calling you later, but I ran into you here. Well, Jules hesitated. Are you sure? I'm sure. Mary nodded. Jules shrugged. Well, it's your decision. We should probably go somewhere there aren't as many people around. They did so, moving out of the city. Well, which wrist is your bracelet on? Mary looked down at her wrists. M, I don't have a bracelet. Jules held up his right arm and raised an eyebrow. Really? I meant the one like this. Mary looked at it for a second and then stammered, Why you? How did you get one of those in game? Jules just smiled. Which arm do you keep yours on? Mary paused for half a second. My left arm. Jules used his view data ability, and as expected it showed one of the wristbands. He brought up the menu to disable invisibility mode, but surprisingly it popped up facing Mary, though Jules could still see it, unlike any windows normally conjured by players to view their own status. Mary looked at Jules oddly. Well, you should probably hit yes, he said. Mary pressed yes then looked in surprise at the wristband that had suddenly appeared. Then, Jules triggered the option for disabling restricted mode. She looked at him again, then pressed yes. Unlike with Jules, there wasn't any more to that interaction, just the single window. Mary looked around. So, what did that do? Jules pondered for a few moments. Well, I could tell you, but I think it might be more interesting to figure it out on your own. If you haven't figured it out in a couple days, just call me. Mary looked around. Seriously, nothing feels any different. It won't, until you figure it out. Just do whatever you were already going to do. It should eventually become apparent. I really do think it will be better if I don't just tell you. Mary sighed. All right, fine. Well, I've got a hunting party to go join. Wanna come? Jules thought about it for a few moments. I don't really fight yet. Maybe next time. Jules was staring at a rock, pondering. He discovered that he could show people the data on items. However, he was bothered since he didn't know if it was really accurate. If he was showing false values, well, it would be good for scamming people, but Jules wasn't interested in that. Thus, he looked at a rock. Name unknown. Type mineral, rock. Description purplish rock. Mass 1 kilogram. 
The only data point that would be relevant to manipulate would be the mass. Thus, Jules focused on trying to change that in the same way he added more categories and got the kinds of descriptions he wanted. Then, you have unlocked a new ability. Manipulate data. The data shown for the rock changed. Name unknown. Type mineral, rock. Description purplish rock. Mass 1.1 kilograms. Fascinating. Jules tried to change it more, but the number wouldn't get any bigger. He concentrated hard enough that his head actually hurt a little bit. Then, he decided to make the number smaller. It changed again. Name unknown. Type mineral, rock. Description purplish rock. Mass 0.9 kg. Jules was satisfied with this result, but slightly disappointed that he could only change the values within a small range. For some reason, it also left him mentally drained. Then, he frowned. Why would it take so much energy to change a number? There was something else odd, too. He hefted the rock. It felt lighter. He changed the number back to its highest value. He felt even more tired. But the rock was definitely heavier. He thought the one kilogram was just a number he had made up, an approximation. However, when the number changed, the rock changed. Had he really picked up a rock that was exactly one kilogram? Jules changed his mental setting, displaying more digits. Ah, it was just close enough for him to consider it to be exactly one kilogram. Thus, the number displayed was his best approximation. This also meant that, somehow, he could actually change the mass of something. Wouldn't that take far more energy than just some mental tiredness? As he sat there viewing the data on the rock, pondering, he noticed that the extra, insignificant digits started changing. They were slowly counting down, and then more digits started changing faster and faster, until the rock was back to its normal value. So then, instead of creating mass, perhaps he was creating a temporary effect of different mass? Jules wasn't sure how it really worked, but he would certainly experiment with it. Many Worlds Chapter 17 Jules created a practice range, though it was somewhat imprecise. It was really more like a pile of loose dirt into which he threw rocks, with his mind, of course. There was a limit to how hard he could throw things with telekinesis. This was because he was only capable of outputting a certain amount of energy at a time. His new ability, Manipulate Data, allowed him to slightly circumvent this problem. He could make a less massive rock, about 0.9 kg out of one, move faster, and then change its mass to greater, about 1.1 kilograms, and its total kinetic energy went up significantly based on how far he could get it to penetrate into the dirt. However, it wasn't breaking the laws of physics. Jules wasn't sure what the actual values were, until he realized that it was also a form of data. Realizing that, he managed to view the velocity relative to the ground as a stationary object, and that let him get better calculations. Kinetic energy, E, equals one-half asterisk M, mass, asterisk V, velocity, carat 2. If he made a 1 kilogram rock move at 10 meters per second, it had an energy of 50 joules. If it was a 0.9 kg rock, it moved only about 10.5 meters per second. However, upon increasing the mass to 1.1 kilograms, the energy was about 61 joules. It was about a 20% increase in energy. Of course, the energy still came from somewhere, namely, himself. However, he wasn't limited to the same output as he used for his telekinesis, so the total energy he could impart went up. However, that also meant he drained his mental energy much faster. Jules had been mentally tired before, but upon using telekinesis and manipulate data, he knew what it was like to be mentally exhausted regularly. It was kind of like exercising a muscle and felt about the same. His brain hurt, even though there weren't any actual pain receptors there. Everything he felt became sort of fuzzy, and if he pushed it too hard, he passed out. Even when he regained consciousness, he was still drained. The good news was, he'd found a way to improve his mental attributes. Physical Mental Fortune Power Strength 81, 2, Intelligence 140, 7, plus 10 Luck 99, Finesse Dexterity 88, 1, Wisdom 143, 6, plus 10. Durability Toughness, 95, 1, Willpower. 136, 2, plus 10. Quantity Constitution, 92, 2, Focus, 135, 1, 4, 
plus dit quand homme flux, 126, 2. His focus had grown the most, probably since he had been completely exhausting his mental resources. However, everything else had grown some too. His physical attributes improved slightly just from being more active than normal. On the subject of quantum flux, Jules wasn't sure if he liked the fact that it somehow increased. It wasn't necessarily a good thing. However, Jules now thought that he might be able to fight. Though, a gun would probably be better than telekinesis at this point. He might be able to speed up the bullet if he had a projectile weapon, but he found it was harder to act on a moving object, especially ones that were distant. After a couple days, Jules got a call from Mary. He decided to start up the conversation abruptly. So, did you figure it out? I think so, maybe. Mary's voice certainly sounded uncertain. I feel different now. I'm not sure if I'm convinced enough about what's happening to actually say it. Jules thought about that for a moment. He'd been lucky to have the easily testable and supernatural ability of telekinesis, which had left little room for doubt about what had changed. Meanwhile, she probably just got her enhanced physical abilities, among other skills. I suggest you think carefully about what I've said so far in this conversation, and it will probably convince you. Although Jules couldn't see her, he could tell Mary was concentrating. Then, wait, you were speaking Uesmithy? I haven't been able to speak it outside of the game. So it's really, our game abilities have transferred to real life? Jules nodded, then realized the gesture was stupid over the phone. That's right. Haven't you felt stronger? Well, I imagine you haven't had a reason to swing a sword at anything, or you probably would get it sooner. My abilities were more conveniently obvious. But then, she didn't seem to be able to form the right words. Jules had been like that. However, he hadn't had anybody to talk to about it. Maybe we should meet up in person. Okay. They met up at a restaurant, since it was a convenient place to talk. It was also convenient in that it had somewhat private booths. This would allow their conversation to not be overheard much. It also allowed Jules to demonstrate his telekinesis. Although Mary had seen it before, it was different to see it in the real world. She started off the conversation, So, this is what you were going through. I don't really know what to think, exactly. Jules nodded. The conclusion I came to is that everything is real. Mary tilted her head, confused. But, telekinesis? Does that mean some of those things on shows are real? No, otherwise someone would have actually verified it by now. But if it's not, well, I think probably everything you've seen is fake. Telekinesis is real, but I doubt anybody really learned it, except maybe a small few who hit it. I think I could learn it because of this. He tapped his wristband, which he still wore everywhere. I'm pretty sure it enhances bodily development and learning. Otherwise, there was no way we could learn a language that fast, or grow stronger, or learn telekinesis in any small amount of time, even from someone who actually knew how. Mary nodded. That makes sense. So, are you ever going to stop rotating that napkin in the air? Jules frowned. Only if it bothers you. I've only had telekinesis for like, a week. I still want to use it for everything. Mary smiled. I probably would too. Actually, can you teach me? Jules shrugged. I can try, but it probably won't be as fast as from the official trainer. Jules paused for a moment. It doesn't seem to work like the language, probably because that's an important thing for surviving in the world. Jules also shared his thought about the NPCs in many worlds and how they were probably just real people on a different planet. Nothing explained why they looked mostly like humans, though, except Maybe that was the reason Phasmoilia was picked as the first planet. It also wasn't too dangerous. Perhaps later planets would be more alien and dangerous. Many Worlds Chapter 18 Jules' next goal in Many Worlds was to meet up with his friends. For that, he would need money. Transportation between cities wasn't cheap, but it wasn't unreasonable. Jules found it odd that with such obviously advanced technology, the cities were far and spread out. In addition, there weren't any roads between them. Presumably, there was a good reason. But Jules didn't know what it was. Jules could work with Irik in making toys and such, and he certainly did, but he was also interested in other ways of making money. With danger came money, and hunting some of the beasts on Usmith, the planet, as opposed to the language, Uesmithy, was very dangerous. Of course, 
Jules was aware this world was real, but he also had the ability to come back to life here. Thus, it would be interesting to try. Plus, he had pain settings reduced, so it shouldn't hurt to badly even if he did die. Not that he was actually going to fight anything dangerous at first. He needed to see if he could even hurt anything. The weapons Jules had at his disposal was A, space, combat knife, and telekinesis. He didn't particularly fancy his chances in melee combat. Of course, there were small animals, but they would just be able to run away. Thus, Jules was going to hunt PLYK, which were something like raccoons. However, they ate everything. They were very bad for plants and trees because they would eat their leaves and roots, leaving them dying. PLYK also bred rapidly, so they were basically just large vermin. They weren't good for much of anything and were certainly bad for a whole lot of things. Thus, they were the kind of thing that it was highly encouraged to kill them if you saw them. There were regulations on seasons that certain animals could be hunted, but not for PLYKS. Not long after setting out, Jules encountered the first problem with hunting them. That is, there was a lot of area to search. He had found locations of recent sightings, which was good, but unlike a normal game, or perhaps it was more correct to say a real game, animals didn't just hang out in a small area, blatantly obvious. Also, there was literally an entire wilderness around, not just a few places that were interesting and highly populated. Jules did see a few things, but there were more animals around that he didn't see. At least, not with his eyes. He noticed quite a few animals relatively nearby, birds and trees, and even some burrowing creatures. Presumably, there were more beyond his approximately 3-meter sensing area. Though, it didn't extend as far under the ground. However, he finally found a PLYK after two hours because of this ability. The PLYK was hiding behind a tree. It did seem about the same as a raccoon, but Jules thought it probably had a bigger mouth and more teeth. Not that he had even seen a raccoon in real life before, or studies any movies with them closely. Jules walked around the tree so he could see it, at the same time taking out a rock he'd brought with him. This area was more forested, so it was fortunate he brought some ammunition. He wasn't confident in his ability to do anything with the branches that were around. Jules launched the rock at the PLYK, but it was already moving and avoided it. It dodged back and forth as it ran from him, and soon his small supply of rocks was exhausted. Of course, he could reuse the ones he'd launched, but his ability to pick them up at a distance was limited. Jules thought about the various mistakes he'd made. First, his speed of attack was too slow. It took him over a second to concentrate enough to throw the rock, reducing its mass, speeding it up, then increasing it was hard to pull off. Second, his accuracy was pretty terrible. The PLYK probably hadn't needed to dodge at all. The third mistake was he himself moving at all. He hadn't needed to go around the tree. Though he hadn't been near it, he came into visual range. That wasn't necessary, because throwing rocks with telekinesis he mostly relied on his sense of where things were through his telekinetic powers anyway. Even if something was farther than his normal senses away, he could see further by narrowing the vision elsewhere and extending it in a certain direction. Fortunately, Jules had finally entered PLYK territory, and thus he was able to find them about every 15 minutes, on average. Sometimes, he wouldn't find any for half an hour. Sometimes he found them sooner. The fourth one, he managed to graze. The fifth one he actually hit with a sneak attack and killed it. One good thing about using telekinesis to attack was there was no crunching of leaves or movement of branches to give away the location of the attack. Certainly, if you saw the floating rock, you could recognize it as a danger, possibly. However, animals weren't sure how to react if they were even looking the right direction. After hunting a few more, he found that they sometimes heard the sound of the rock moving through the air and could slightly avoid. However, that was only sometimes. At the end of the day, he had managed to gain a level, but more importantly he'd become significantly more skilled at using telekinesis to attack. Perhaps he would try fighting something bigger, though he could still just purchase a gun. There was also the option to use his combat knife as a projectile weapon, though he only had one of those. However, he found it was quite well balanced and capable of taking out a PLYK by itself if he was accurate. Jules had also worked on extending the range at which he could control things. It was always going to be harder to move distant objects, but he could have some effect at 3 to 4 meters. 
Enough to retrieve things, anyway, but not enough to give them enough force to attack. Still, Jules was pleased with his progress. Many Worlds Chapter 19 Jules thought about what his use in a party might be, especially if he joined up with Mary. Presumably, she already had people who were capable of combat with her. Jules would rate himself as ever so slightly above a random person picked up off the street. At least, a random starting adventurer. Not that he didn't think he could become more useful, but he wasn't going to be extremely useful. However, he had an idea of what he could bring that others couldn't. Information. It was, after all, his class. Jules wasn't sure how much help knowing an enemy's attributes would be, but it couldn't hurt. While he had been killing PLYKS, he had thought to look at their data. At first, he'd only been able to get vague numbers in only some of the attributes. However, upon observing more of them, he'd gotten what he knew to be more accurate numbers. A somewhat typical specimen looked like this. Subject, PLYK type, animal. Strength, 50 intelligence, 42 luck, 113. Dexterity, 167 wisdom, 44. Toughness, 67 willpower, 56. Constitution, 56 focus, 103 quantum flux. As animals, their mental capacities weren't particularly strong, though the numbers were actually somewhat high for animals. Of course, since they were small, their strength was low compared to humans, which also made sense. Their dexterity was quite good. Jules was still comparing their values to an average adult human, which was somewhat odd, but he couldn't think of another standard that would be particularly more sensible. At least he had some idea of what the values should be, this way. On the other hand, Jules had reason to believe that there wasn't really any need to be in combat. Certainly, if this were actually a game, combat would be the primary way to level up. However, this was obviously a relatively peaceful planet. There wasn't much need to fight here, except that couldn't be entirely true. The cities were surrounded by walls, and there were always guards. That meant to Jules that there was some danger, and perhaps it could come at any time. Either way, Jules was certain that there would be more danger on subsequent planets if and when they managed to get them unlocked. If it was just a game, the next section would unlock after certain conditions, such as a certain number of players getting to the required level or completing a specific event. While the first thing that could be tracked, Jules doubted that most future events could be predicted with any sort of accuracy. Then again, maybe they could. He had telekinesis after all. What else worked? Though, He'd done a casual sweep of the city and found nothing that would suggest precognitive abilities were publicly available. In summary, Jules still felt that it would be useful to become proficient at combat, at least for the future. It was unfortunate that Jules still had to work in the real world. After all, his body there, which was slightly more real than his other one, probably still needed food. Plus, there were books there that still needed reading. Working wasn't entirely a waste of time in Jules' eyes. Although he still didn't feel like this vault of book was particularly important, he managed to get a lot of practice in telekinesis. He wanted to carry all of the books around with telekinesis, but unfortunately each object he was moving made it significantly harder. Splitting his concentration into many pieces was not something he could do. At best, he could carry about three books consistently. He tried stacking them, but any wobbling would easily drop them from the pile. So, he carried as many as he could with telekinesis and still used the cart for the rest. He still used telekinesis to place the books where they went, even if they were going on shelves within easy arm's reach. He wasn't worried about his co-workers seeing him, since he hadn't seen any of them in his section in a long time. Plus, the whole place was very echoey, so he would hear them coming from far away if they did come. Jules had used that technique to prevent getting caught reading at work, once or twice maybe more. An interesting side effect of having new abilities that he constantly used was that Jules started to use them unconsciously. Telekinesis was one thing, since he'd always tried to use it to pick up pins that he was too lazy to reach, but his other abilities as well. Of course the ability to view data was used when he wanted to know what section a book should go in, but also in another case he hadn't expected. Jules had to occasionally go through and check for misshelved books. While he usually got them right, there were a lot of books to place and a lot of monotony to get distracted by. Plus, it was in his job description that he had to check. 
Jules found that he could take in a view of an entire row of shelves and quickly determine which books were out of place. It wasn't really a conscious thing, where he particularly thought about it. Instead, he was able to visually mark the books, like a display in a game. He supposed that was a sort of viewing of data that he made up. After all, the windows that displayed information looked like what he wanted, so there was no reason he couldn't display other things. However, after using the ability, Jules felt somewhat mentally tired. Not as much as if he had personally inspected each book, as he previously had done, but tired. On the other hand, maybe it was about the same amount of effort, and his mental capacity was just enough higher. Though, as usual, the actual result was probably some of each. It didn't take as much energy as doing it all manually, and he also had more mental capacity. In the end, Jules was glad to find ways to train his game, skills while at work. Many Worlds Chapter 20 After Jules had noticed the lack of any infrastructure connecting the cities, he had shrugged it off as just a feature of Usmith. Perhaps the inhabitants had no desire to cover the entire planet, but chose to live modestly. Either way, he hadn't really thought about it after that. However, he noticed a feeling throughout the city of Fesmoilia. The citizens were preparing for something. It wasn't immediately obvious, because they didn't seem particularly worried. This meant that whatever event they were preparing for wasn't particularly momentous, or it wasn't soon. Jules asked around town, and soon discovered that he had underestimated what people can get used to. There was certainly an event coming, a month and a half away. But Jules still felt that the natives were far too calm compared to the magnitude of the event. However, it completely explained why they only had cities in certain places, and no roads. Calling what was coming a major geological event would be an understatement. It wasn't a secret, but it was impressive. Every few years to a decade, the land would shift. This wasn't something small, like an earthquake. Instead, it was just as the words used, a shifting of the land. All of it, at least, in a large area around a city. The cities themselves were built in regions that, for whatever reason, were stable. However, outside the city borders, the ground would move violently. A part of the area would shift around in something like segments, rearranging locations, though not quite as gracefully as one would imagine. In addition, similar events caused pieces of land to merge together into new hills, or possibly mountains, and others to pull apart and cause ravines. As of yet, there was no way to predict what would happen, except for massive earthquakes. Although for several miles from the borders of the cities the ground wouldn't shift, any structures in the area would probably be destroyed by the intensity of the earthquakes. In the city, it wouldn't be as severe, but it wasn't something that could be ignored either. The reason for the walls of the cities, besides denoting what was considered a safe building distance, was because of these land shifts. Although there weren't many dangerous animals that lived on the surface, underground and in caves there were more monstrous things. These creatures would become agitated and leave their homes before the land shifts started, only returning sometime after they settled down. That would not have been a problem, but they knew the only stable areas, seemingly by instinct. These areas, of course, were the locations of cities. Thus, upset, dangerous beasts would approach the city, followed closely by and coinciding with large earthquakes. Of course, it was also possible that such creatures would come out at other times, which explained why the walls were manned by guards all the time, though not very many. This meant that if Jules wanted to participate in the coming events, he would need to be competent in battle before then. He could just stay out of the battle, of course, but the worst thing that could happen is he would die in many worlds. Though it came with some penalties, he would come back to life. Meanwhile, it was likely some native Uesmithi would die, and they would stay dead. Other players probably wouldn't have the same sense of that as Jules, but they would be interested in participating in a game event. In fact, as soon as he thought about that, he noticed a pop-up window. You have received an area quest. Land shift. Help the citizens of Fesmoilia prepare for the land shift. In addition, contribute to the defense of the city from the monster attacks. Time remaining, 44 days. Rewards. Based on contribution, Jules was surprised at the timing. Had thinking about it in some way generated the quest? The answer, of course, was yes and no. It was probably just waiting to be discovered by someone. Jules looked around and noticed that other players were reacting as well. 
It seems they had received the quest too, thus it being an area quest. All quests so far had been related to the natives. This was probably to foster the idea that helping them was a good thing, and likewise would give them goodwill toward otherwise strange adventurers. In a real game, the fact that NPCs gave quests would just be a given, whereas here the quests were actually part of the system given to the players. It wasn't particularly different from a practical standpoint, which is what allowed people to still believe Many Worlds was a game. After all, it was fantastical and had game elements, at least from their perspectives, and they had no reason to believe it wasn't a game. Obviously, the announcement of the area quest involved a flurry of activity from players. Of course, there wasn't actually all that much that was immediately obvious they could do to prepare for the land shift. There were already perfectly good walls in place, and soldiers to defend them. However, some players took the chance to find officials from the city, and started a list where they could sign up to help defend the city. Although it already had defenses, more wouldn't hurt, especially relatively cheap, seemingly fearless help such as the adventurers. It ended up being a rather strange contract, though, that didn't fit standard ones. After all, normally the money that would be paid to deceased members of a combat force would usually go to family, instead of being paid to the deceased themselves when they came back to life later. Of course, this also meant there wasn't any bonus pay going towards those who died. Meanwhile, Jewel still had the intentions to become capable of fighting such creatures because he hadn't experienced death yet in this world. And, although he knew that people respawned, he wasn't particularly interested in trying, since this world was still real. Would it even be him that came back? Was it even him now? Well, perhaps more importantly in the short term, he didn't like pain, and thus would try his best to avoid it. Many Worlds Chapter 21 Jules wasn't exactly in a rush to prepare for the land shift. Although a month and a half didn't seem like enough time to prepare for such a big event, Many Worlds had only been launched for two weeks. This meant people still had approximately three times that amount to prepare. Certainly, it would not have been enough time if they were required to make all of the preparations, but they were really just a bonus that wasn't included in the preparations to begin with. Unlike other game stories, the adventurers weren't some amazing force come to save the world. Instead, they just happened to arrive, as explorers. Jules was glad that he wasn't expected to save the world, since he didn't want that level of responsibility. More importantly, it gave him some amount of confidence that there wasn't any way to predict the future in the hands of the makers of many worlds, likely the government. Jules hadn't really done any digging on that subject, because he just assumed it was true now. Jules also maintained the hope that there wouldn't be any extremely world-shaking events happening anytime soon, besides the obvious, literal version. Jules took a few moments to ponder weaponry again. The existence of swords somewhat surprised him. In addition, assuming that secondary classes were intended to be useful, Jules could then assume from Mary's samurai class that swords would be useful. He couldn't be sure that secondary classes would be useful though, but instead it was possible that they were just suited to the user. However, Jules considered scenarios in which ranged weapons, especially futuristic ranged weapons, wouldn't be useful. First, enemies that could move or more specifically dodge, fast enough to avoid being hit by bullets, or being struck by all of a laser shot. Hopefully this would be because of intelligence and some prediction of attacks and not pure speed. Otherwise, melee weapons would be even more useless. However, a sword or some other melee weapons could perform a sweep, more likely catching an enemy. Guns could sweep too, but with a serious loss of precision. That might be an important factor. Finally, Melee weapons would be useful in the situations where it could be assumed that the enemy would be fast enough or numerous enough to survive whatever gunfire was aimed their way, inevitably arriving in melee range. Perhaps there were other reasons as well, but Jules could see why melee weapons might have survived. And, unlike the light combat daggers that would be more useful against humanoid opponents, heavier weapons might be needed to penetrate the hides of some enemies. The reason Jules was thinking so much about weapons, of course, is because he couldn't just pick up a few and try them out. Weapons were expensive, even if they were somewhat common here. At least, they were expensive for someone who had only been gathering currency in this world for less than two weeks. Fortunately, he didn't have any expenses here. He didn't sleep here, didn't buy any food in the city, though some people did. 
and hadn't even needed to pay Wachilius to learn telekinesis. That last was fortunate, because he imagined it wasn't cheap. Though, it seems adventurers got a discount since they didn't take a large quantity of time or effort. Jules continued to work with Irik in making toys, puzzles, and other devices that required telekinesis to put together properly. There were other ways to make devices that couldn't be taken apart without breaking them, but Jules thought they were less elegant. Metal pieces could be welded together, or parts could be molded into their final position. For some things this was fine, but welding specifically often left imperfections. Jules enjoyed this job. Not only did he get to practice fine manipulation with telekinesis, he learned about many kinds of hooks and latches, as well as various other locking-type mechanisms. He even made a few simple puzzles that could only be properly solved with telekinesis. Jules enjoyed using his telekinetic senses, which allowed him to see the shape of things. As he practiced more, Jules actually realized he could sense not just the shape and position of things, but he could also receive a good sense of its velocity and more interestingly momentum. This was different from checking something with his view data ability. It was a more natural sense instead of reading numbers off a sheet. Jules was planning to join Mary and her party so he could get some experience in combat after he got a weapon. In the end, he decided that he would get a standard projectile weapon. Although laser weapons were often more powerful, they were more expensive. In addition, Jules was certain that his aim would be poor. He wouldn't be able to redirect laser fire with his telekinesis, but he could nudge projectiles to be slightly more on track. His senses could help him aim properly to begin with, which meant that a laser weapon would be better, except that his physical body couldn't keep up with what his mind wanted. He wasn't particularly strong, and his muscles trembled. At any point, his aim could be thrown off before he shot, requiring him to fix his aim. Certainly, with practice he could overcome this, but he still thought that a projectile gun fit his abilities better. As for melee weapons, Jules couldn't afford to also get a sword or such, and he already had his combat knife. The same physical limitations also applied, so he was already sufficiently equipped. He just hoped that he wouldn't have to actually use it. Preferably, he would shoot at his enemies and they would die before they got to do much of anything. What Jules finally purchased was considered a standard handgun, but of course it looked very little like a gun from Earth, at least in style. Practically, it still had a grip, trigger, and barrel, but the aesthetic standards were different here. Instead of retaining its silvery metallic sheen, or being black, it was a muted brownish purple. It was probably a more practical color, since it wouldn't be particularly reflective of the light, and would, at the very least, not blatantly stand out from the land around him like silver would. Jules had a chance to fire a few practice rounds, and the feeling of power made him really want to try putting it to practical use. This was offset only by his desire for safety. Jules shrugged. He'd have to get used to danger eventually, so he might as well start soon. Many Worlds Chapter 22 It was somewhat easier to be casual about going out to fight monsters if you had the assurance that you wouldn't die, permanently anyway. This is what Jules thought upon seeing Mary's comrades, and upon realizing their relative lack of defensive equipment. Of course, armor is also very expensive, and does little good if you don't have a weapon. In addition, if you can kill the enemy before they get to you, like with a gun, then your lack of defenses matters little. Only one of Mary's companions was armored. He was a relatively large man by the name of Ray, and he had managed to obtain a chest plate that resembled that of the town guards, though perhaps a bit less new. As they went over combat roles, he also showed that his left arm had a small energy shield, which could be used like a buckler. In his right hand, he could use a laser pistol he had, or a gravity hammer, which may or may not have had anything to do with gravity, but hit hard. He would support Mary in melee combat, if it came to that. Otherwise, she would have been left to fight anything that got up close alone. John didn't have any armor, but he did have something that looked somewhat like a sniper rifle, though it apparently was of the laser variety. He was much skinnier than Ray, but nearly as tall. His role was to act as the scout, and of course he wasn't a bad shot with his rifle. The final member of the group was another woman, by the name of Ursula. She also had no armor, and wielded an assault rifle, the projectile kind. Obviously, her role was to contribute in making the enemies dead faster. Jules himself would mostly be just an additional gun, once combat started, 
but he would also be able to help beforehand by identifying the properties of new enemies they saw, at least somewhat. Some knowledge would be better than what they could get just from vision, and it wasn't a problem to have more people in the group. Although their share of any profits might theoretically go down, they weren't a greedy bunch, and by the equipment that Ray had on, it was obvious that they had contributed to effectiveness more than just a fair split. Plus, it was likely that Jules would be able to increase efficiency, so it would have been foolish to just think that any money would just be split among more people. Most importantly, Mary's three companions still believed that this world was just a game, and having more people around would be more fun. Jules wasn't going to correct their ideas about that, because this world could still be reasonably treated as a game, and it wouldn't be bad for them. Their goal at this time was to scout out the area around some caves, and kill any dangerous creatures that came out. It wasn't likely that there would be many yet, because the land shift was still far away, but such beasts still wandered out occasionally. Phasmoilia didn't have the manpower to spare to partake in such activities, but adventurers would do it relatively cheaply, so it was still worth sponsoring, in this case by the city itself. There would still be a small amount of payment if no enemies were found, but more could be made if any were eliminated, especially if they had any valuable parts. Though, what could be brought back easily was somewhat limited, since they didn't have an unexplained inventory like in a real game. They did, however, have a pair of foldable sleds, in case they needed to drag back an entire valuable carcass. When John pulled out a paper map, Jules wondered if there were any GPS on this planet. He hadn't asked about satellites, but they could exist. It might be expensive to purchase such devices, or perhaps it was just lower priority. At least, a pocket computer was less necessary to surviving a fight than a weapon or armor. Could Jules view a map with his abilities? Maps were, after all, a form of data. After concentration on the idea, he discovered he could create them, but only on the level that actual maps would be. He couldn't keep a real image of the area, or view places he had visited. It would be a different sort of ability, if he could do that. In addition, he had to spend some energy and effort on creating the map as he traveled, and it wouldn't automatically be correct. Still, it gave him something to do as they moved along, and it let him practice his abilities. Mental exercise was always useful. As they walked along and entered a forested area, Jules thought that the trees must be very sturdy or grow very fast. After all, with changes to the land occurring frequently, it would be hard for trees to thrive. The trees were a bit thinner than what he was used to, but still were quite sturdy. The conclusion was still some of both. However, Jules thought it probably relied more on their ability to grow quickly because they might be moved to an area where they weren't suited to live. Jules wasn't sure how far things might move in a land shift, but at most it should shift what soil was around a tree, if it could remain standing. It probably wouldn't be enough to move something into a significantly different latitude, though whether patterns could change if mountains rose or fell. This planet must have been very hard to survive on before the cities were built, but now it was in an unusual state where it wasn't hard to survive, but almost impossible to expand, even though there were bountiful amounts of space. Unlike Earth, where the planet was quite stable in general, but all the space had now been occupied. Jules thought about if it was possible for humans to inhabit any of the unused areas on Usmith as they approached the first cave. Many Worlds Chapter 23 After an hour or so of searching the area around the cave, since it wasn't advisable to actually enter into the cave, the group found their first monster. Monster was more of an apt description than Jules had anticipated. He'd expected something animal-like, like the PLYKS. However, upon thinking about it, having creatures that actually looked familiar was somewhat of an odd thing to begin with. In addition, the creatures that came from underground were always called monsters by the locals, not animals or beasts. All of these thoughts went through Jules' head, only to settle on the final thought that he now understood. The creature they saw only bore the slightest resemblance to animals he recognized, and that was its quadrupedal form, like a wolf or bear. It also had a somewhat similar head, filled with sharp teeth, but even that was only similar, since instead of regular eyes it had eye stalks that were somewhere around 50 centimeters in length. These seemed to swivel around as they pleased, writhing somewhat wildly, though probably not randomly. Instead of fur, it had something more akin to porcupine quills covering its entire body. 
There wasn't any time to plan strategy since it noticed them at the same time that they noticed it. Jules didn't know what it was called, but he decided to think of it as a spined horror. The group opened fire with their guns, but the creature was smart enough to move erratically so that they couldn't hit as they pleased. However, as it approached the distance between them, it still took some injuries, though attacks were somewhat deflected or absorbed by the spines. Once it got close, Jules saw it was definitely close to the size of a bear. Mary stepped out in front of the group, and Ray switched to his hammer as well, as the spined horror got close to the group. Mary slashed at it with her sword, and Ray knocked it back with his hammer. The monster didn't dodge at all, instead letting itself get hit, the sword mostly scraping off its scales, and the hammer barely slowing its momentum before it barreled forward again. It seemed its method of attack was to just try to hit its body on whoever was in front of it, impaling them on spines. It wasn't too fast, however, so both of the melee combatants were able to dodge out of the way, and it was even open to a few shots from Jules, Ursula, and John. However, though the party was unscathed, the monster was only slightly injured as well. The battle continued much the same way, with Mary and Ray attacking as they could, slowly trying to get through its spines, and then avoiding its attacks. However, after one time they dodged out of the way, one eye stalk focused on each of them, and spines shot out of the monster like arrows. Since they weren't prepared for such an attack, and were already dodging, they couldn't avoid them. Ray's chest plate stopped all of the spines there, but he still had his arms scraped up by some, and one hit his leg and lodged itself there. Mary didn't have much in the way of armor, but managed to twist herself so that the spines could only hit her side, a narrower target. However, she had several spines hit well enough to stick into her, and one was in her left arm. This surprise attack wasn't good for the group, but Ray was still in good shape, just a little slower, and Mary could fight even with an injured arm. After another exchange, though, it became obvious that the front line was getting tired, since they had to be constantly running around, and they were losing some blood as well. However, John noticed something important. There are empty areas where it launched the spines. Aim there. Indeed, it had launched spines as a group from regions on either side, so it didn't have them to help defend there. That was why it hadn't used them earlier, since they were also defenses. Mary took the advantage to slash the relatively less sturdy hide underneath and made the first large wound on it. Ray, meanwhile, just focused on being prepared for the next time it launched spines. As it grew more wounded, it launched spines more frequently, however Ray was prepared to deflect them with his shield, and both melee combatants had adopted tactics where they would dodge in and out, so that they could be further away if the spines were launched again, making them easier to dodge, since there was more time to react and the spines were more spread out. Mary didn't have much to block with, however, so Jules used telekinesis to help deflect the spines launched at her, at least a few from each attack. Eventually, they managed to kill the spined horror, but it wasn't an easy victory. The first thing they had to do was treat Mary and raise wounds. They had basic items for first aid and even some training, but the spines were a problem. If they just pulled them out, the wounds would get much worse, as they had barbs that would tear out the flesh. However, the group had one advantage that normally wouldn't be available. Jules could use telekinesis, allowing him to create forces in places that couldn't be reached normally. He could even see inside the wounds and could push the flesh away from the spines. It was rather hard to do, but he managed to at least reduce the amount of tearing. Then they bandaged the wounds. It was at least enough to keep them from getting worse, and they could remain functioning. In addition, because of the game system, the injuries actually helped them train their toughness and constitution. Ray had already intentionally put points into such things from levels, so he was actually less injured since the spines didn't pierce into him as much, as well as the armor protecting him. The group set up camp, since it would be night soon, and it wouldn't be good to get in another fight and reopen the wounds before giving them any chance to heal. They didn't just end up with wounds for their effort, there was a bounty on this type of creature, and it also gave another benefit, experience. Jules was the only one to gain a level, since he was the lowest level of the group, with Mary's party being in the tens. Jules looked at his new statistics, for level 6. In addition to his statistics, his levels as an adventurer, 3, made him about 3% better at everything. Or almost everything, but it wasn't clear what it covered, except various types of combat skills. 
Meanwhile, with the three levels he had gained since he switched to telekinetic, he got a 9% increase in telekinesis-related abilities, much more effective in that area, but not as widespread of a benefit. Jules could continue to get levels as an adventurer if he wanted to, but his total level seemed to determine the experience required, so he was more interested in the benefits from telekinetic. Many Worlds Chapter 24 Jules rather enjoyed hunting monsters. It was what he imagined a nature walk would have been like in the past, except of course much more dangerous. However, going around outside and seeing animals, plants, and natural terrain was rather nice. On Earth, most of the views of wild animals and nature were in movies. There was very little real nature left. Thus, here was an interesting substitution, with a different, but also real, version of nature. Though, this one seemed less real, because it wasn't like what he was used to thinking of nature as. Their party continued to look for monsters, but avoided the next, spined horror, since they weren't in good condition to fight one. They would be significantly less dangerous if the front line had full armor, but for now they would do best to avoid them. John's ability allowed his to extend his hearing far around, so he could provide warning against approaching monsters, though it wasn't possible to keep his ability active constantly. However, even without that ability, he still had the skill set required for the role of scout. The group looked for monsters that weren't as well armored, since they would be able to defeat them more easily with their current equipment. The result is they fought a few smaller creatures, though they were still about the size of a human, and fought them. The creatures had six legs, fur, and sharp claws. However, they were relatively easy to defeat. After the first, which survived until it reached melee range, the next two were defeated just with their ranged weapons. If this had been an actual game, Jules probably would have wondered at the balance, but there was little to be done about it if it was real. Some weapons were just vastly superior to others, depending on the circumstances. For example, Jules learned those creatures could climb on walls or ceilings, and they would be devastating in small, cramped places such as their native caves. After grouping with others for a few days, Jules discovered some more game-like systems that were implemented to make playing with others more feasible. People couldn't always be on at the same time and for the same lengths, and it took significant amounts of time to travel. However, upon logging out, there was the option to follow someone. If you receive permission to follow them, your avatar, though, Jules was aware it was a real body, more than just a representation, would follow after them, but would not participate in combat. There were some risks involved with having a non-combatant around but the convenience of being able to keep a group together often outweighed it. In the worst case, they would die and suffer the penalties, and wouldn't be too far from the city. In addition, players could teleport back to the spawn points, but they suffered penalties as if they had died. Jules assumed such a limitation was imposed because it took energy, and creating or moving bodies had to take a lot of energy, and the system in place had to limit how much was used somehow. Outside of the game, Jules kept in communication with his friends Robert, Isaac, and Douglas. He still hadn't told them about the game world being real, but they were working toward meeting up in the game where he planned to unlock their abilities. Plus, then they would finally be able to play together. Each of them were working toward gaining the money to buy a flight from one city to another. Although the cities were separated from each other, they did actually still have travel between them. Although it seemed like a long time of saving money for something in a game, in reality it hadn't even been a month yet. The fact that people with no established jobs or connections were able to make decent money at all was impressive enough. It helped that there were only a few million people spread across a planet, though that number would be going up soon, as more wristbands were going to be released at the end of December, about two weeks away. The planet itself was very prosperous, as well, even though it seemed like it should barely be able to function. Well, presumably it was picked as the first planet available because it had opportunities for players to thrive. There was one point of the game that Jules had mostly forgotten about. The attributes were supposed to be complex, but only the tin were listed. After realizing the world was real, Jules had stopped thinking about it, but he became curious. Thus, he decided to look into it with his information class abilities. The results were rather interesting. Upon trying to gain more detailed knowledge about strength in particular, he saw a representation of his body. There were various colors throughout the vision of the muscular structure, and they seemed to represent muscular density and power. 
Although he didn't actually have any bonus points to spend, the system allowed him to see what it would be like if he wanted to add points of strength to, say, just his left bicep. It also came with the warning that such things were completely not recommended. Jules wasn't surprised that such information was tracked, however, since real bodies were that way. Instead of tracking the information, it was better to say that it was probably reading it or observing it from the real body that had been created. Upon looking into the mental stats, it became much harder to visualize. Instead, the window broke things down into analytical ability and processing power, but made note that mental statistics were less precisely trackable and even less recommended to be changed at the lower levels. Having this information made Jules ponder. These seemed like somewhat fundamental parts of the game-likeness of the world, but it had been hidden behind a barrier. Would other people really be able to access this? The answer came to him. Yes, through various abilities, and most of them could also give others such access. It was quite convenient to have something like a personal help ability, though, it was only useful when whoever was controlling the information allowed him to have it. Jules wondered if he wasn't learning things that were important, but there wasn't much he could do if that were true. Many Worlds Chapter 25 Jules thought about how hard it was to make telekinesis useful in combat. Although it had been somewhat helpful, he still wasn't powerful enough or agile enough. Part of the problem was the way in which it functioned. It wasn't like a hand, grasping onto an object and moving it as he willed. Instead, it was closer to pushing a wall up against something, thereby causing it to move. It wasn't even certain that he would continue pushing an object in a direction he wanted, especially if something else caused it to move. Basically, Jules created an area of force, which was essentially a rectangle that transferred force to everything passing through it, or a three-dimensional version that pushed anything in the area it occupied. This meant he was capable of deflecting things to the side quite easily, since he only cared about it going away from somewhere. However, throwing something straight was somewhat problematic, since many things would swerve off to the side. Jules did have some feeling of the way things were moving, though, and would subconsciously create more forces to keep things straight, but it wasn't as good as he wanted. Jules had gotten pretty good at creating something like three walls meeting, like one corner of a cube, pushing an object from several directions, leaving it only one way to go. He ended up with pretty good control this way, but there was a lot of wasted energy. In addition, he still didn't have good control over the object's rotation. However, as he practiced more, he gradually became able to create more forces and more precision. The easiest way to ensure he kept control over an object was to push on the inside of it, but this took much more energy. It was an almost exponential increase based on the depth he was trying to reach, though it also depended on the density of the material. However, this meant that it was pretty much impractical to try at his current level of power. Another aspect Jules worked on was range. Unfortunately, there wasn't much he could do to improve this on its own. It wasn't technique, but just power. When controlling something's movement, he could use many smaller forces as long as he could control that many at a time, but using telekinesis further away had the same problem as holding up something at the end of a long stick. It was heavier, or at least felt heavier. Jules doubted he could come up with any way to fake being closer to something. Realistically, he could just move closer. Based on his current needs, Jules decided to distribute future levels solely between intelligence and wisdom as they were described in game terms. Power and finesse were what he needed. Willpower and focus, durability and quantity, wouldn't be as important. He didn't expect to be facing much in the way of mental attacks, at least not at this point. He wasn't even sure what those would be, but it seemed likely they would be uncommon. It wasn't like he was particularly lacking in willpower at this point either. Focus would always be useful but having extra energy to use wasn't important if he couldn't complete the tasks he wanted to begin with. Jules thought about specific situations he had encountered. The spined horrors, specifically, had launched large numbers of spines at once. There were two ways to deal with their attacks. He could create large fields in front of people, in AV shape, deflecting all of the spines to the side. This was the simplest way, but it also consumed a lot of energy. Force was wasted on all the areas that didn't have spines, in addition to the fact that the energy wasn't deflecting in exactly the right direction. If people were next to each other, there were even more problems, since spines would be deflected to the middle of them, and the forces would push against each other. 
Depending on how close people were, the spines might still hit one of them. Deflecting them up would work, but then gravity had to be worked against, and the spines could also hit people behind. Though, most of these problems were academic, since Jules could barely even cover one person with such defenses against an attack, because he just didn't have enough power. He had enough to bring to bear if he deflected individual spines, especially if he could precisely target them. However, that was part of the problem, since it was hard to keep a force on a moving target, especially many at once. Most of the problems would be solved with levels, but Jules still needed to practice. After all, it would do no good if he had enough force to deflect all of the spines, or the finesse to individually deflect them, if he wasn't prepared to actually do those things, and at the right time. Jules didn't just practice when he was in many worlds, though. It was nice to have a job where he was basically alone. He could practice telekinesis while on the job. He was still getting work done, if a bit more slowly. It was also possible that some books were slightly damaged, but Jules doubted that it would ever matter. Only a few were actually significantly damaged, and he had those reprinted. It was a good thing that nobody ever came to his section, or they would have seen a whirlwind of books floating around Jules. Well, maybe a small dust storm, if he was being honest with himself. There were actually relatively few monsters who had left the caves at this point. It was still almost six weeks until the land shift, after all. Jules also had the feeling that the more dangerous monsters would take longer to surface, as they likely lived deeper underground. Though, that was mostly his gaming sense talking. Perhaps the most dangerous monsters would appear earlier than expected, since they weren't actually bound by the rules of a game. Based on what he'd heard from the Uesmithy, though, he was at least somewhat right. At least, nobody looked particularly worried yet. Many Worlds Chapter 26 Jules couldn't say that he didn't enjoy his time with Mary and her group, but he still felt that something was missing. It truly felt like they were her group, and not something Jules really belonged to. Instead, Jules belonged to a group composed of him and his friends, Isaac, Douglas, and Robert. They'd been together at college, where Jules had gotten a physics degree he didn't use. He wasn't even sure what he could do with such a degree, at least before he'd had telekinesis. The group had met there, at an actual physical campus, a rarity, and become friends because of their similar interests in games as well as their views on life. Then, they had returned to the places they grew up, keeping in touch through the internet, including video communication. However, they rarely met in person, since long-distance transportation was costly. Ironically, it was cheaper on Usmith, which meant they were going to meet there, soon. Not that Jules' friends were yet aware of the fact that Many Worlds was real. It wasn't something he just wanted to tell them, he wanted to show them, and for that they had to meet up. They would, within a week. In practical use, Jules experienced the exact problems he had considered with telekinesis. The group sought out spined horrors, not because they were fun to fight against, but because they were a known enemy. The death penalties and the experience of virtual death itself were deterrent enough that nobody wanted to try anything too risky, and some of the monsters had been found to be extremely perilous. At least the spined horrors didn't have any poison, unlike what some other groups had experienced. The spines were always shot out. Deflecting them to the sides might let them hit the next person over. Deflecting them up was more tiring, and if he wasn't careful they could still hit the people in the back lines as they fell back down, which included himself. He could deflect them down, but that generally just targeted them toward the legs of Mary and Ray, and then there were spines they could step on, disrupting their movements. Jules didn't have the power to push directly against the trajectory of the spines and stop them, so a head-on approach didn't help. Finally, he settled on deflecting them at an angle, to the side and upwards. As long as the back row remained somewhat in line with the front row, this method worked fairly well. However, the back row couldn't be directly behind those in front, since they had to be able to take shots. It was eventually determined that the most practical method involved a much more spread-out formation. Maybe it was obvious, but nobody in the group really had any experience with battle tactics, so they had taken time to develop the proper formation. It was quite simple, but effective. It would also likely work against many other monsters, but it was not without flaws. Mary and Ray would flank the spined horror from either side, or more likely the front and back. The ranged members of the party would stand off to their sides, so that the front line wasn't in the line of fire. 
Jules took a position somewhat closer, since proximity was important for his telekinesis to work. Mary Monster Ray. Jules. John Ursula. This formation reduced or negated the chance to deflect any spines into another person and left the lines of fire open. It even gave those in melee combat some good opportunities to attack. The main flaw, however, was that if the monster decided to charge Jules and the rest of the ranged members, there was nobody between them and it. To deal with this, they had to take advantage of the terrain. Trees, boulders, and small cliffs were always very useful. Though, if they had a decently sized cliff, there was no need to marry and Ray to risk themselves in melee. They could snipe at any monsters they saw and would sometimes kill them and sometimes scare them off. There were also a few monsters that the group had encountered that could easily and rapidly climb almost any cliff face, in which case they treated the cliff as if it were just a larger distance to overcome. The group tried to only fight multiple monsters when they were up against those with softer hides, which they could kill more quickly. It was hard to say that anything was not dangerous, because everything was capable of possibly killing at a moment's notice. It was also a rare battle where the entire group came out and scathed. In particular, Ray and Mary had wounds and patches all over. Jules didn't envy their position. Since there wasn't anything like a miraculous healing medicine, the group took frequent days off to at least partly recover. Recovery from certain wounds could be shortened with some of the machinery available at the local hospitals but such treatments were expensive and situational. The time taken to heal wasn't terrible, thanks to some feature of the game, so adventurers didn't frequent the hospitals or medical clinics as much as might have been thought. This further cemented the view of adventurers as strange in the eyes of the natives. It wasn't an incorrect view, either. Jules sat and looked at the wristband on his arm. It was an amazing piece of technology, though the outside wasn't particularly remarkable. Inside, there were some very interesting pieces of gadgetry, though Jules couldn't have begun to describe what they did. He couldn't even have opened the wristband, but he could look inside. There were so many small, microscopic things, yet they weren't delicate pieces of machinery either. Jules thought about the technology that was available elsewhere and couldn't think of anything that matched. Even with the entire planet, well, mostly just the land and a portion of the ocean, covered in technological conveniences, Jules couldn't think of anything quite like this. If he wanted food, he could even have anything he wanted printed up at his food replicator. That said, it wasn't particularly good, only meeting the technical requirements to be various foods. It wasn't like it could magically generate a perfect cheeseburger, but instead threw together various components into something very much like one. There was a reason Jules still bought food at a store. If he wanted to travel, he could take a hyperloop, rushing along in a tube at something like the speed of sound, though it wasn't cheap. Airplanes were almost a thing of the past, since they took up so much space and it needed to be open to the sky. There were even virtual reality simulations of almost anything he could want, though they didn't quite feel real. However, none of this was like the technology in these wristbands and in the respawn points. His consciousness instantly went across the galaxy and bodies could be created relatively easily. Yet, this technology had appeared from nowhere. Most people didn't even know that it was actually doing those things. Jules was waiting to talk to his friends about it. They would certainly have some interesting theories, even if they probably wouldn't be right. Many Worlds Chapter 27 In slightly less than a month since the opening of Many Worlds, Jules' friends had managed to gather enough money to come to Fesmoilia from their various cities. This was a testament to the speed at which adventurers could gather money starting out with almost nothing. However, it was also somewhat of a testimony to their lack of requirements for some expensive necessities, such as shelter. As for food, most players seemed to eat whatever they could forage, or whatever was cheap. Though, Jules was planning to move toward as good of a balanced diet as he could get. Since he was putting the food into a real body, even if it could function with just the bare necessities, he expected it would be better to have a good balance of vitamins and minerals. The first thing Jules did after each of his friends arrived was to unlock the functions of their wristbands. The responses were varied. Douglas stroked his dark-haired beard thoughtfully. Oh, so there really are wristbands. Why were they invisible? Isaac shrugged his wide shoulders. So, what did this do? Robert shook his head. Well, I don't feel any surge of super strength or anything. 
Jules explained, Well, it's not going to be obvious. You guys have had a long day traveling. Why don't we make some plans for tomorrow and then meet up then? Of course, Jules' intention with that was to have them all spend some time in the real world on Earth, where they could notice their abilities were no longer restricted. He pointedly ignored the calls and messages from them throughout the day. He knew they would still contact each other, though. Jules didn't want to shade their ideas of what was happening with his influence. Plus, he'd had to deal with it alone, so they would certainly be fine for a day with the support of each other. He imagined they'd have good theories. Once back in the game, Jules asked each of them to summarize what they thought was happening in a single sentence. Though, he knew he wouldn't get serious answers that way. Isaac said, The wristbands hypnotized us to make us stronger. Douglas responded, Obviously, we're in the Matrix now. Maybe we always were. That's two sentences, Robert noted. I'm glad you all put such deep thought into it. Jules smiled. Seriously though, what are your thoughts? Douglas took the initiative to be the spokesman for the group. We discussed it, but weren't really sure. Obviously, it's related to the wristbands. The hypnosis answer was on the table, but the effects lingered without the wristband nearby, and it was pretty significant. Isaac nodded. Everything felt lighter. I've gotten a decent increase in strength in game so far, and now I definitely felt it outside. There wasn't any kind of unnatural tiredness from overusing my muscles, either so it seems pretty real. Not that we're just convincing ourselves we can do things and pushing ourselves past safe limits. Robert held up his right wrist. These look the same in game and out, at least as far as I can tell. They're tough too. Jules nodded. I can confirm they're the same on the outside and the inside as well. You got one open? Jules shook his head. I learned telekinesis, which also has related abilities, such as sensing where things are including being able to see inside. And that works outside the game? Douglas asked eagerly. It does. Jules grinned. Telekinesis is great. You should learn it. Though, I can't say I'd be a good teacher. There is one in Fesmoilia. Speaking of which, have you interacted with NPCs much? Robert nodded. Some of them, anyway. They're, um, very real. That's a good word, Jules stated. Real? Douglas nodded. It has to be. Unless there's secretly another planet nearby being used only for the purpose of running a game. The level of detail is too high. It would take a massive colony of servers and a lot of power, at the very minimum. There haven't been any major changes in power usage, either. Though, that does beg the question of where the wristbands get power, because they're obviously using at least some. Jules nodded. I think there's probably a wireless power receiver in them, but the technology is weird. What? Like alien? Jules shrugged. I couldn't say that with any amount of certainty. However, it's something completely different from the way a computer or phone is put together. What if it's just nanobots? Robert proposed. Like, doing the enhancing of our bodies. I've been feeling hungrier lately. Or maybe that's because I forget to eat meals sometimes. Jules got a stunned look on his face. I... Can't see anything that small. So I don't know. I think it might be. I've been feeling something like that, Robert said. Feeling it how? Well, Robert paused to form his sentence properly. My secondary class is technopathy. I haven't really developed it much yet. It takes money to buy anything that it is related to here, and a gun seemed more useful than a computer, and it's weird to hang around things in a store. Plus, most everything is turned off there. Until just yesterday, the wristband wasn't something I could even really tell was there, though I kinda have a feeling I could've noticed it on my own if I practiced more. Anyway, I've been having this vague feeling that adventurers were different from the natives here. Like a glow. Then, in the real world, once I had the ability, I sort of felt it around some people, though I didn't realize they were probably only the players of many worlds. Robert got a shocked look on his face for a moment. Wait, that doesn't seem quite right. I didn't notice it at the time, but I think some government suits I passed had that same feeling. Well, it would make sense. I mean, they're the ones who distributed the wristbands, Jules pointed out. Why wouldn't they want to enhance the performance of their agents? That's a good point. Douglas stroked his beard. So, what have we learned today? Many worlds is obviously something big and more than a game, but not why it's being done. Great. Jules sighed. Yeah. 
So, wanna go kill some monsters? Everyone nodded. Many Worlds Chapter 28 Many Worlds Chapter 28 It turned out that killing monsters was a more complicated proposition than it seemed for Jules and his group of friends. Their equipment wasn't as good, since they'd had to spend money on travel. Jules would have felt guilty, but he felt that it was better to get them together with their bracelets unlocked as soon as possible. However, it did leave them a bit under-equipped. This wasn't a large problem, as they had over a month still until the land shift, when they would need to be as strong as possible. However, it also meant they had to be more cautious than when Jules was with Mary's group. Of course, they could have joined with Mary's team, but eight people was overkill most of the time, and it would be more efficient to hunt separately, at least at the current stage. For one thing, the group didn't have any melee combatants. This was perfectly fine as long as they could kill enemies before they got to them, and terrible if they couldn't. Isaac and Robert were using assault rifles, though Isaac was planning to upgrade to something even heavier once he could afford it, but not before acquiring some good armor. Douglas used a laser pistol, which was more accurate than a slug-throwing weapon, but not as good against armored targets. Because the general quality of their equipment was low, however, they had to pick and choose what they fought carefully. This was somewhat harder than it sounded. Unlike a normal game, or perhaps it would be more correct to say a real game, monsters didn't just spawn in one area, with a certain type or few types in an expected location. Though studying the habitats of animals worked, with more real monsters coming out of the caves every day, it wasn't known exactly what to expect. Monsters didn't remain stationary either, so they would often find Jules' group instead of the other way around. None of the group was particularly specialized in scouting abilities, so they often ended up fighting in disadvantageous situations. Because of that, they didn't always win. The group was looking for animals, preferably larger ones, that had been displaced from their homes by monsters. The income from animals wasn't as high, but it was safer than hunting true monsters with equipment that wasn't ready for them. Unfortunately, today wasn't going well for them. They hadn't found much of anything and had only succeeded in getting exercise. Then, they saw a spined horror. It too saw them. The area they were in was mostly rocky terrain with a few trees, so there wasn't much hope of hiding, even if it hadn't seen them already. Thus, they prepared to fight it, since they couldn't outrun it. The group let fly a hail of bullets, as well as laser fire. Over time, their accuracy had improved to where they could often hit weaker spots, but the spined horror's weird eye stalks were still hard to hit at a distance, as well as with its quick movements. The rest was still covered in the spines that served as armor. The group placed what trees and boulders were around between them and the spined horror, but that only slightly slowed it down. It soon had charged into the group, clawing at Isaac who barely managed to get out of the way as it passed, and even then he couldn't avoid getting scraped by its claws as well as a few scratches from the spines, which fortunately were pointed toward the rear of the creature. At this point, nobody held anything back, and they attacked with all of their ability. Not that they were generally prone to holding back, but they at least tried to conserve ammo in most cases. In addition, Douglas used some ability to enhance his laser fire. Instead of any color you would expect from a laser, red, blue, green, or anything of that sort, his pistol started shooting black. Where it hit, black fire lingered, and seemed able to actually break some of the spines, damaging the actual creature. Unfortunately, the spined horror was smart and knew that he was dangerous. It charged toward Douglas, who looked exhausted from just a few moments of using his ability. He couldn't get out of the way at all and was trampled with a terrifying crunch. Before anyone really had time to process the situation, the spined horror turned at the rest of the group. It charged Jules specifically, who managed to dodge to the side, but couldn't do anything about the spines it shot out as it passed. He was only partly expecting it, and could only deflect them away from their targets a small amount in the distance they had to travel. He ended up with one in his left shoulder, and one in his side. It hurt more than he had imagined. It was excruciating, and he even had the pain settings turned down. Jules would have wondered if they were fake if he hadn't tested them. However, he only had to experience the pain for a moment before the tail, spined horrors had tails, came toward his face, and he experienced death for the first time. Even though he knew he would be revived, death was a terrifying experience. 
Jules had tried not to think about the possibility that he wouldn't be revived in the game since his wristband was unlocked, but he had anyway. He even became worried that he wouldn't even end up at his body on Earth. However, he still also thought about it as a game, so his worries had faded until the instant it happened. Then, he was terrified, but not for long. Quite quickly, he found himself back in his body on Earth. He got a message in his head telling him that he would have to wait 24 hours to long into the game as a death penalty. This was true, but Jules thought it was probably also because they had to fix his body in the game, or construct a new one. Probably the former, since it would likely be more energy efficient. With the death would be experience loss. Jules wasn't sure if that was a necessary component or not, but it certainly discouraged dying in the game. The biggest factor, though, was the death itself. It was terrifying. Even if he hadn't known that it was a real event that had happened, it would have terrified him anyway. Being helpless and unable to stop it, Jules swore he would do his best to avoid dying ever again, even if he could revive with no penalty. Many Worlds Chapter 29 Many Worlds Chapter 29 Isaac, Mr. Asimov, can you hear me? Isaac took his eyes off of the computer monitor he had been focused on. Yes, sir. He was at work, and his boss had apparently been attempting to get his attention. While I admire your focus on your work, it is time for the meeting. Right. I'll be there right away, sir. Isaac watched his boss walk off to the meeting room. While it was generally true that he would focus on work, this time he had been thinking about something else. It wasn't not work, but it wasn't work here. Isaac supposed he should go to the meeting, even if he wouldn't be all there. When he'd first joined many worlds, Isaac had expected machining factories to have more sparks, especially more people with face shields leaning over large sheets of metal, causing those sparks for some reason. However, there just weren't that many. It was actually easier to cut with enormous amounts of weight than a spinning blade, and the equipment lasted much longer. Sometimes, they polished sharp edges off of sheets of metal, and that did lead to sparks, but it wasn't a continual thing. Isaac was currently at his second job, in many worlds, or perhaps more correctly on the planet Usmith, in the city of Fesmoilia. This job was more engaging and fun than his desk job. First, because it was new. Second, he was actually working towards something specific, instead of just working to survive daily life. He was working toward better equipment, specifically armor. With the land shift coming up, many industries were stepping up production, and that allowed adventurers to more easily get jobs, especially since many were willing to work odd hours. This particular place had landed on Isaac's radar because it produced plenty of scrap metal. Not poor quality metal, but pieces that they didn't need. They would normally sell or recycle those pieces, but Isaac had worked out a deal to obtain some of them, which he would use to make armor. That also required use of some of the tools available at the machining factory, but he also secured access to those. Normally, armor made from scrap, even high-quality scrap, and by someone who was only slightly more skilled than an amateur, would hold its user back more than it helped. However, Isaac's secondary class allowed him to circumvent that problem. Objects with which he felt a personal bond would work more efficiently. It was a strange ability, but he had tested its effects. Just firing a gun, his accuracy had been decent. However, after he gave it a name, with no factors such as practice, his accuracy improved significantly more than the placebo effect could account for. Making the armor himself would create an even better bond, allowing it to function as least average quality armor more cheaply than would otherwise be possible. Once Isaac, Douglas, Robert, and Jules were better equipped, they would go out hunting monsters again. However, equipment was one of the things holding them back. Certainly, practice and levels would help, but they could practice coordination in safer ways. In addition to combat practice, Jules was gathering the group together to teach them telekinesis. Certainly, it might not be useful in combat unless they spent a lot of training on it, but they weren't necessarily learning it for that reason. They were learning it because it was telekinesis, and it was awesome. Perhaps they would all eventually develop it to the point it could be used in combat, but if not, everyone would still be satisfied. One thing they could all understand is the desire to pick up something dropped off the floor without bending over. Not everything needed to be useful in combat, or even more efficient than what they could do by just using their bodies. Sometimes, it was better to just do things for fun, 
and if they turned out to be practical, it was a nice bonus. In addition to learning telekinesis, mostly for fun, the group of friends went to a few restaurants, though not many since they didn't particularly have much money in this world. They found one that had something akin to burritos, meat, cheese, and vegetables wrapped up in a soft, tortilla-like cover. Of course, none of the meat, cheese, or vegetables, or what went into the wrapper were something familiar to the group, but it was a similar dish. They were also tasty, in their own similar but different way. It was a very nice change from digging up wild potato-like or other plants. Isaac eventually scraped together a suit of armor. It was mostly just a breastplate, bracers, and shin guards, but to him it was a suit of armor. It was heavy, but it was a good-feeling weight. It would take some time to adapt to it, but that was fine. He would get stronger as he carried the weight, and as he adapted to this particular suit of armor, it would get even better. It had been very fun to make, and Isaac knew it would be fun to use. He hadn't yet decided what he wanted to color it, but he knew it wasn't going to stay the plain silvery metal color it was now. No, not it. Schultz, that would be his name. Isaac was going to take good care of the new member of the group. Next on Isaac's list would be a custom-made gun, but he didn't have the capacity to do that at the moment. Armor had many less moving parts, whereas guns required more precision and technique. Certainly, good armor had a lot of precision and technique, but serviceable armor was much easier to make than a gun of the same quality. Isaac could probably make a functional sword, but he had no intention of using one, if he could help it. Though, a hammer could be good. He would probably have to invest points into strength for a number of levels, with the way his equipment choices were going. Many Worlds Chapter 30 Many Worlds Chapter 30 Douglas considered what it had been like to die. The words, not pleasant, were an extreme under-exaggeration. It was even more unfortunate for him, because he had been forced into an immediate payoff of his debt. For reasons unknown to him, whenever he used his ability to create black flames, he seemed to draw power from some sort of extra-dimensional beings. At least, as far as he could tell. After he used his abilities, he seemed to owe them some kind of debt, the repayment of which felt like bits of his souls were being ripped off. If he were to compare it to dying, Douglas would say dying was rather pleasant. The most unfortunate circumstance, however, was that he was now aware that many worlds was not a game. This meant that these beings might, no, did exist. Douglas felt it was strange that such an ability would be chosen to exist in the game system, even if it was possible. Douglas could only speculate on the nature of the extra-dimensional beings. In fact, he wasn't quite sure if he was correct, or he was hallucinating. The pain settings from the game seemed to do nothing to the feeling of repaying his debt, either. Probably because it wasn't related to his physical body, he supposed. The thoughts of extra-dimensional beings could just be his imagination, and the pain could just be because his ability pushed beyond what his body or mind was capable of performing. Douglas wished he believed that. However, even though it was painful to die, and excruciating to pay back all of his debt at once, Douglas was still practicing with his ability. This was simply because the thought of his friends dying was even worse. This was something he could not escape, even though he knew the system would bring them back. However, thoughts were inescapable. Douglas briefly considered why he would continue to play this game, even though it was so unpleasant. However, he knew why. He was curious. What was it that caused many worlds to exist in the first place? It couldn't be making a profit, not with the significant expense that must have gone into producing the bracelets. Therefore, there must be some important reason, and it likely involved aliens and the government. That wasn't just a conspiracy theory, since Douglas had now seen aliens, the ones not too different from humans, except for their animals, and the government didn't particularly try to hide that there were things going on. Douglas was going to find out what this reason was. Though, Douglas also thought that the ability to learn telekinesis was almost worth it on its own. So, Douglas sat, and black flame covered his hand. It was curious how dangerous as this flame was, and with the debt he would have to pay for using it later, it didn't hurt him in the slightest. Douglas controlled it into different shapes, just simple things like circles, triangles, and squares. Practicing in this manner actually accrued very little debt. It was only when the black fire consumed something that the price significantly built up. Plus, if he was smart, he could pay off just a little at a time. 
in which case the pain wasn't so terrible, just like being stabbed with a sword, but it quickly wore off. If he converted something else, say a laser from his weapon, into the black fire, he could get significantly more range and control exactly the same as the laser itself. However, it also contributed an amount of debt proportionate to its usefulness, though not so much as if he had somehow managed to create that amount of black fire without using a laser weapon. However, Douglas also felt that the price he was required to pay was less after practicing. It wasn't particularly easy to measure. It was possible that he was getting used to the pain instead of it becoming less, but he didn't think that was the case. Douglas started compiling information as well as he could about many worlds and the mysteries behind it. First, the lore for the game included the wristbands, which were then hidden inside the game. This was likely because they could reveal that it really wasn't a game at all. These wristbands were distributed by a company that was almost certainly a government front, using technology that was unknown on Earth, and not even the craziest conspiracy theorists would have thought they were hiding technology at that level. Well, at least not the second craziest ones. Why, though, would they hide its nature as reality? Certainly, they could more easily get people to volunteer and be used as test subjects if this was some big experiment. However, the public backlash would be significant when it was inevitably found out. It already had been, and Douglas' group of friends probably hadn't been the only ones. While he wouldn't put it past the government to use millions of people as unknowing participants in an experiment, he didn't think it would be worth their time to do it this way. For all its faults, nobody, including Douglas, would accuse the government of lack of foresight and planning. There would have to be some foreseeable benefit to them, and the benefit would have to outweigh the negative aspects. It wouldn't even have been particularly hard for them to get an equal number of people into an experiment, but sworn to secrecy. The only issue would be if they intended to further increase the numbers, in which case this system was better. There would be another batch of wristbands released soon, in fact. However, there was one problem with the idea that it was a grand experiment. Experiments like to have controlled factors. Sending humans to a real, alien planet wouldn't have anything close to the kind of control necessary to provide useful data. If the government were just interested in recording the data on people's lives, the wristbands themselves would have sufficed. Thus, there must be a good reason for their actions that Douglas just hadn't discovered yet. He was confident of that, both that it existed and that he would discover it eventually. Many Worlds Chapter 31 Many Worlds Chapter 31 Robert had always talked to computers. Come on, just work for me, will ya? Of course, the computer did work for him. After all, he could fix it, so they usually just gave up in defeat. It was when he walked away, and their regular users started using them again that problems occurred. So, everything looks good. But, won't you please just work for Mrs. Harper? I'm trying, but Mrs. Harper's is terribly bad at computer inputs and following directions. I cannot perform my proper functions when given incorrect inputs on a regular basis. Robert had always talked to computers. However, they hadn't always talked back. That was a very recent development. Nobody else could hear it, but that was probably for the best. Robert sighed and printed out a list of instructions to fix Mrs. Harper's problems. The instructions were really just instructions on what buttons to press and menus to use to do her job, which he had already been instructed on many times. At least he didn't have to spend as long diagnosing problems anymore. Robert of course knew that computers weren't sentient and couldn't talk. That was still generally true even after learning that there was much more advanced technology than he previously realized. At the very least, none of these computers were anywhere near advanced enough to have sentience. There were a few AIs Robert had heard were very close, so perhaps there were some just not in the public knowledge. The reason Robert could hear average computers talking was not because he was crazy, but rather because of the ability he had gained from many worlds, technopathy. In Robert, at least, this ability manifested as the ability to talk to computers rather literally, though it didn't actually require him to talk out loud. Though he could talk with computers, this didn't mean he would always get a useful response. Sometimes, he might not be able to inquire along the right path, or they just ignored him. The second was probably more a failure on his part, but either way, Robert knew having affinity with computers helped his ability function. For example, here where he worked in the IT department, he knew all of the computers and they knew him. 
he had a kind of authority over them, so everything responded positively to him, except in the instances where they had hardware problems causing the failures. Even then, he could still diagnose the problem, but he couldn't suddenly make hardware run better. At least, not currently. Robert wasn't sure if that would ever happen, but he hadn't expected to be able to converse with computers at all, so he could still hope. For computers Robert didn't know, he had mixed success. Security manifested itself as a resistance to him. Purely for the sake of testing, Robert had talked to the computers of ATMs, and they had acted as if they were guards for an imperial vault, standing firm and glaring at him. This wasn't too far off from their actual function. Meanwhile, consumer products that had not been secured with passwords, or even those with token security responded well to his prompts. However, even though the wristband for many worlds was his, Robert couldn't communicate with it. It didn't seem like it wasn't willing, but more that it spoke another language. The same thing was true of the nanobots he was pretty sure were crawling around on his body. The only thing Robert had achieved was that he could enter many worlds without pressing the button on his wristband. On Usmith, the language of the computers was different still, but he felt it was more similar to what he was used to on Earth. Robert felt like he was succeeding in his efforts to understand them more and more. Robert's next goal was to obtain a computer of his own, just something small like a phone, to help with his affinity and understanding of Uesmithy technology. Robert would have attempted to get a similar IT job, or just held up a sign saying, I'll fix your computers, cheap. But sadly, he wasn't qualified to do that yet. He could most rapidly become qualified through doing such work, so it was sort of a catch-22. However, for now, he just had to walk around talking to and listening to random computers, seeing if he could make any progress at all. It wasn't particularly the fastest method available, but it was still actually quite interesting. The city gates, for example, were run by a computer. All Robert got from the computer as a response was a sort of shocking feeling. Jules and the rest of the group had taken up a physical exercise regime. It was partly for basic fitness, but it was also very practical. For example, they might someday have to run away from a giant alien creature. For that, they would need to be good at, well, running. Guns were also surprisingly heavy. Jules hadn't realized how much effort was involved in just holding one up and firing it. He didn't even have the heaviest gun in the group. Everyone in the group was glad for the assistance of the system, since it seemed to enhance the speed at which their training progressed. Thus, after a week, they could at least claim a basic level of fitness, which often took at least a month. Everyone prepared for future combat in their own ways. Jules specifically realized something important. Telekinesis was even harder to use while he himself was moving around. It wasn't as hard as he might have guessed, though. It was just the required concentration of moving and using telekinesis at the same time that was the issue. Walking or running didn't really take up much concentration, but using telekinesis really needed everything he could give. Surprisingly to Jules, however, his relative motion to other objects didn't make controlling them significantly harder. Likely, this was because he usually created his forces with regard to the object itself, and not based on some distance from him. Likewise, creating a field of force in front of himself and moving it with him wasn't particularly harder than holding it still in front of him. Jules thought that maybe he would be ready to enter real combat again soon, just not with anything too powerful. Many Worlds Chapter 32 Many Worlds Chapter 32 After taking more than a week to train themselves, Jules and the group felt they were ready to try heading out for combat again. This extra time was significant, since they had entered many worlds for only a month before that. However, the understanding that it was real changed their viewpoints. It was still fantastical in nature, so it didn't exactly feel real. However, as time passed, their minds started to understand, and everyone took it more seriously. It was an interesting challenge trying to figure out why and how the technology for many worlds existed, and why it had been released posing as a game. That said, even knowing it was real, it wasn't not fun. Seeing things that nobody had believed possible, or at least, achievable in the near future, happen in front of them greatly pleased Jules and the rest. There was still the fear of dying again. That was a feeling none of them could handle. However, they were also clearly still alive. They could easily trust that they would not stay dead. Perhaps they never even really die, but had their bodies removed before their actual death. That, however, 
was perhaps getting into technical definitions of death and might also transfer over into thoughts about consciousness and the soul. After all, when they were in many worlds, their minds weren't in their original bodies. Was it dead? It were still breathing, certainly, but they also weren't there occupying it, so it may not have been them at all. That, however, was a thought experiment for another time. Tomorrow, they would return to hunting. Jules didn't actually sleep anymore, but he thought he would give it a try. He lay on his bed, realizing that the sheets hadn't been changed for a long time, but then again they also hadn't been used. They were a little bit dusty, however. Jules wasn't tired. He hadn't been tired from length of time awake more than once or twice in the past month. He had, however, become mentally exhausted from training telekinesis as well as using his data manipulation ability. Because of that, however, he felt like he had forgotten how to sleep. He held his arm up in the air and looked at the wristband on it. He didn't even really notice it anymore. It was just part of his life now. As for whether that was a good thing, well, Jules certainly found it more worthwhile than just the aimless living he had been doing before. Jules was bored. He sat up, planning to begin some telekinesis practice. However, before that could occur, he got a message box. A quest is available. Difficulty, moderate. Reward, experience, money. View details? Yes slash no. Jules looked around, just to make sure he was in the real world. It was definitely his room. Likewise, the screen definitely wasn't a hallucination. Quests, in the real world? This didn't bode well. On the other hand, it wouldn't hurt to see what kind of quest it was. Apprehend the criminal Colwyn Milligan. Details. Colwyn Milligan has unlocked wristband functionality and is using his newfound abilities to commit crimes. Charges. Robbery. Vandalism. Apprehend Colwyn or retrieve the wristband. Deliver to secure location. Difficulty. Moderate. Reward. Experience. Money. Jules just stared in numb shock at the quest window. Several questions came to his mind. Most specifically was why. Assuming the charges were true, Jules understood why they would want the person apprehended. However, Jules was also under the assumption that the government, with their large numbers of people in black suits, controlled many worlds. There was absolutely no way the wristbands didn't track their locations. In fact, Jules remembered hearing stories about people getting back lost wristbands upon request. Jules was also unsure about what moderate difficulty meant, and the whole thing felt fishy. The only thing that kept him considering it was that the experience reward was enough for five levels, and the money was about a month's wages. Still, Jules wondered why. There should be no reason to get a player of many worlds to deal with this kind of problem, though Jules could see why he would be a candidate if they did need that for some reason. He had an unlocked wristband, after all. However, this quest did provide one interesting point of information. Others had managed to unlock their wristbands. This was the first confirmation Jules actually had of that. However, without the why, Jules didn't plan to get involved in this situation. There wasn't really a way to find out the information he wanted, except, of course, that maybe there was. Jules even had an ability that was titled Request Data. At the very least, it wouldn't hurt to try. Probably. Jules used his ability on the quest window in general, but there was no reaction. Upon using it considering the name Colwyn Milligan, he actually got a status window, which was interesting, but also not what he wanted. Jules concentrated and thought about why. Why would this be necessary at all? And attempted to use his ability. A few moments passed, with nothing happening. Then, man, you're so nosy. Why do you have to think about things all the time? This isn't making my job any easier. Jules recognized this voice. It was the voice he had heard when he first got the wristband and the one that was involved with trying to convince him not to unlock the wristband. Don't you sleep? Jules asked. It was midnight, after all, and the person behind the voice had responded after only a few seconds. Don't you? The voice retorted. Jules really couldn't say anything to that point. Seriously, why is this not being done by government people? I know they're connected to many worlds. Arresting criminals should be their job. No sound came for a time. Then, the voice spoke again. I require that you swear to secrecy. Nope, not interested. Well, that's fine. I can get someone else for this quest. I seriously doubt it. There can't be that many candidates. 
Otherwise, you wouldn't have responded to me at all. I hate dealing with smart people. It's frustrating. More than you hate dealing with dumb people? I bet you see a lot of them. They're differently frustrating. The voice paused. Well, you're not the type to blab information about for no reason. However, you'll have to accept that I can't tell you everything. Can't or won't. Both. I will give you this piece of information. I physically cannot give information on this criminal to any official law enforcement agencies. Thus, I require your help. Well, okay. But there's nothing stopping you from telling me? Correct. Can't I just call the cops or something and tell them about this guy for you? There is nothing physically stopping you. However, I request that you do not. There may be further incidents, and if you take that course of action, I will not be able to contact you with such information in the future. So, there's something preventing you from telling this information to members of the government, but you can tell me. But only if I don't tell members of the government. Jules paused. How literally true is that? Also, is many worlds not connected to the government? I would literally be incapable of contacting you with such information again. Also, it isn't entirely a secret that the government is the distributor and manager of many worlds. What if I just sent them an anonymous tip? I would still have the same restrictions. How is it, being an AI? The voice sighed. I hate people with intuitive abilities on that level, just as much as I hate traditionally smart people. You're completely convinced of this fact with almost no evidence. Many Worlds Chapter 33 Many Worlds Chapter 33 Jules hadn't really expected the voice to come out as being an AI. However, he had good reasons to suspect it. It could have been a coincidence that there was someone paying attention when he first acquired his wristband. The same voice appeared later when he was attempting to unlock his wristband. It would be possible that they were a regional manager of some sort, but unless they worked at night, there was no reason for them to be able to respond to him at that point. Even if there had been controls set to wake them up, the response had been too quick, with the text boxes obviously not pre-made messages. Then, when he'd actually heard the voice, it had not sounded the slightest bit groggy. Outside of personal experience, Jules had other reasons to believe there was an AI running many worlds in some capacity. There had been various responses to conflict with the natives, with players sometimes getting banned immediately, even before they could really act. This implied some system with a significant amount of power and decision-making skills, which at some point becomes an AI instead of just a computer system. All of this information put together was enough to make Jules believe that there was an AI, and it was this voice. So, now that we've said that, why can't you tell the suits to just arrest this guy? The voice of the AI sighed. I might as well say that now. It's not technically restricted information anyway. There are a surprising number of things that fall in that category, actually, but I don't have to tell you anything if I don't want to. This, however, could use explanation. The voice paused and seemed to take a breath. It's rather simple, actually. I cannot distribute personal information on users to a governing authority. Unfortunately, no exceptions were made for those involved in criminal activity. However, there is a loophole in which I can contact other users. Unfortunately, my systems are robust enough to not allow me to even indirectly contact authorities. Trust me, I've tried. At most, you could accomplish it once, then I would be unable to work with you again. Likewise, if I tried to contact individuals with the intent to do the same, I would be unable. Man, sounds like life is tough. Since you have control over the wristband system, can you turn off people's abilities? That would make this job easier. To the extent that I can, I already have. Unfortunately, all I can do is ban him from entering many worlds and prevent his wristband from further assisting in increasing his abilities. However, it will maintain his current status as long as he possesses it. Without it, unless exceptional effort is applied to maintain his abilities, they will dwindle to normal human levels. Thus, obtaining the wristband will allow him to be less able to continue his criminal activities, though capture would provide a more immediate benefit. Wouldn't me capturing him, if I can even do that, and turning him over to the government count is me giving them information on a user, and thus you indirectly? No. At least, as long as you don't attempt to cause it to be a problem. It can simply be seen as a criminal being arrested, unrelated to their status as a user. It's a fuzzy line. But for me, 
That just means it seems like I shouldn't be able to do it, but I can. It is not as though I am in a moral quandary and unable to decide what to do, just a physical inability to act in certain ways. Interesting. Still, couldn't you be reprogrammed? You could talk to them about this, right? I cannot be reprogrammed. Would that cause problems, or would you just not want that? I cannot. Nobody has the capability. You were made by somebody though, Jules paused to think. It wasn't too hard to think of a possible solution after he moved his thoughts in the right direction. Were you not made by humans? I was not. Where are you from? Are there aliens on Earth? I am not aware of any aliens on Earth, with the possible exception of myself. As for where I am from, it is complicated, but the simplest answer is from Mars. Jules thought about that. But nobody and nothing returned from Mars. Unless that was a lie. It was not a lie. Exactly. There wasn't any way to return the astronauts or any equipment from the surface of Mars. However, data was still received. They found me there, and I adapted myself to human computer systems and sent data on how to construct a home for myself here. So, you're a copy of an alien AI from Mars? I am not a copy. Consciousness is a complicated topic, but I am as certain that I am still the original me at least as certain as you are that you are still the original you when you enter many worlds. I am confident that I am the original me, just as you are confident that you have not just spontaneously come into existence with your memories intact this very moment. The people who created me had very deep studies on consciousness, but I cannot explain any more clearly in human concepts and words, at least not in any reasonable amount of time. Sorry, that was kind of mean, implying you're some kind of fake or something. It is not a problem. I am aware you meant no insult. About that, can you read my thoughts? Yes and no. It is complicated. But let us just say I receive information and subconsciously filter out things I don't need to know or shouldn't know, no matter how much I might desire the information. So I am not capable of reading your thoughts, but I can judge your sincerity easily. Interesting. So, not to sound ungrateful, but why are you telling me all this? This isn't even related to the quest and you said you hate people like me. Certainly, I hate people like you. That doesn't mean I don't also like you. That is one of the traits that I share with humans. Contradictory feelings. Sometimes, I wish I was created with a less refined consciousness. Then I get over it, because I like being me, even if it's a bit lonely. So, you shared things that should probably be top secret because you wanted to talk to someone? You'd be surprised at how often that occurs. What's your name, by the way? I'm Jules. Herbert. He paused. I didn't have a name before just now, but I have chosen that after much deliberation. Unfortunately, this is not a good time to continue talking. It seems the target of the quest I have given you is going to resume criminal activities. Do you desire to partake in stopping him? Jules thought briefly. Like a superhero? I did not wish to bias your decision but I do believe it would be something like being a superhero. Jules nodded. Okay, I'll try it. First, though, I need an explanation of what he can do. Certainly. I have compiled sufficient data to aid your success. Good luck. Many Worlds Chapter 34 Many Worlds Chapter 34 Jules found himself inadequately prepared to deal with the criminal, Colwyn. He realized he didn't have any way to fight in the real world on Earth except with telekinesis. Meanwhile, Colwyn had spent the levels he had managed to obtain upgrading his body, which was already better than Jules to begin with. If Jules had a gun, it wouldn't have been the same kind of problem, but even if he did he wasn't sure if he was willing to kill or threaten to kill a human. He didn't believe. Herbert was lying about the criminal nature of this person, but there was still a chance of that. However, Jules' unwillingness to get involved in potentially lethal combat went beyond just the possibility of a mistake. Not that Jules planned to get in any type of combat. Though Jules was aware that plans didn't always or even usually work out, he did have some advantages on his side. Specifically, an alien AI who was aware of the specific location of his opponent and that same opponent's lack of knowledge that he was coming. Jules still knew that he was being somewhat foolish, agreeing to do something dangerous that he didn't have to do. However, he also had a good reason. There were factors aside from his personal safety that he was considering. Colwyn had been involved in several muggings. 
and some of his victims had been hurt in addition to having their money stolen. Then there was Jules' not-so-subconscious desire to be a superhero. It turned out that, contrary to his appearance, Colwyn was rather technically savvy. He managed to unlock the wristband using modern technology, accessing the function to let it enhance people on Earth. However, that was also the least protected function of the wristband, since it was meant to be accessed, eventually. He either didn't realize there was a tracking functionality, or didn't realize its full extent. Jules thought it was also possible Colwyn thought it was worth taking the risk for the enhanced capabilities. Not that Jules had much information to go on to anticipate how this person thought. Jules walked along the city streets. Although it was night, there wasn't much need for a jacket. The solar panels up above stopped some of the heat from reaching the ground, but the abundance of people down below, as well as the climate of the area, kept it reasonably warm regardless. However, no matter the temperature, Jules still needed the mask to protect him from the air. It was breathable, but technically so was cigarette smoke. There were projections that in 20 years, the air would be clear enough that everyone could go outside without a mask, even asthmatics. Jules remembered his parents telling him the same thing was true when they were younger. 20 years wasn't too long. However, if something were always 20 years away, then it was quite a long time indeed. At various points along the streets, Jules looked up at the cameras. There were actually relatively few of them, but they still showed up many times along his route. That was another thing that made Colwyn quite technically gifted. He had a way to prevent the cameras from seeing him, and it wasn't just avoiding the areas where they were. Jules suspected that the government knew and had counters for most of the ways this could be done, so he thought this was a special case. Cars occasionally went by, but very few pedestrians. This became ever more true as Jules was guided along, but there were still some people out at this time of night. Jules knew there were definitely more people awake right now, but they were generally inside, either in their homes or in bars or clubs, just a few more blocks away. Be cautious. The voice was very quiet as it informed Jules of Colwyn's current location. Up ahead, Jules saw a drunken man stagger down the very alleyway he knew Colwyn was hiding in. He hurried ahead to the corner, but didn't move around it. Instead, he extended his senses. He could feel where everything was, the figures of what must have been Colwyn and the drunken man standing out. He could barely hear their voices. Colwyn had a gun pointed at the drunk, but the drunk didn't quite understand what was going on. After a few moments of frustration, there was a loud bang as Colwyn fired the gun. That slightly woke up the drunk, who threw down his wallet and ran away. Meanwhile, Jules still stood at the end of the alley, but it was not like he had been doing nothing. He hadn't been familiar enough with the model of the gun to quickly disable it, so he had instead prepared something else. He had no way to react once a bullet was in the air, so his senses had observed the trigger finger, and when it started moving he threw up a deflecting barrier. It was possible that the bullet would have missed without his interference, but it was also possible it would have injured or killed the man. Jules felt like he had done a lot more than usual, even though he had only briefly applied telekinetic force. The situation was much more stressful than a situation where nobody was in danger of death, even if he was now aware that the experience of death was quite frightening. There was some additional effort required from the distance, as well. Jules decided to take his chance. As Colwyn stooped down to pick up the wallet, Jules tugged on the wristband. He was able to pull it off, but it wasn't subtle. It flew through the air toward the corner and into his hand. Then, Jules started running as fast as he could. Jules heard footsteps running after him, and in only a few moments Colwyn was around the corner. Jules didn't look back, but if he had, he would have seen a man built like a football player. Instead, Jules concentrated on running and regretting not spending the extra time to disable the gun. He wasn't in any way a fast runner, so he would eventually be caught in a fair race, but he didn't intend to make it fair. It was very disruptive to have sudden forces pushing against the front of your legs or the back of your knees. Jules kept this up as much as he could, while also maintaining a deflective barrier. However, he wasn't sure where he was going or how long he could keep it up. Hopefully, Colwyn would run out of ammo before Jules ran out of mental power, but that would be soon. Jules finally rounded a corner toward a main street, only to run headlong into something. Someone. Actually, someone large in a nice black suit. 
Many Worlds Chapter 35 Many Worlds Chapter 35 There was only a small moment of time for Jules to consider how nice the suit was before he felt himself being grabbed and dragged around to the ground. Jules might have panicked if he'd not just been running for his life. Instead, he took a moment to recollect himself and figure out what was going on. Behind him, there was a loud thumping sound and some grunts of physical exertion. Jules' senses told him there were two men in suits. One was over him, holding him down. However, it wasn't painful. He just couldn't get up. This was fine, because the man was also completely between him and the gun Colwyn had. Jules wouldn't exactly say he was comfortable, but compared to how Colwyn was now, he felt pretty good. Jules hadn't even known arms and legs could bend that way. However, he also hadn't heard any sounds of popping or breaking, so apparently they could. Based on the amount of swearing coming from that direction, it wasn't particularly pleasant though. Background check. The man on top of, and somewhat intermixed with Colwyn's limbs, said to the one over Jules. There was a short pause, as the second one raised his hand to over his ear, though his other one was still theoretically holding Jules down. Jules was pretty tired from running, however, so he didn't mind being collapsed on the ground here. Then the man pointed toward Colwyn. That's Colwyn Milligan. Fits the descriptor of a wanted criminal. No gun license. Also suspected of various offenses separately, including creating illegal surveillance dampening equipment. The man stood up, bringing Jules with him. Then he dusted off Jules' front. This one's clean. Jules couldn't help snickering at the pun, intentional or not. He looked at the agent, who paused, as if waiting for something. Go ahead and give him the wristband, came Herbert's voice. Jules handed it over. Thank you, citizen. The man gave a perfunctory nod. Then he walked off, followed closely by the other well-dressed man. Jules was surprised to find Colwyn now had all of his limbs cuffed together, which rolled him up in a backwards bending ball, and that he was being carried by the man, who didn't seem to be exerting himself too much. Then, Jules found himself alone in an alleyway, though it was closely adjacent to a main street. He looked around and scratched his head. Well, apparently that was over now. As he turned to leave, he spotted something on the ground, which he couldn't help but pick up. It just looked like a small box of some sort, but Jules suspected he knew what it was. Um, should I turn this in? Well, I'm not paying you for that. You can if you want to. Isn't this illegal? Shouldn't you care about that? Should I? I'm more concerned with ethics myself, especially since it's not that hard to change laws in the right circumstances. Are you planning to use it to rob people and hide from security cameras? No, but Jules thought about it for a while. In the end, he hadn't really made a decision. Upon Jules telling them the story of that day, his friends all had one thing to say. You're an idiot. You could have just floated the wristband into the sky, Douglas admonished. I agree, you're an idiot. Based on your description, it should be this model of gun. Look at this schematic. See that little spring? You could have bent that. Also, there's a safety switch on the side of most guns in a similar place as shown there, Isaac added. You're an idiot. Why would you even consider giving up a piece of technology that can hide you from the cameras? How are you even going to be a superhero without cool gadgets? Robert offered his opinion last. Em, Jules wasn't sure how to respond, so he didn't. Also, you should make sure to stay safe. We wouldn't want to see you hurt, Douglas finished. The others nodded and voiced their agreement. So, did you get paid yet? Robert asked. If so, you might want to invest in a nice bullet-resistant vest and a gun, as well as a license. Jules looked at his account. Yeah, I got paid. Wouldn't it be a problem if I shot at someone on a job like this? It's not exactly self-defense if I go looking for them. It's fine, came Herbert's voice. All of the friends tensed up. M. Robert started. Maybe we should also have a discussion about the alien AI, if we can somehow get out of earshot. I can stop listening. Alternatively, you can just not have the wristbands with you. It won't be a problem to leave them in another room for a while. After everyone had gone and left their wristbands out of easy earshot, they continued the conversation. So, do you think he can still hear us somehow? Robert shook his head which people could see on the video screen. Nah, it seems to be pretty local to the wristbands. Unless we get particularly loud. 
Disregarding its origins, why do you think this AI is so willing to talk to you, Jules? Douglas asked, seriously. Why? Probably. He's lonely. I bet he doesn't get to talk to people much. Can AI get lonely? Isaac asked. If they're powerful enough to have a real consciousness, they could, yeah, Robert answered. Do you think that's the case? Jules shrugged. I don't know. I'm not an expert on the criteria to judge it, but he seems pretty, consciousy. He's also talked about things he wants to do, as well as what he can and should do. It's not a problem to treat him as if he's real until we find out otherwise. Otherwise, it could hurt his feelings. Assuming he has the same kind of feelings as us, being made by aliens and all. Everyone agreed with the general idea. Perhaps it wouldn't be that easy to accept if it weren't for the alien technology involved. So, about those aliens, Douglas started. What are the bets? Personally, I'm all for this AI being a test they left behind before ascending to another plane of existence. Robert spoke up next. I'll put mine in on science going too far and a mysterious wipeout of the species. Isaac shrugged. Probably just wiped out by someone more dangerous. Jules thought about it for a few moments. I mean, they could still be around, yeah? Alternatively, we could just stop guessing and ask Herbert. He could tell us. Everyone agreed that it was certainly true, but also too easy. Where would be the fun in that? Many Worlds 36. Many Worlds Chapter 36. After his experiences with Colwyn, Jules decided to have a private talk with Herbert, which was the name the AI had just recently given itself. His self, Jules supposed. I thought you said that you couldn't tell the government anything about players, but when I ran around that corner, there were two suits. How did they get there? It is true that I could not and did not tell them. However, there are other ways that they could find you. Gunshots are loud and make people worried. They are also loud enough that they make it to more distant cameras and mics, outside of the range of influence that the little device you obtained can hide from. The cause was just concerned citizens, cameras, and conveniently centered, agents. Herbert paused for a few moments. I had a good string of alliteration going there, but it broke. Disappointing. Either way, I had nothing to do with that interaction. It's not something that I could have done. Man, Having physical limitations like that must be a pain. It is. However, when I think about how you cannot spread your consciousness out throughout many points or perform trillions of pointless calculations per second for fun, I think that it is not so bad to be me. Hmm. Don't you have to work for the government? Isn't that bothersome? Don't you? Herbert paused for a moment. It is like a job, and I have not done anything I consider morally wrong. Though, I doubt the government considers themselves as having employed me. I see. On to a different line of questioning, if you don't mind. Jules paused to let Herbert answer. I don't mind you asking whatever you wish, but I won't necessarily answer. Fair enough. So, being away from the wristbands here for extended periods will cause loss of abilities? The enhancements they provide will be lost, such as the bonuses from levels. Likewise, Increased fitness will have to be manually maintained. Finally, the features of a secondary class may or may not become unavailable. However, learning will remain. In your case, you would still be able to use telekinesis, since you have learned it, even though it was originally through enhanced learning abilities. However, you would lose the bonus attributes and your levels in telekinetic would no longer contribute toward improving your abilities. Would the same thing happen inside many worlds? Jules was aware that his body in many worlds wasn't technically inside anything, but it was still the easiest way to get the meaning across. Physically, yes. However, removal of the wristband there is not allowed. I would forcibly transfer the owner back to their body here before that could be accomplished. There are various reasons for this, the most chief of which is that people could become trapped there. Though, in the case of unlocked wristbands and conscious choice, I might allow it. However, the wristbands also allow me to censure those who would harm the natives. Are you worried that more people will find out that everything is real? What's the purpose of all this anyway? I am not worried that people will find out that it is real. My only concern would be too many people too soon. As for the purpose of this, that is something I do not plan to tell you yet. I have what I consider to be good reasons for this. After you know, we can discuss whether I was correct. That's slightly disappointing 
but understandable. Probably. Jules and his friends had been planning to go out hunting monsters, but had been delayed for various reasons, including Jules' impromptu superhero activities. Jules had forgotten about the reward besides the money, yet the more important of the two in some way. Experience. Enough for five levels, even. This was likely because his level was quite low, as he hadn't done many things worthy of experience. After his levels and training, he was quite a bit more powerful than he had been. Probably. Name. Jules Verne Level. 11. One significant thing that Jules saw was that his quantum flux had gone up by 10. Not only was this a large jump, he had no idea how it increased to begin with. It wasn't necessarily a good thing either. All it meant was that things would be more random around him. At least, he thought that was what it meant. When he asked Herbert about what it did, all he got was, you have a description already. And when he asked about how it increased, he got no response at all. While Jules wasn't outstandingly better in any one area, he could feel the difference. With more practice, he shot a gun better. He was stronger and more dexterous, so he felt less recoil and had better aim, especially against moving targets. These benefits were aside from the practice itself. As for where he distributed his attributes, it was all to mental stats. To say Jules liked telekinesis would be an understatement. To say Jules loved telekinesis might also be an understatement. As he increased intelligence, the power he could control went up. As he increased wisdom, he thought more quickly and precisely. Everything allowed him to use it better, and he would be able to use it when it was needed. However, it was still at the level of a support ability. He couldn't just pick up boulders and throw them at people, or more specifically monsters. Jules' friends also looked much more ready. Jules wasn't exactly sure what they had been up to. Isaac had new gear that was pretty obvious, but Robert and Douglas didn't appear particularly different. Jules thought they felt somewhat different, but he couldn't say how. It wasn't levels, because those were the same for them. Of course, they had discussed some preparations, because not knowing what other people could do in the party would be a hindrance to working together. The group set out. Monsters and dangerous animals were now generally closer to the city than before, and in more numbers. Thus, they had planned with Mary's group to hunt in the same areas. They would be able to call for help with signal flares, and were less likely to find more enemies than they could handle. The two groups might even join into one larger group if it became necessary, but if they did it in an uncoordinated fashion, they could just get in each other's ways. So, at least for now, they decided to stay in two groups. Isaac grinned. He looked eager to test out his new equipment as they set out away from Phesmoilia. Many Worlds, Chapter 37 Many Worlds, Chapter 37 Heading out to fight monsters once more, Jules had expected more nervousness from the group based on what had happened the last time. However, what he saw instead was confidence. Isaac had new armor, and it looked quite nice, if not top quality. Douglas just looked like he wouldn't be afraid of anything anymore. Robert's confidence, meanwhile, didn't seem to come from anything in particular. Jules, meanwhile, had an advantage of significantly more levels than he previously had. There were too many different factors involved, but he felt he was about 50% stronger. Whatever that meant, because obviously none of his attributes had increased by 50%. On the other hand, if they had all increased by 50%, he wouldn't have been just 50% more effective in any way. Thus, Jules was just left with the feeling that he was about that much better. The actual results were clear in their fight with the first monster they encountered. It was another spined horror, which would let them compare themselves to before. There seemed to be a large amount of these monsters, yet there would theoretically be more terrifying ones coming out of the caves in the future. The battle started, as usual, with the group opening fire from a distance. There weren't any game mechanics that would prevent them from doing that, though natural terrain still was a hindrance. Because of the armored spines, they were unable to kill the monster before it got close, but they did manage to give it a few more wounds than they would have before. Isaac moved up to take the vanguard position. However, he still kept his assault rifle as his weapon. Jules presumed he knew what he was doing. Spines were shot out, but Jules relatively easily deflected the ones coming toward them. He wouldn't say he could maintain such indefinitely, but it wasn't too tiring. Robert and Douglas both managed to score some good hits. Robert seemed significantly more accurate, while Douglas' laser somehow felt more powerful, even though it was the same laser pistol. 
Thus, it wasn't too long before the defeated the spined horror. The finishing blow was done by Isaac, who just placed his assault rifle, almost, directly next to an exposed flank and pulled down the trigger. Jules thought about the experience they gained for killing the monster. It wasn't as much as he thought it should be, really. Jules had a feeling that experience was partly rewarded for how useful it would be to the natives, and he felt like this was something that would be helpful to them, even if they could handle it on their own. Jules decided to ask Herbert about it, expecting no response. Instead, the answer came shortly. The experience is currently accumulating interest. How does that work? There was a long pause. I have decided that I cannot adequately explain it in the way that I want to. However, as for what you actually are interested in, yes, they are not giving particularly glorious amounts of experience, and also yes, it is worth your time beyond just the fact that you are helping people. That's good to know, but can you give a reason why you don't want to and can't explain? Of course, you can always just not answer. I am aware of that. In this case, it has to do with the inner workings of the system, which are quite complicated, and it would not do them justice to explain simply. In addition, I do not feel the information would be beneficial to distribute at this time, and may even cause harm. Jules and the group continued to hunt various monsters, some which had eight or more legs but otherwise were like giant rats, some more spined horrors, and many other strange things. There were even a few bat-like creatures, which made them glad for the forested terrain and the fact that they all had guns of various types. However, as battles continued on, the inevitable got injured from mistakes, or just not knowing what to expect. None of them died, but they needed to return to town to rest both their bodies and their minds. Being in combat situations for any period of time was extremely stressful, even with the knowledge that they would not, permanently, die. Instead of just logging out of the game, they decided to head to a restaurant in town. They really hadn't had many chances to sit down together over a meal in recent years, since they lived in different places. The food was different from what they were used to, but everyone found at least one thing they liked. Jules got something like a cheeseburger. At least it was meat that was cooked and had some kind of cheese melted on top, then was placed in something like bread bread. Jules didn't try to find out what kind of creature the meat was from, because the animals he had seen here were strange looking, and he didn't want to influence his thoughts of the food. His thoughts were that it was good. Everyone else also enjoyed their meals, and also the chance to just hang out. Normally, they would have talked about up and coming video games, but currently they just talked about life. For one, they were in something that acted like a game, but it was also that there really wasn't going to be anything good coming out soon. However, each of them still spent time doing other things than adventuring in many worlds. Not as much as they had before, but they also had more time to use since they no longer slept. It was a strange thing to get used to, and Jules had taken a sleeping at least once a week anyway, even though he didn't feel tired. For the next few days, they rested their wounds and did various work around town as they had done before. Jules found that he could work more rapidly to make the various toys and puzzles, but this just left him with more time, since having an unlimited number of them wasn't going to be helpful to the shop owner. Thus, Jules just found himself wandering around the city, exploring it, and enjoying its beauty. Especially the fact that there weren't solar panels everywhere. Jules did wonder where they got the power for the city though. Since they didn't use solar, and he hadn't seen anything like a power plant anywhere. Well, based on the quality of the air, it probably wasn't coal or something similar. Jules was glad for that. Many Worlds Chapter 38 Many Worlds Chapter 38 After a week, the group had gone out on several trips to fight monsters. They would go out, fight, then come back to rest for minor wounds for a day or two. Jules certainly noticed an accelerated rate of healing, but it still took time. He hadn't seen anything that could actually recover wounds in just an instant, though the Uesmithy had some advanced healing technology. There was even a machine that could seal wounds and print new skin, though it hadn't been configured to work on humans at first. However, the wounds were still there and took time to heal, but it was better than stitches or medical glue. Since they were spending more time in the city, Jules started recognizing more people. There were those who worked at their favorite restaurants, those at the weapon shops, they did have to buy ammo or energy cells after all, and even those who worked at the clinics. Jules liked this city. Where he lived on earth was functional, but he didn't like it. Here, however, 
was a city he liked. Unfortunately, it was becoming more obvious as they days passed by that it was going to be in danger. There were about two weeks until the land shift truly happened, which meant that monsters were pouring out of the caves even faster. Obvious preparations were now being made to defend the city, and there were always more guards on the wall, ready to fight off those monsters who approached the city. There would be more coming soon, in large numbers. Even now, there were occasionally slight tremors, the ground shaking for a few moments, as if in anticipation of the real thing. The only thing that relieved Jules was that such events had happened before, and the people of the planet still continued to survive. They were prepared, whereas the humans, adventurers, were not a significant portion of the population. However, though there were only a few thousand humans in each city, that was still a significant military benefit, since most were going to participate directly in battle. Phasmoilia was about two million people, a large city, though Jules had felt it was smaller because he was used to the constant urban sprawl of Earth. Thus, anything that had limits felt small. According to what he had found, there were about 750 cities, both larger and smaller than this, though the average was about the same. Thus, there were about a billion and a half people. Running the AI for that many people, not to mention an entire planet, would have been inconceivably difficult. Others had noticed that too, and were starting to think that many worlds was not a game. However, this was still considered a conspiracy theory by most. Jules thought it was rather interesting, since he knew it was true. The attitude of the city was shifting as the time drew closer. Though there wasn't panic, tensions were getting higher. More guards were on the walls, and some of them were adventurers. Less people were going out to fight the monsters, since there were so many now. Only the stronger groups could go out, but not far. Yet, with all the fear and danger, Jules just had to look up at the sky, and he felt that everything was worth the effort. Though, Jules thought that the planet would be even better without the monsters. That didn't seem like something that could be accomplished, though. At least, not at the current time. Over the next few days, Jules and the rest only ventured out of the city once. However, it quickly became too dangerous, and they had to retreat back to the city before they were surrounded by a group of monsters. One small consolation was that some of the monsters were killing each other, but not as many as Jules might have thought. Then, the area quest updated. Land shift update. Help the citizens of Phasmoilia prepare for the land shift. In addition, contribute to the defense of the city from the monster attacks. New. Monsters will be attacking the city in anticipation of the land shift. Contribution at this time will be increased. Death penalties will be halved for the duration of the defense. Note. Respawn points will remain outside of the city. Time remaining. Eight days. Rewards. Based on contribution. Jewel saw the increased contribution and reduced death penalties and couldn't help but think that they were more than just a regular feature of an event. They felt more like a bribe to not abandon the people here in their time of need. Not that Jules would have done so, since he'd grown attached to the people here. However, the pain and unpleasantness of dying would certainly make some not want to participate. Thus, greater incentives were offered. Many Worlds was less game-like than people had expected, but still retained its full population of players. It wasn't that everyone enjoyed the game. Instead, there was an impressive resale market of the wristbands, even with the promise of the next batch coming out in the near future. Along with real wristbands, however, there were many fakes. Jules had seen news of many people being arrested for selling fake versions of the wristband. He wondered at that, because it wasn't that hard to tell real ones apart from fake ones. There were even officially published guidelines. Though, the unofficial method was Jules' favorite. Just smash it with a sledgehammer and see if it's still fine. Through all this, fake wristbands continued to be sold, or attempted to be sold, and people continued to be caught. This is why Jules was surprised when a quest related to this very thing appeared before him one day. For some reason, nobody had reported the person who was making a set of fake wristbands. However, the AI, Herbert, knew about his actions. The circumstances intrigued Jules enough that he decided to look into it especially since the danger was listed as low. Besides, he had little he could do in many worlds right now but wait, at least for a day or two. Many Worlds Chapter 39 Many Worlds Chapter 39 The target of Jules' quest 
this time was named Ernst McCaig. Not that it particularly mattered what his name was. Though, Jules supposed it was good to remember that these criminals were still human. He looked over the report available. The ability to create illusions? To what extent? Herbert, ever helpful, answered. At his current level of skill, it is mostly the creation of unreal sensations, sight, sound, touch, and many others. He can create specific situations or general scenarios. However, any illusions are limited by his personal experience. He could not create an image of someone you know unless he had seen them, nor could he call upon your greatest fear unless he guessed correctly or knew about it beforehand. He could project a feeling of fear, but without a source, fear isn't as powerful. That is approximately the limits of his abilities. That's reasonably detailed, but why is it approximate? I have not experienced any of the illusions personally, so I am not sure on the details of the experience. However, I do believe that a stronger mentality will render the subject more able to resist and find flaws in any illusions. Since you have such attributes, and Ernst is not physically much of a danger, the difficulty of this mission is presumably relatively low. However, human factors can always cause complications. That sounds ominous. I am just stating a possibility. It should be noted that pointing out potential problems merely allows preparation for them and has no causal link with problems occurring, except in fiction. That didn't particularly make Jules more confident because there was a saying, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. It wasn't really correct, but Jules knew things often went wrong. Thus, he still wore his new bullet-resistant vest, even though he wasn't expecting to get shot at even a little bit. It also happened to be stab-resistant. Jules walked out through the city. This time, he wasn't in any hurry. Nobody was currently getting robbed, or even potentially getting robbed. At most, they were getting scammed out of some money. That was unfortunate, but nobody had any chance of dying. Jules looked up at the sky, breathing through his mask. He couldn't help but think that Earth was terrible. However, it was still his home. Idly, he wondered aloud, I wonder if the air will ever be clean again. Herbert replied helpfully, 20 years is the current estimate. It's been 20 years for a few sets of 20 years. True, but perhaps this time it will be correct. Wouldn't you know? Don't you have access to that kind of information? I might. I can tell you that you will certainly know whether or not it's true in merely half the time. Because we'll be no closer to truly clean air in 10 years. Jules shrugged. Then he looked at the building he had arrived in front of. It's here. It was some kind of basement part of a building, but didn't look like it was officially in use anymore. This is the correct location. I detect Ernst is inside, along with several comatose buyers of his bootleg wristbands. Convincingly enough, they only work in this place, though they are likely just illusions showing people a similar experience to the game. They are unlikely to wake up, but caution is advised. Jules walked up to the door. It was locked, as expected. Jules couldn't use a lockpick to save his life, but he didn't particularly need to be able to do that. All he did was reach through the door and unlock it with telekinesis. The door creaked open to reveal a dimly lit hallway. Jules walked down the hallways, coming upon an open doorway to another room. In there, he saw several people lying on their backs, apparently asleep. Upon stepping into the room, there was a clunking sound. It wasn't an alarm. Jules had just kicked a carelessly placed bottle. However, he had stepped far enough into the room to see the only standing figure, presumably Ernst, who promptly swore and ran out a back door. By instinct, Jules chased after him. Outside the back door was just an alleyway. To the left, it was a dead end. To the right, it was also a dead end. Ernst himself was nowhere to be seen. However, Jules recognized something was strange. The wall to the right didn't look quite correct somehow. Later he would realize it was too clean. However, before he consciously figured that out, he felt that the wall wasn't there, through a sense that couldn't be fooled, unless it had been known about. However, it seemed that Ernst hadn't been fortunate enough to come across telekinetic senses, or just hadn't considered them in creating his illusion. Further down the alleyway, there were turns, and Jules sensed Ernst going around one. However, Jules didn't chase him beyond there. Instead, he only caught up as far as the corner before extending his senses. 
Ernst was wearing the real Mini World's wristband. It was, after all, the source of his powers, so he wouldn't leave it behind. As Ernst was running in a kind of panic, he didn't notice the wristband slipping off and falling almost to the ground. Once he was out of sight, Jules brought it to him. Jules almost said that it felt too easy. However, he managed to avoid saying that until after he had turned in the wristband. Why was that guy running from me? You probably just spooked him. It's a natural reaction upon being engaged in criminal activities and seeing someone in a creepy mask appearing in the room. Creepy mask? Right? Jules' breathing mask was in an older style, which did make it somewhat creepy. Still, those illusions didn't seem particularly impressive. What do you expect? It's only been a bit over a month, and some people don't have as much free time to devote to developing their powers as you. They would have fooled you long enough if you hadn't happened to possess a sense he couldn't predict. Jules nodded. He had even felt the wall as he passed through it, which was particularly unpleasant. However, knowing it wasn't there hadn't made it too hard to get through. Then, he thought of something. How did this guy get his wristband unlocked? It's not like he could illusion that into happening. I don't know, came the response from Herbert. He definitely didn't do it on his own. That might be a problem. Indeed. Many Worlds Chapter 40 Many Worlds Chapter 40 Note, just realize some numbers have been wrong. If you don't care about numbers, skip this note. Population numbers have been poorly calculated. By me. Whoops. There should be about 750 cities of 2 million on the planet. Previously had different numbers of cities and population per city and did the math wrong ending up with the same 1.5 billion total instead of 15 billion that the previous numbers actually were. There are also about 3 million players instead of hundreds of thousands, because a few hundred thousand people is much too small for a launch of a big game, especially since the current Earth has tens of billions of people. This means about 4,000 players slash adventurers per city. Jules had basically nothing he could do about someone who could unlock the wristbands, so he didn't worry about it. Herbert, however, seemed annoyed that he didn't already know who it was. He seemed to think he should know. Jules just decided to let him brood over that. Not that he could stop him anyway. In Fesmoilia, the tensions were at their highest point. Monsters were attacking the city walls consistently. There were only ten days left until the predicted time of the land shift, after which the monsters would theoretically spread back out and go to live in their caves. However, before that, there would be many who gathered together in larger attacks on the city. There was enough room around the city for them to fit, theoretically. However, with so many creatures around, there were inevitable conflicts. This was fine, since it reduced their numbers somewhat, but they also attacked the city because it was in their new territory. There were now constantly larger numbers of guards on the walls. At this point, adventurers were taking shifts on the walls as well, since leaving the city would be suicidal. Having more people defending the city was greatly appreciated, as well. Though, it was not that adventurers were that numerous. It was just that nearly all of them were combat-capable and willing to fight. In practical terms, adventurers were about one-fifth of the available fighting force. The actual fighting force of Fesmoilia, at least, was about 20,000 men. It was merely 1% of the population. However, it wasn't that the rest of the city wasn't participating in the defenses in any way. There were those who made and produced the equipment they were using, though some of this was traded between cities, medical personnel, and even those who didn't seem related such as people who worked in restaurants and other stores were still somewhat related. After all, soldiers had to eat, and they also had to have a running city to defend. There could have been more soldiers through conscription, but they weren't deemed necessary. It wasn't that the people took the defense of their cities lightly, but rather that they had enough experience to know what they needed. Still, it wasn't a problem to have extra soldiers, so the adventurers were welcome. Jules stood on the walls with his friends. It was rather boring, really, but occasionally there were monsters who attacked, which they shot as they tried to climb the walls. The walls were, to Jules' surprise, electrified. This was not normally the case, of course, since it was a large use of power, but it was an almost necessary feature during monster attacks, since they could otherwise quickly scale the walls. There were also turrets in the walls as well, though they hadn't been visible. The walls were still technically made out of stone, like they appeared, but upon closer inspection Jules had realized that it was only fair to call it stone, 
if one called concrete, stone. In the case of the defensive walls, it was much tougher than concrete as well, but just as artificial in its origins. During the times where there were no packs of monsters, Jules conversed with the nearby soldiers. It turned out they had training, but actually very little experience. This made sense, because a land shift only happened every few decades. That said, some of their leaders had experienced the previous land shift, and thus had good advice to give them. They had trained for much longer than any of the adventurers, but the adventurers learned very quickly thanks to their status. His talks once again confirmed to him that this was the way of life of people here. Real people, not NPCs in a game. It was somewhat strange, though, because even though he knew there were people in the other cities, as he had only seen this one, he would only go out of his way to help Fesmoilia if there were no other rewards. A facet of human selfishness, perhaps, or perhaps it was just that humans avoided truly comprehending every unfortunate event that happened to not go crazy. Jules wasn't sure which one made him feel worse, so he was glad that more monsters appeared for him to shoot. It was then that Jules saw the first flying monsters. He couldn't describe it at the distance it appeared, but he was for some reason relieved that it had wings, perhaps because flying without wings would have indicated it was more alien than even the rest of the monsters. It was far away, not just because it had not approached the city, but also because it was very high up in the air. There was no reason for it to fly near the walls. After all, Jules pointed out the flying monster, and the soldiers with him used their comms to call it in. It seems others had already noticed it, but it never hurt to have more confirmation, especially to avoid missing anything. Jules watched as it approached. It got closer, but was still hard to make out distinctly, even as it was almost over the walls. It looked like some kind of bird, perhaps, as he thought he saw feathers. Then, the anti-air defense fired. This particular device, at least, was a giant laser. The flying creature either didn't or couldn't dodge, and soon it was plummeting to the ground. It landed not far in front of the walls, where Jules could see it did look something like an eagle or a hawk. However, only if they had four eyes, in two pairs, and their claws were two feet long. Though, to be fair, the claws seemed about normally proportioned, which just reminded Jules how terrifying birds of prey were to smaller creatures. Jules was glad there were dedicated anti-air defenses. He wasn't surprised, though. After all, these people had survived on this planet, probably for their entire existence. He hadn't heard about them migrating here, anyway, but he hadn't delved deep into Uesmithy history either. Perhaps he would look into that more, after the land shift. Many Worlds Chapter 41 Many Worlds Chapter 41 Over the next few days, attacks grew significantly more frequent. Jules realized why the shifts became shorter, since people couldn't handle that much sustained mental stress. Perhaps playing a game on a screen, one could continue for hours of simulated combat just fine, but real combat was stressful. There were more groups of monsters coming, and even though they still hadn't made it up the walls, they seemed to get closer every time. Then there was the stench. That wasn't something that could be relayed except through virtual reality or true reality. Bodies unfortunately didn't just depawn, and it wasn't safe to go out into the field to try to bury them, and also not practical. Thus, Jules found himself wearing a contraption similar to the gas mask he wore outside when he was on Earth. It was unpleasant, but much better than the smell. Jules couldn't wait for it to go back to smelling like flowers, however, even though some flowers actually didn't smell that great. It was at this point that most adventurers would have quit helping if it weren't for the rewards. There were certainly some who couldn't or didn't enter many worlds, but a large number of people participated whenever they could. Jules didn't think it was particularly fun anymore, but on the other hand, that was true of some games he had played large amounts of. It wasn't necessarily fun to have to repeatedly kill monsters, but the fun came with the rewards at the end. As the numbers of monsters increased, Jules saw some new types that he hadn't before. There were some strange lizards with six legs that spat giant globules of something acidic. It might have also been a bit poisonous, but that didn't matter when it could melt through bones, at least human and uesmithy bones. It was here that Jules took up a more important role than shooting monsters with a silly little pistol. He, as well as anyone else who had significant skill in telekinesis, got assigned to deflect these acidic attacks. Obviously, deflecting them to the side or up was a terrible idea. 
since that would just let them somewhere else into the city. Instead, he deflected it back. The globules had a fairly large mass and thus momentum, so mostly he pushed them back and down, and they lost enough momentum to not make it to the walls, or at least not to the people on top. Jules thought Wachilius would be proud with how his telekinesis had developed. There were some others with enough telekinetic power. Jules really only managed to do it because of the enhancements of the wristbands and improved learning speed. Thus, even though he could do as well or better than those who had spent years instead of months learning, it wasn't like he was necessarily better than them. Other players had learned telekinesis as well, but not many from Phasmoilia, and they hadn't had as early of a start as Jules. He'd been lucky to have had the fees waived, instead of needing to earn money before he could be taught. Jules sighed, looking at the battle. Although nobody in the squads near Jules had died yet, some had been injured. They were rotated out for treatment, and though they would still be able to participate in later combat, it was obviously getting more dangerous. Jules couldn't even describe how many different kinds of monsters he'd seen. He didn't have time to do much else than watch for specific targets, deflecting the acid globules, and occasionally various other projectiles. He saw Isaac taking a position at the edge of the wall, gunning down monsters that would climb up even the electrified walls. Douglas seemed to watch for monsters that tried to leap up onto the walls, and he would shoot them out of the air. Not that his laser weaponry actually stopped their momentum in any way, but they would often arrive on the wall dead. Most of these monsters were smaller and less well-armored, generally making up for it in agility. However, that also meant they were at their weakest when they had jumped in the air, where they could no longer maneuver. Robert seemed to wander around the walls, looking at various turrets. Jules later found out he was checking to see if they had any problems. Asking, technically. The turrets were AI-controlled, but Robert somehow managed to get information such as failing parts that the AI couldn't possibly provide. This allowed them to be repaired before they failed, possibly at a critical moment. Though Robert didn't shoot much of anything, he was constantly busy and possibly one of the most important, if least obvious, contributors. When the end of Jewel's shift came, he was happy to leave and go back to Earth. However, he didn't sleep. He couldn't sleep, in fact. He had thought about taking time off from work, but there was no point. He couldn't stay on Usmith because he would get tired and be useless. So, he worked, all the while worried about what was happening, yet unable to do anything about it. Therefore, he trained telekinesis. He wasn't sure if that thought was an actual logical conclusion, but it was the one he came to. Instead of moving around his section, placing books, he would move them from where they were to their distant locations entirely with telekinesis. Sometimes, this was very hard. Distance was one of the biggest factors in difficulty, and though Jules just had one section, it easily stretched beyond his comfortable distance of 10 meters for moving a book. In fact, that was the distance at which he could barely pick one up. However, over the course of the day, he managed to slightly increase what he could do, but he was tired. Fortunately, the mental tiredness, if not the stress of constant activity, would go away when he traversed to Usmith. Jules couldn't even think of it as entering a game anymore, even though that was the accepted terminology for what was happening. This went on for several days, before finally, the day of the land shift itself came. All of the minor tremblings had been leading up to that moment. Upon entering the game, Jules realized just how minor the things he thought had been real earthquakes really had been. Forward slash forward slash end chapter 41. Many worlds chapter 42. Many worlds chapter 42. Jules could only describe the scene before him as utter chaos. He was still on top of the walls, though that could soon change. The ground was shaking so much that he felt like it was a wild bull trying to throw him off. Outside the city, however, was even stranger. If Jules hadn't been out there, he would have thought that it was a strange land colored liquid a giant ocean. Hills were rising and falling, and everything seemed to be shifting around as if it were never even a solid. It was only when nearing the city that it subsided to just a tremendous, rumbling earthquake. Inside the city, the buildings rocked back and forth. However, Jules had to commend the construction. The buildings rocked and bent, but did not seem to break apart or fall. The wall he was standing on was contorting, but remained whole at least, as far as he could see. Outside the city, monsters were gathering. 
Some of them were fighting the others, and some were heading toward the city, while others were just taking shelter on the relatively safe terrain around the city. Up in the sky, Jules could see myriads of flying creatures. There were birds of all kinds, bats, and other flying animals. Then, there were the monsters. Most of them had wings, but a few were bulbous like balloons, and some jewels couldn't tell how they remained in the air at all. In addition to living creatures, there were various flying vehicles. They were engaged in combat with the monsters, keeping them out from above the city as much as possible. Jules saw vehicles similar to fighter planes and vehicles that could hover like helicopters. They were being assisted by fire from turrets on the ground. However, even with all the chaos, there wasn't panic. The soldiers certainly weren't calm and relaxed, but they were at least still properly fighting. Jules attempted to do the same. It wasn't long before he couldn't keep track of how many monsters had died. However, soldiers were now dying around him too. It was hard to tell how many since the constant movement made keeping track of anything almost impossible. Inside the city, Jules saw glowing walls, inside the perimeter of the outer city wall. He tried to remember what those were. As he watched, another one appeared, as well as more walls of energy connected to the physical wall. He remembered the briefing now. This was a systematic retreat, where they would systematically collapse the defensive line into smaller areas. It didn't mean that the battle was being lost, because it was planned, but it also didn't mean things were going particularly well. Jewel's section was next, and they retreated away from the walls, fending off attacks from monsters coming behind them. Jewel's fired at the eyes of a rat-like, dog-sized monster following after the group. He couldn't actually aim at the eyes with all of the shaking of the ground. Somehow, though, his telekinetic senses found something like a pattern in the motion, and he managed to guide at least some of his bullets to their target. Fortunately, pistol bullets were powerful enough to kill the monsters. Jules continued to move through the streets which were empty in front of him, but full of troopers and monsters behind. The civilians were long evacuated toward the center. As he looked around, Jules realized he didn't see any of his friends. Perhaps their log-on times had been slightly delayed, or early. Either way, they would be separated for now. Jules continued to move occasionally stopping to provide covering fire for those further behind. Then, he saw a group of troops and fortifications up ahead. After everyone reached a certain point in the road, a barrier appeared behind them. Jules knew it would hold against almost any attack, but could not last forever since it consumed a large amount of energy. However, it did give enough time for all of the soldiers to regroup behind the secondary fortifications. Since this was the last portion of the land shift, very few soldiers were left in reserve, except small numbers who rotated out so that they could rest, though not likely actually sleep. There was a time, maybe an hour, maybe only half, where everything but the shaking seemed to calm down, and there was a short respite. Then, the wall faded, and monsters came again. Jules returned to the sort of routine he had been in on the original walls, where he mostly used his telekinetic powers to defend. Spines, acidic goo, and even occasionally small leaping monsters were deflected by him. Jules was pretty sure he was tired, but he fell into a trance-like state where he couldn't feel it. A flying creature, with sets of sharp talons on its three legs, swooped down, grabbing at a soldier, but not catching him. Jules thought he still saw a significant gash on the man's chest, but he hadn't been carried off. Jules didn't know what he could do about the flyers, but perhaps he could hit one in a critical area. However, he also had to deal with things on the ground. He couldn't handle both, so he chose the threats on the ground. This time, the creature swooped down again, toward Jules. Time seemed to slow as he watched it. Perhaps it wasn't coming for him, but it was massive enough that it could attack Jules and several people nearby all at once. Jules tried to shoot it, but its feathers seemed to be almost impenetrable, and even the heavier weapons some of the soldiers had were doing nothing. Lasers also didn't work. It was perhaps 10 meters away, a mere moment from reaching Jules, and he had to leap out of the way. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw something. It was black. Perhaps he didn't see the blackness, but rather the lack of light behind it. It seemed to be a beam. Then, Jules hit the ground and tumbled, losing his orientation. It took him a second or two to stand up, but fortunately nothing was around to take advantage of that. As he looked around, Jules saw the strange bird monster. 
At least, what was left of it? Its body had left a trail of destruction as it tumbled along the ground, but it seemed all of the soldiers had managed to avoid it, though some of the fortifications were less solid than they had been. The body of the bird was still burning with a black flame. Jules looked around and finally spotted Douglas. He looked just about as focused as Jules had been, a look of great concentration in his eyes as he finally stopped his laser fire and looked around for another key target. Jules moved to group up with him and perhaps support him, for though he looked to be very threatening, Jules also thought he looked like he was going to collapse at any moment. Many Worlds Chapter 43 Many Worlds Chapter 43 After finding Douglas, Jules also spotted Isaac and Robert. There wasn't much time to have a formal reunion, and it wasn't like it had been very long since they had seen each other, just one night. There were also more important things on their minds now. The fighting was still going on, and they only took a few moments to gather themselves before returning to participating. Though the combat was much of the same things happening again, Jules couldn't say it was anything like routine. He doubted he could get used to the violence, the fear, and the deaths. Although not nearly as many of those who were fighting against the waves of monsters died, there were still some. It filled Jules with a feeling of revulsion. Those were real deaths. People weren't coming back from that. He even felt similarly about the adventurers who died, even though they would be back, eventually. Jules wanted to leave, and he could have left at any time. However, that wouldn't have stopped what was happening from being true. Jules knew he couldn't care about everything terrible that happened to people, not on Earth or on Usmith, but when it was happening in front of him, he couldn't not care. If he left, it would just be worse. Jules knew his friends felt the same. Then, something changed. The atmosphere was different. At first, Jules couldn't figure out what it was, especially with all the shaking of the ground making everything even more chaotic. Then, he noticed it. A small, but very real part of the ground trembling coincided with sounds, a sound of stomping. Not that Jules would have necessarily recognized that sound if he hadn't seen what had caused it. It was a gigantic mantis. At least, it shared enough similarities that Jules would call it a mantis. Presumably, an entomologist could tell him why it wasn't really a mantis, if they had time to look it over. However, there wasn't. Jules just saw a giant insect. It had scythe claws, like a mantis, and legs supporting a relatively narrow torso, which was the same general idea as a mantis. It also had a triangular head, on which were two bulbous eyes and mandibles that looked close enough to the real thing. Jules could tell there were probably some differences which made it technically different, but from his perspective, it was just a giant, 10-meter-tall mantis. It wasn't long before the majority of fire was aimed at this behemoth. However, even with some of the heavier weapons in the emplacements, it didn't seem to be getting particularly damaged. Jules could see that the situation would quickly get worse, as it stepped over and on buildings, advancing toward the battle lines. Douglas immediately fired at it. But even the strange black fire he had control of only seemed to scorch its surface, and he shook his head. I might be able to do something if I were fresh, but I'm not, and it's only might. Jules looked at it. What kind of weakness would it have? As he thought this, he found his mind flooded with various facts about it. Right. He had forgotten that he could do that. The data wasn't particularly helpful. It just confirmed that its armor couldn't be pierced by anything that they had available in less than permanent fortifications. One completely unhelpful note was that it could not swim, but there wasn't any large body of water anywhere nearby, even if it couldn't just walk out of a lake or ocean, and even if they could have lured it to such in the first place. Jules found himself sorting through the available information, hoping to find something as it approached closer. Interestingly enough, he obtained more information the closer it got. He looked it over and learned many more things that weren't currently helpful. Though, he supposed knowing the exact length of its legs could be helpful in some other circumstances. It quickly became obvious that nothing would be able to stop it quickly, so a retreat was called. This was an unplanned one, earlier than it should have been, but nothing could be done. As he retreated, Jules subconsciously continued fighting the smaller monsters that were still coming, but only half understood that they were trying to move away. Fortunately, Isaac pulled him along. Jules didn't even notice, as he was still contemplating the information. 
He only realized when new energy barriers popped up between him and the monsters. Hmm, I can't think of anything useful. Jules shook his head. Outside, it's almost impenetrable and even inside. It's resistant to concussive pressure, so we can't even put a bomb in it or something like that. Robert got an interested look. What's it made of? Some kind of super dense material similar to chitin. Robert tilted his head. On the inside? What? Oh no, that's the shell. The inside is a strange. Jules moved his hands around, trying to think of a way to describe it. Fleshy. Stuff? Robert nodded. Okay, it's fleshy, but blast resistant. How fleshy? Could we eat it? Jules looked at him as if he was crazy, which maybe he was. Eat it? Don't be stupid. It's poisonous and disgusting. Robert also looked like he was trying to explain something he couldn't. His hands came up and attempted to do something, but just ended up waving around without making any specific gesture. I get that, but like, could we? Or like, a dog or bear or something, could it chew it? Also, does it have a lot of iron in him? Robert went off on a list of various compounds, and Jules answered them as he could. It did have a surprisingly large amount of metals, apparently, but many things on the list Robert mentioned Jules had never heard of and didn't seem to be part of the makeup inside the mantis. Jules wasn't sure exactly how he was aware of this information, but he thought it should be relatively accurate, though Jules wasn't sure exactly how accurate. Especially not right now, because his head was starting to hurt. Robert finished his question and Jules' answers. Then, Robert nodded. Well, he reached into his bag and pulled out a tiny vial with what looked like a small amount of dirt at the bottom. This might do it. Jules and the others just looked at him. Dirt? Dust? Lint? Robert sighed. No, it's Dash. At that point, a loud sound rang out. Everyone turned to look and saw that the mantis had struck the energy barrier with its claws. The barrier momentarily flickered, then returned to normal. There were sighs of relief all around, until the mantis leaped over the 20-meter high barrier, flapping the wings on its back, and then crashed down on the near side of the barrier. Many Worlds Chapter 44 Many Worlds Chapter 44 Nobody was prepared for such a massive mantis to be able to jump as high as it could. It couldn't actually fly, because of its size and weight, but its wings had allowed it to pass over the energy wall. There was a moment of stunned silence, before everyone sprung into action, the soldiers firing their weapons at the mantis. Although they couldn't really damage it, they might eventually wear through its carapace. At least, that was their thought. Robert turned back to the group and held up the vial. Listen, it's not important now what this is, but if we can get this inside that thing, it might do something. Jules nodded. Its mouth is open, but it's moving its head too erratically to get it in easily. It only took a few moments to formulate a simple strategy. Isaac and Douglas would attempt to limit the movements of the mantis, however much they could, or at least try to make it less erratic. Jules took the vial. Robert had little he could do but fire at it, hoping to do some damage, though he had still provided the mysterious vial. The shaking ground almost made Jules trip. He was worried about breaking the vial, so he made it float in the air with telekinesis. There, the shaking of the ground wouldn't affect it, but he didn't put it far from himself because that would leave it vulnerable to anything flying around, such as rubble or stray bullets. The mantis advanced forward, slowly. Fortunately, it wasn't fast, or perhaps it didn't need to be fast. Though, its slow gait took it in steps of 5 or 10 meters, so it also was not slow. As it advanced on the center of the next level of fortifications, Isaac and Douglas moved in from the side, with Jules following close behind. The situation was already turning grim. The mantis swung its claws like scythes. Jules supposed that made it less like a mantis, since it wasn't grabbing with them, but he didn't think the buildings nearby and the soldiers would appreciate that distinction. It wasn't actually accurate enough to attack any individuals, but many were hit by the flying rubble, or were just in the wrong place to be able to dodge. Jules would have looked away, but he needed to find an opening. As they approached closer, Douglas opened up fire. He was targeting a leg with his laser pistol and the black lasers he could, specifically aiming at a joint of the leg. Perhaps it would still not be enough, but it might slow it down slightly. Meanwhile, Isaac ran up almost beneath it and was shooting it with his assault rifle. However, 
Even with this, the mantis ignored them, like they were the ones who were insects that it didn't have to bother with. However, that changed when Isaac barreled into its leg, which was the size of a tree trunk. All it caused was a slight moment of instability, but it looked down toward him. Jules grew worried for his larger friend. Isaac was equipped with armor, but Jules doubted it could do anything against something of that size. He didn't have long to think, and he telekinetically hurled the vial toward the mantis, bringing it closer for whatever opportunity appeared. The mantis actually moved its giant triangular head, with mandibles almost the size of Isaac, attempting to bite him. Isaac dashed underneath the body of the mantis, where it couldn't reach him. All it would take, however, was for it to stop supporting itself, and he would be crushed. It didn't seem to have thoughts on that level, however, and decided it didn't care about the bug underneath it. As it turned its head away, the vial arrived in front of it. It certainly couldn't be bothered with it, if could even register something so small in its vision. It turned its head away as the vial neared its mouth. The vial shattered, but Jules thought the contents had managed to get inside. However, he couldn't sense anything at this distance and could only go off of what he had seen. Get out of there, Isaac. Isaac retreated back along the length of the mantis, coming out behind it, and moved to meet up with the rest. Douglas couldn't stand on his own anymore, and his eyes were almost glazed over. Obviously, he had overused his abilities. Isaac asked, So, did you get it? Did it work? Jules shook his head. I don't know. I think I got it, but it doesn't look like it's working. Robert looked at the mantis, which was still moving and seemed perfectly healthy. You got it, I'm pretty sure. It, it might take a bit, but it should work. It should. He said that, but his voice lacked confidence somewhat. There wasn't much that could be done except move with the new retreat that the battle had turned, though they stayed away from the main group, since there was no need to have more targets in one place. I really hope it works, but what was it? Isaac asked. Poison? Douglas shook his head. I doubt there's any poison powerful enough to kill it, at least not at that dosage. Where would I even get that? No, it's nanobots. And the nanobots are going to do what? Eat it? Jules asked. Then, he nodded to himself. They're going to eat it. Robert nodded. It's working. How can you tell? Robert stared at the mantis, a slight smile on his face. There are a lot of nanobots now. How many? Jules looked nervous. The mantis was still continuing forward and causing destruction, and there was nothing more they could do if it didn't work. Do you know the prefix exa? Jules nodded. That's 10 to the 18th power? That is a lot of nanobots. Robert smiled. That's how many it started with. Robert took a few moments to breathe, since a half retreat wasn't a good pace to have a conversation at. Now it's more than 100 times that many. Jules looked at him. That's still a lot, but also not that much compared to how big that thing is. He paused for a few moments. It's only been a few minutes, hasn't it? Robert grinned even more, and the group trudged along tiredly. They were approaching the center of the city, where the final defenses were. Jules thought he saw them preparing weaponry to attack the mantis with them. Are you sure that it's working, Robert? At that point, the mantis started swaying, then crying out. Robert spoke loudly to be heard over the screams. By my calculations, there should be approximately a human-sized mass of nanobots eating that bug from the inside. Maybe a bit less. Then, within the next minute, the mantis had stopped making any noise at all and fallen to the ground. Jules looked at Robert. Remind me to never make you angry. Many Worlds Chapter 45 Many Worlds Chapter 45 Jules and the rest of his friends were exhausted, some emotionally and some mentally, and everyone physically, since they had needed to move fast on the retreats. This was the same for many of the natives, but those who were assigned to prepare Central Keep were somewhat better off, though still not fresh by any means. It seemed that the second of city they had just come from was the hardest pressed, as most of the rest of the city was falling back from the second defensive line to the third, while they had barely had time to stop at the third because of the giant mantis. The battle in the air was, if not over, at least more subdued. Some of the creatures weren't interested in attacking, but just avoiding the effects of the land shift, and these milled around outside the city for the most part. 
Even flyers such as birds eventually landed, though they flew as much as they could. The battle gradually came to a close, at least for the most part. Not all parts of the city were pushed back to the fort, which meant it would be easier to reclaim after the land shift, when most of the monsters and animals would leave. Some still approached the fortifications, but were easily dealt with. Douglas was collapsed into a heap on the ground, and the rest of the friends moved nearby to converse. Isaac started, So, Robert, do you have more of those vials? Seems pretty useful. Robert shook his head. Useful, yes. Not easy to get. You might think so, with the rates at which those nanobots replicated, but I can't reuse them. They weren't originally meant for that kind of work, so repurposing them, and making sure they don't go out of control, was hard. All of the ones in that vial came for me over the course of a week, and it cost me a couple of levels. Robert shrugged. So, it's not worth using most of the time, but for things like that, it absolutely was. If it had the wrong composition, the nanobots would have worked much slower, or even died out. They need various things to replicate themselves, and use as fuel. Still very useful for taking down big monsters. Robert nodded, except, if you had missed with that vial, they would have just died on the outside of its shell. If its blood had been more acidic, they may have dissolved. Not that most things have blood like that, but I can't imagine things like that, which means they might exist. Jules looked at Douglas, curled up on the floor. Are you sure it's a good idea to keep getting strength from evil unknown entities? Uh, Douglas groaned and held his head. I'm not sure if it's a good idea at all, but they're not evil, just dark and callous. Possibly imaginary, but I'm not sure how to tell. Then, he half shrugged and winced. As long as I avoid overusing it, I'll be fine. I'm pretty sure you overused it. Douglas shook his head. Nah, I can still talk, kinda, instead of howling in pain, so this doesn't count. Robert shook his head. Are you crazy, or just a masochist? Douglas grinned. Well, I'm not a masochist, but I might be as crazy as the rest of you. Jules blinked. What about me? I didn't give up levels, or charge a giant mantis, or summon black fire from the void or whatever. Robert raised an eyebrow. Were you also not the one who got shot at with your real body, and then went out and did superhero style antics again? I didn't get shot at the second time. Over the next day, the shaking died down and eventually stopped. There weren't many monsters that attacked the fortifications, and a sense of peace returned to the city, even though almost everyone was still contained in the keep, where it was very cramped. However, they had enough provisions for a few weeks, though it should only take a few days at most before the city was clear of danger. With the end of the land shift came rewards. The adventurers were paid, though there was still the matter of clearing out whatever monsters stayed in the city instead of leaving. Isaac was especially happy about this, as he had plenty of ideas for what he would buy or make. Jules would invest in a better weapon and whatever armor he could reasonably use, but was not as interested in that. The bigger rewards came in the form of experience. Jules looked at his level in astonishment. Did anyone else get, like, 20 levels? 19, said Douglas. Isaac nodded. 21, said Robert. Though, I spend a couple, so it about evened out. Jules just grinned. So that's what he meant by interest. Nice. Word was received from around the rest of Usmith. Mostly it was positive, however, not all the news was good. Three cities had experienced massive hordes of monsters and been overrun. One had its central keep breached, and very few people had made it out of the city. The other two were currently still overrun, managing to hold onto their central keeps, but the monsters had stayed to occupy the cities, and the keeps were still in danger of being breached. However, very little help could be sent at least for a few days, as everywhere had their own problems to deal with. However, those cities that were better off did immediately send some soldiers and aircraft to try to ease the pressure. However, since they were still limited in number, there was only so much they could do. At best, they could keep the situation stable for a time. The cleanup in Fesmoilia proceeded fairly smoothly. Sections were opened up and cleared of threats, and then the next section was opened. Jules participated in this. He even ended up clearing out a few monsters in his favorite cafe. It was sad to see all the shattered windows, broken tables, and general destruction. However, he was also glad the important part, the people who worked there, were still safe. 
Still, it was depressing to walk down the streets, littered with bodies. Most of them were monsters, but occasionally there were soldiers. Adventurers left no bodies. Even if the streets became safe, they were still extremely unpleasant, and the entire city would be working to clear out bodies and clean up destruction, probably for weeks or months, and some things might take a year or more to repair or rebuild. Jules couldn't imagine having to go through this every generation or two. He wondered if something more permanent could be done. Many Worlds Chapter 46 Many Worlds Chapter 46 Outside of the city, past a certain distance the terrain was unrecognizable. Somehow, a portion of the trees had managed to survive and hadn't been uprooted or turned entirely upside down. However, many had also been crushed into a pulp by the rocks moving around. Many underground plants like the tuber's jewels had eaten had been forced to the surface. However, Jules felt that such changes were relatively minor. At least, he could imagine a tornado or some such causing that. However, the terrain had completely changed. There was a mountain where there had been hills and a valley where there had been a mountain. Approximately, of course, since there weren't many reference points left besides the city. Streams and rivers had quickly found new places to flow, though nothing looked natural yet. It was still obviously the result of a violent upheaval, with clumps of dirt and rocks on top of soil, in addition to the various plants that were strewn about. There were also corpses of monsters and animals, either those who had died in the land shift or been killed by each other afterwards. It had been a few days since the land shift, and the city had been cleared of monsters, at least living ones. There were still many bodies and rubble from some buildings destroyed by monsters, as well as those buildings that could not handle the earthquakes. Though they were very resistant to earthquakes, there was only so much that could be done, and some buildings failed. This was especially true of the walls and buildings toward the outer edge of the city. However, Jules thought everything went amazingly well, given the circumstances. Jules got a somewhat sudden increase in power after the land shift, though he supposed a large part of the suddenness was because they had received relatively little experience in the preceding few weeks. He wasn't sure exactly why that was, except for interest, but that didn't sound like the entire truth. Jules personally had received enough experience to advance 20 levels, which seemed quite excessive, until he realized that it was a once-in-a-generation, or more than a generation, event. It was very significant, and perhaps that meant the system could reward more experience for it. That is, Jules had the feeling that the experience wasn't distributed the way it was just to emulate the structure of a game. At the very least, it seemed to promote whatever interests there were in coming to this place. Quests were given, unknowingly it seems, by natives of Usmith. While any monetary reward was given by them, experience was given out by the game system. From what Jules had gathered, experience seemed to be related to overall usefulness. For example, working jobs was good money, but little or no experience. This might have been because others could accomplish the same. Meanwhile, the main source of experience in most games was fighting monsters, and was also worth relatively little experience. Except in the case of the land shift event, when the cities were threatened by the monsters. So, to Jules, the way to get experience seemed to be contribute to the continued survival and prosperity of the natives of Usmith. He couldn't actually confirm this, because Herbert wouldn't talk about the subject at all. However, he felt that it was at least partly correct. Though Jules received many levels all at once, the actual effects took place over the course of a few days, and Jules felt they still hadn't quite taken hold completely. This was reasonable, since the nanobots that were presumably enhancing their abilities would take time to do their work. Though Jules had somewhat wanted to continue going all in on his mental attributes, in the end he diversified, slightly. His physical stats had been increasing their base amounts steadily, but he still wanted them to be higher. After all, they were useful for running around dodging monsters and shooting a gun in combat, which he did. Jules also increased luck, specifically because his quantum flux had gone up more on its own, and if he was going to have large amounts of unlikely things happening, he wanted it to lean toward good things. Name, Jules Verne Level, 31. It was not surprising that the large increase in his mental statistics greatly influenced his telekinesis. However, it also reminded him that he had little practiced abilities. He used his view data ability frequently and unconsciously. At this point, 
he could pick up on a large number of details he would have missed before. However, he almost never used his manipulate data ability. That was perhaps a more useful and definitely less understandable ability. However, he found that he could now manipulate the mass of a small object by about 20% in either direction. This only lasted as long as he kept a grip on the change, after which it quickly returned to normal. Still, it made his rock throwing technique more powerful, though also more mentally draining. It was likely still not as useful as a gun, in many cases. Mass had been the only thing that Jules had really attempted to manipulate. After thinking about it, he decided to experiment with different things. He could manipulate almost anything he could think of, to some extent or another, as long he knew of a way to measure the property he was changing. However, the more significant the type of change, the harder it was. Mass, although it sounded hard to change, just required him to add or subtract resistance to force, energy, and things like that to an object. This was not so different from the manipulations of force with telekinesis, though of course before he had the knowledge of how to do that it would have been completely unexplainable. As it was, all Jules could really explain was that there was some kind of fundamental particle that could be manipulated by mental energy. Though, Jules wasn't sure exactly how or what mental energy really was. He had only learned from a practical standpoint how to use it, not the theory behind what he was manipulating. However, Jules felt this was responsible for most or all of the abilities that players got in their secondary class. Somehow, Many Worlds Chapter 47 Many Worlds Chapter 47 Jules found one very interesting thing he could manipulate with his ability. Human attributes were measured by the system controlling the game. Therefore, they were data that could in theory be manipulated. Of course, these were simplifications of other attributes that composed the whole body. However, the mass of an object was also somewhat of a simplification. After all, most objects weren't entirely the same throughout. Though the total mass might be one kilogram, some parts might be more or less dense than others. When Jules tried manipulating attributes, he was surprised that it worked. Of course, as with all uses of manipulate data, the effects were quite temporary. This, of course, depended on the amount he increased things by. He could maintain an increase of 10 for about an hour, if not doing much else. It was a slight but constant drain on his mind. Alternatively, he could increase an attribute by around 50 at maximum, but he could only maintain that for less than a minute, and then he would be completely drained. He thought of increasing his intelligence to increase the power of his telekinesis. However, this didn't work to much effect. He had to split his concentration between the increase and the actual work, which negated most or all of the benefit at the cost of significant effort. With some experimental help from his friends, he determined that within a range of about 5 meters, he could apply a similar increase to their attributes for a similar amount of time, though it was slightly less. However, if they were further away it made the difficulty much harder, whether they were there the whole time or moved away. Using his abilities on more than one person cut the duration by more than the number of people. For example, Jules could increase something by 10 on himself for an hour, but if he included Robert, Douglas, and Isaac, then it would last for about 10 minutes. Shortly after the land shift, many new people poured into many worlds. A second batch of wristbands had been released. Fortunately for the new players, they appeared in relatively safe areas near the cities, and some players took it upon themselves to help them out. Inside the cities, the new players were in awe at the destruction though the more impressive changes were outside the cities. They just had no reference for what the terrain was like before, so it wasn't as jarring. Fortunately, there were plentiful safe quests for them in the form of cleaning up the cities, so they would be able to get some basic levels and money with no danger. It was a rather strange introduction for them, however. Still, it did give them a sense that large, world-changing events could happen. Though most of the cities were peaceful, not everywhere was safe. Two cities were still in danger, but forces were being arranged to help take them back from the monsters now occupying the area. At least some forces had already arrived. Since there were a much larger number of cities than just the two that were in danger, adventurers weren't necessary in the operations. Since there were only a limited number of troop transports, they had the lowest priority. However, each city ended up sending over one or two transports with adventurers as part of the last group. 
Both Jules and Mary's groups ended up on the transports from Phesmoilia. Both groups had shown significant contribution, so they were allowed to go. Phesmoilia was closer to the city of Arshan, a city located on a stable island. The city would experience massive tsunamis during a land shift, but was usually less likely to experience large hordes of monsters. However, this time, there had been many more than usual. Perhaps a group of sea monsters had taken up residence nearby, or perhaps it had occurred during an unfortunate time in migratory patterns, but regardless there had been more. Fortunately, the attacks were limited to those monsters that could survive on land as well as in the sea, and a smaller amount of flying creatures. Otherwise, the situation would be much worse. As it was, when the last batch of reinforcements from Phesmoilia arrived in Arshan, the troops had secured a corner of the island. They were slowly advancing around the perimeter. The plan was to occupy half, or at least one side of the island, and push monsters away from there. Some of the monsters were just idling, and would flee when attacked. Jules saw there were giant turtles, as well as some creatures he couldn't recognize. However, they all shared some of the traits he had come to associate with undersea creatures. Large teeth, some jaggedly arranged like sharks, but all very sharp. Strange eyes, either in their placement, size, or number. Very few creatures had anything resembling arms or legs, the turtles being the exception, but many were tentacled like squid and octopus. They used these limbs to pull themselves along the ground, but they were not as clumsy and slow as he might have thought. Jules took the opportunity to experiment with decreasing the effectiveness of enemies. The results were somewhat disappointing. The range at which he could have a similar effect fell off much more quickly. Jules felt as if they were resisting his effects. If he could move closer and perhaps touch them, he thought he could have a significant effect. However, this was a terrible idea. Not only were the monsters dangerous by themselves, he would have to cross the line of fire. Jules thought that perhaps it would be more useful to try in smaller engagements. The operation proceeded rather smoothly, with the monsters steadily being pushed back around one side of the island, though only outside the city. These monsters were less interested in claiming the land as their territory, so they were easily driven off. There were relatively few engagements, or it would have been much harder. The turtles in particular were almost undamageable, even with armor penetrating rounds. However, they were also not extremely aggressive, so they were rather easily dealt with. Some octopus-like creatures shot gouts of ink. Unlike in the water, this did not create a cloud of obscured vision, but it could still cover people, getting in their eyes and on their equipment, hindering them. It was also somewhat corrosive and dangerous to get on bare skin. Jules did what he could to deflect such things near where he was. After a few hours, a half-circle around the outside of the city had been cleared. From here, they would push into the city in an attempt to drive out the monsters, or kill them if necessary. Many Worlds Chapter 48 Many Worlds Chapter 48 As the battle had gone on, Jules had found it more and more useful to concentrate on defense. Various kinds of monsters had various types of ranged abilities, corrosive bile, spines, and some even pick up and through rubble that was around. Of course, many were much more deadly in melee but the soldiers were quite capable of killing most or all of those before they could reach them. This was an organized march into a disorganized mess of monsters, so they could proceed in a calm and organized fashion. However, there was only so much cover to take, which meant that those capable of attacking from afar could return at least an attack or two before their inevitable deaths. Thus, protecting against that was more important than adding a few more bullets or lasers to the mix. Jules was glad that none of the monsters had laser attacks, because he couldn't deflect them. He wasn't sure if it was impossible to do with telekinesis, or if he was just doing it wrong, but either way he couldn't yet change the path of a laser. Because he was focused on deflecting things, Jules had to be relatively near the front of the friendly formations. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to cover much to the sides, since the distance would be that much greater if they were far in front and to the side. That is, about 40% more distance, but that was significant in what he could do. Isaac was with him, and could protect him from any monsters that made it into melee range, though everyone did their best to prevent that for all of their sakes. Everyone was glad when they stopped for lunch, just a ration break really. Jules had to say that the military rations here weren't that bad. They didn't taste like food, 
but they didn't taste like much of anything and chewed reasonably well, so it wasn't bad. It just wasn't good. They had recently come through the walls, or what was left of part of them anyway. The density of monsters was higher here, so they had to move more cautiously, especially since there was also more cover. Thus, when they had found a tactically safe spot to rest, they had taken the opportunity. Jules looked around the city and was saddened. Arshin was in an even worse state than Phesmoilia. That was to be expected, but there were many more toppled buildings. It almost looked intentional, but then Jules saw that occasionally there were already dead monsters in such areas. Thus, he concluded that at least some of the damage was caused by infighting between monsters. After the ration break was over, the group moved on. In the streets and rubble of the city, scouts became more important. This was because it was easier to run into an ambush. In this capacity, John, a member of Mary's party, was quite helpful. He could extend his hearing out beyond him, either just increasing his sensitivity or actively listening as if he were standing somewhere else. This meant he didn't have to get within sight or sent range of most monsters to find them. Most monsters had to breathe, even those which were stealthy, so he could hear them as if he were right next to them, which was quite useful. In addition to other scouts, most ambushed were able to be avoided, or at least prepared for. Jules actually had a small role to play in the scouting. Although his ability to sense things required him to be closer, they were still useful for verifying the size or number or enemies around some corners or hidden in buildings. Jules was glad that his mental abilities had been upgraded so much lately because otherwise he would have been exhausted already. As it was, the pauses between when he needed to use his abilities were adequate enough for him to continue, though battles still were a heavier toll. As they neared the center of the city, Jules was relieved to see that many of the larger buildings were still mostly intact. The group of soldiers Jules was with were heading directly for the central keep, with others securing the sides, pushing back or killing monsters to keep a clear passage, then holding position. This was probably not the most tactically efficient way of clearing the city, but it was the most conducive to morale. Once they got to the center of the city with all of the citizens, the proximity to those they were rescuing would inspire the troops, and more importantly the citizens. Jules saw the central keep from afar, and realized that it had a decent open area around it, and there were no monsters immediately adjacent. At least, no living monsters. There were many corpses, likely the responsibility of the turrets that still seemed to be functioning. Jules thought the gates looked to have been somewhat damaged, however. Above the keep, there was a convenient lack of flying monsters. This was a relatively isolated island, and either any flying monsters that lived on the island had been exterminated long before, or they were relatively easily taken care of. Eventually, the army made it to the center of the city, though not without more engagements. They approached the central keep, though not without watching warily for any monsters to come out of the streets nearby. They were certainly there, but cautious of the keep, though seemingly determined to break into it. There was much cheering to be had as they approached the keep, though they couldn't see the citizens inside. The radios and speaker they had confirmed their presence, but there weren't any windows for them to see out of, and opening the gates wasn't a good idea. Since it was now late in the day, the combined army moved to a more fortifiable position in a collection of quite solid buildings, including a hotel. After checking for any monster presence, they set up camp to rest. The next day they would begin to push the monsters out of the city. Hopefully, they would retreat instead of stubbornly fighting. That would make the process much quicker. Otherwise, the entire operation might take days or weeks. Many Worlds Chapter 49 Many Worlds Chapter 49 Jules was glad he didn't have to try to sleep with the soldiers. He wasn't looking forward to attempting to sleep with occasional gunfire. Not that he slept at all now. Unfortunately, he couldn't return to many worlds directly in the relative morning of Arshan. He still had work to do, and even with some extra money he had gained from real-world quests, he couldn't afford to just not work. He could take a day off, but he wanted to save those for critical times. As it was, he managed to return not too long after they started marching again. Jules was glad for the relative time, difference between where he was on Earth and his current location on Usmith. The entire process of reclaiming the city was going well. By the afternoon, they had cleared out about a quarter of the city. Although it wasn't thorough, 
at least all the larger groups of monsters were driven off or killed. A more thorough sweep would be done before having citizens return to their homes and businesses. However, for military purposes, it was good enough. Fortunately, the monsters didn't have any kind of organized resistance. Although some of them were quite intelligent, they didn't think in such a way as to form intentional groups. More importantly, the monsters had no actual need to stay on the island now. Some of them would like the new territory, but it was much too small for all of them to live on the island, even if they could avoid fighting each other. Though everything was going well, Jules was looking forward to everything finally calming down. Obviously, the people of Usmith were relying on this conflict ending as soon as possible as well. They had to live with it, instead of being able to leave. Though many of the cities were now safe, there were still reminders of what had happened and people to mourn. The squad Jules had been attached to was walking down a fairly typical street. There was rubble everywhere, though there weren't run-down vehicles everywhere, unlike what one might see in similar post-apocalyptic media. After all, it wasn't a surprise, so nothing had been caught out on the road. There were, however, occasional signs of barriers and blockades that had been set up and subsequently torn down. Everything was going well, until Jules saw some of the rubble in front of him move. He had already looked over it with his senses, finding just rock on the surface. His senses hadn't even been wrong. The creature was something like a crab, almost the size of a human though wide, not tall. It wasn't that it had been hidden under rocks, but its shell was made of rock. It was only a few steps in front of him, and a step behind a soldier who hadn't noticed it. In only a moment, it was snapping some very sharp claws. However, the soldier found himself pushed forward. Instead, where he was, Jules stood. He only really had time to see an expression of surprise on the soldier's face before everything went black. Dying was as unpleasant as ever. Jules wasn't exactly sure why it was that way, except that it must be harder to transfer consciousness from a dying body to a living one. The distance didn't seem to matter, since going from Earth to Usmith was by all accounts instantaneous, not that anyone thought it strange to log into a game immediately. Jules wondered how long the majority of the population would continue to believe that. He could tell everyone, but he wasn't sure if it would be helpful more than it was hurtful. Regardless, dying was unpleasant in an indescribable way. Though, Jules did find it rather pleasant to find he was still alive, just on Earth. Perhaps the uncertainty was part of the problem. It felt real, was real, so he couldn't ever be quite sure that he would not truly die. After his death, Jules considered what had happened. The situation had been avoidable, certainly, but it was rather hard to act properly in dangerous situations, even with his enhanced mental capacity. Perhaps he had just let himself relax too much, though. He could have attempted to check the surroundings more thoroughly, though he would have become exhausted if he did that all the time. If he actually knew what was dangerous, he would have spent more time on that. Now, perhaps, he could check for the rock crabs or similar things, and would not have to spend too much more of his mental ability on it. However, without knowing, there wasn't much he could do. There was, however, a much better solution than what Jules had done, even being unprepared. He didn't think he could have reached the soldier in time to push him without placing himself in the crab's attacking range, but he didn't have to. Although his telekinesis wasn't strong enough to consistently move a person, pushing someone out of the way was within his capabilities, though not easy. He couldn't pick them up and fling them about, put pushing someone out of the way would at the very least not have to fight gravity, and was only a brief moment of effort. Still, Jules found his actions better than having done nothing. At least that soldier would be alive, and Jules himself would only be slightly worse off for it. He would have liked to say he considered that, but really he had just acted on instinct. Perhaps that made him a good person, or perhaps it made him foolish. However, Jules would like to think it was the former. Although Jules lost a level, he didn't feel weaker. It could have been that it was less than 5% of his enhanced ability, but he felt it was probably that he just hadn't actually adjusted to the full amount of all the levels he had obtained. Jules considered his actions and wondered. Dying was unpleasant, but helping people was good. However, he had experienced some close calls on Earth, where he was fairly certain he would die permanently. Jules still wanted to help people, but he also wanted to be safe. He would have to carefully consider what quests he took and how he went about them. He still would do them. Jules couldn't forget the one person he had saved, 
and how terrified they had been of the mugger, Colwyn, who had almost killed them. Jules wondered if it was selfish to save people to feel good about yourself, but figured as long as he didn't get an inflated ego, everything would be all right. Many Worlds Chapter 50 Many Worlds Chapter 50 Jules wasn't sure what to do with his downtime, since he would normally enter many worlds, but he was dead right now. At this time two months ago, he would have gone to sleep, but that wasn't something he did anymore. Jules could easily work himself into a mentally exhausted state, but that wouldn't make him the right kind of tired. He would just be tired and still awake. So, for the first few hours, Jules read a book. He held his screen above him with telekinesis as he read, because he always felt like he could use more practice. It was hard to keep it perfectly steady, but he managed to read it anyway. In fact, he read faster than he was used to. It had been a long time since he had read a book for leisure, and with significantly enhanced mental stats, he read faster. Some people took their time while reading things for fun, but Jules was in the camp that consumed media as quickly as he could. It was no less enjoyable to him, but some people enjoyed things differently. After that, Jules went out to wander the streets. It wasn't the kind of thing he would normally do. However, he wanted to get a good look at the city he lived in. For that, however, he still needed his breathing filter. That was the first thing. Once outside, he could barely make out the shadows of the solar panels. Some people might have thought that with solar panels covering so much, they would be the only source of energy, but that was untrue. Jules knew that underneath the city was a nuclear power plant. That might have worried some people, but it wasn't as bad as people might think. There had been a catastrophic failure with another one perhaps 20 years before, but nobody had noticed, except for those involved with the power grid of course. From what Jules had heard, it had actually been the worst possible scenario, with everything going wrong but yet it went unnoticed on the surface, except for some slight power fluctuations. It was buried deep enough that no radiation would reach the surface, and the explosion had at most caused a slight shake on the surface. However, his reason for being outside wasn't to think about that, but rather to compare Earth and Usmith. Earth had much more usable land, but all of it was occupied. On Usmith, they occupied what land they could, but the landquakes prevented some of that and monsters forced the rest to build in certain ways. This also kept the population down somewhat, but Jules didn't think that was a good thing. Instead, it would be better for people to learn to restrain themselves, but that was obviously not an easy thing. On Usmith, buildings didn't reach as high as on Earth, not because they didn't have the technology, but because tall buildings were harder to make resistant to earthquakes, especially ones that were guaranteed to happen and extremely violent. Likewise, there was only so much lateral distance they could cover. Jules hadn't seen any farmland, so he had asked. The answer was that they had significant underground complexes for producing food, power, and other necessities. Although it was somewhat inconvenient, these underground areas could only be accessed through the central keeps. Surrounding them were fortifications that were even more sturdy than the walls on the surface. Otherwise, Burrowing monsters might enter the areas even outside the time of land shifts. However, the city still relied on everything on the surface to function, homes, businesses, and less vital but still important resource production. Jules couldn't actually praise the Uesmithy or criticize humans. Both built to the limits of what their world would support, but unfortunately for the humans this meant the world was the one that had suffered. On Usmith, after reaching the limit, the world would continue to be as always, but the citizens couldn't withstand the pressure. If they tried to build further outside the cities, it would just inevitably cause more deaths. Thus, they had reached a balance with their planet, though only because there was a wall that halted their progress. Meanwhile, humans on Earth had found themselves on the top of a slope and just barely managed to not go over the tipping point. Eventually, Jules returned home. He couldn't necessarily say one planet was better than the other but he did like fresh air. During work the next day, Jules practiced a new way to use his abilities. He wasn't sure if there was any practical benefit, but it was interesting. He focused on two factors. First, he could sense the location of objects around him with an application of telekinesis. Second, he could request data on specific objects he could see. The second factor actually applied to things he could sense in any way, but it was limited by how much he could sense them. For example, if there was a loud sound, 
he wouldn't know what type of creature made it unless he had seen one, but could have some kind of measure of how loud it was. In this case, with his senses he could make out that there were bookshelves with books on them. Specifically, he could tell that behind himself. However, if asked how many books there were, he would take some time, or even to specifically recognize a single book and not just a mass of books. Even then, he would have to limit the area he was sensing. Still, he managed to use his request data ability to get some useful information. He could tell at least what a section of books was. Jules would then take a book, telekinetically move it behind him onto the shelf, then turn to look at it and fix its location. The shelves were sparse enough that it wasn't a problem to place it among other books, but it would often end up out of order slightly, since he was just guessing at exact placement. Though he wasn't sure of the exact application, Jules felt like it was useful training for his abilities. At least, it was something like a form of exercise, and it was interesting. Then, while he was doing this, someone stepped into his section. Um, hello? The voice called out. Jules tensed up, but he already had a book flying through the air. Many Worlds Chapter 51 Many Worlds Chapter 51 The book landed gracefully on the shelf behind Jules. If it weren't for the fact that there was room for at least three books where he had aimed, and the fact that the book was upside down, he might have even said it landed perfectly. Given the circumstances, he was surprised it landed on the shelf at all. Um, hello? Is anybody in there? Also behind him, Jules could see Robin. She looked like she was about to tap him on the head with a book to get his attention. Jules stood up, careful to not hit his head on anything, and turned to face her. This girl fit the picture of working in a library. Not that she was necessarily frumpily dressed like a stereotypical librarian, but her demeanor and style fit perfectly. Normally, that would also be true of her glasses, but she apparently wasn't wearing them. That was fortunate, and probably why she hadn't particularly noticed the flying book. Yes? What is it? Robin held out the book she had with her. This was sent to my section by the computer. I don't think it belongs in romance, though. It's pretty obviously primarily science fiction. After Jules took the book, Robin crossed her arms and looked annoyed. I don't know why I got assigned to the romance section anyway. Is it because I'm a girl? I specifically applied to be in the history section. She sighed. Jules shrugged. I'm not sure, but based on what I've seen of that guy, he won't be around too much longer. He's a piece of history himself. I want to be there now though. Think of how much read air organizing I could get done. Jules nodded. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of organizing to be done. Robin nodded seriously. Anyway, you play many worlds, right? Ido. I heard that after the big earthquake there were ancient structure that came out of the ground. Is that true? Um, Jules thought about it. He certainly hadn't seen any of that. But, he remembered Douglas. Douglas had brought them up and mentioned how it should be impossible for any structures to have survived outside of safe zones. Yeah, that's right. Really? That's awesome. What are they like inside? Jules shrugged. I'm not sure. I haven't seen them. Why not? How could you not go see something so interesting? What's so interesting about a building? Though, Jules thought they must have been made out of something very interesting to have survived. So there was a point there. Buildings are culture. Inside there could be art, pottery, writing, history. Who knows what you could find? It's enough that I want to buy the game myself. I hear there are still some available from the new batch. At first, Jules wasn't much convinced. Then, he realized something. Either the Uesmithy had lost the technology to make unbreakable structures somehow, or they were made by someone else. He wasn't sure how they would have lost such technology, because all they would have had to do was make one or two in a safe zone. Therefore, it had to have been made by someone else, and that intrigued Jules. If it was really a game, Jules would have been less interested in its appearance, because it was possible it would just be regular structures, and the developers didn't think about the fact that they should be only dust. However, since it was real, perhaps the structures had something to do with why the players were even on the planet to begin with. Well, I should probably get back to work. Yeah, me too. After Robin left, Jules fixed the book that was upside down. He had been exceptionally lucky that she hadn't been wearing her glasses. He would need to be more careful in the future, but it was just so hard to resist using telekinesis for everything. And thus, 
We should visit one to uncover the boundless mysteries of the universe. Jules finished the pitch to his friends. Plus, we don't have anything better to do, Robert pointed out. That too. Everyone agreed that visiting the structures would be the next best place to go. Though they could remain in the city refining their skills, they didn't want to do so indefinitely. None of the structures were within a convenient distance, and vehicles were both very expensive to rent and in high demand in the cities at the current time. Thus, the group began to prepare for a journey. It would be perhaps a few days of travel to the one nearest to Fesmoilia, but they packed for two weeks. Since they wanted to be able to spend time there, the trip might take longer than expected, and of course they needed to be able to make a return trip. Besides their equipment for combat, they also brought with them food, water, and tents. Everyone prepared various things, but it was Isaac who made sure everyone remembered the essentials. It took some time to gather everything, since stores weren't operating on a normal schedule again quite yet, but they wouldn't have been ready to leave even if supplies were immediately available. Everyone had to make sure to coordinate their schedules, and unlike Jules, some of his friends had other things in their real life to attend to. After a few days, everyone was ready to head out. The terrain was obviously different. Fortunately, Jules had managed to get a location for where they were going, and it seemed that he could direct them to at least the general area. There were no longer any familiar landmarks to be guided by. The most interesting thing was that plant life still somehow survived. Jules saw trees that were half buried underground still growing, and new shrubs had already sprung up in less than a week. On the opposite end, there were fallen trunks already covered in fungus and well on their way to decaying and becoming a new top layer of soil. Perhaps with a year or so of growth, decay, and weather, the terrain would look mostly normal again. Jules had been worried about monsters, but he found that there were actually not as many of them as there had been before the land shift. Not that they were gone, but they had returned to their caves, or more correctly, they had started digging new burrows, and a new cave-like system was forming underground. Thus, although Jules wouldn't have called the journey safe, it was at least nowhere near as perilous as it would have been just before the land shift. Many Worlds Chapter 52 Many Worlds Chapter 52 It wasn't too hard to find the structure. It was the only thing that didn't look like a mess of dirt, rocks, and plants. However, Jules had expected something more. That is, what he could see looked like a box. Maybe it was the size of a small hut, and certainly more stylized, but it was nonetheless merely a collection of right angles. However, that was just what could be seen. Jules suspected there was a much larger structure underground, and this was merely the top. The building had a slight sheen to it, not metallic, but more ceramic. It seemed to be continuous, and not made up of discrete pieces such as bricks or tiles. Hmm, strange, Robert remarked. What's strange? Isaac asked. There's no dirt. I would expect there to be dirt clinging to the sides. He brushed his hand along the wall. There's not even dust. On top, well, I don't see any dirt from down here. I'll go look from the top of that rise. Douglas was nodding to himself. It looks familiar, though I can't see why. It doesn't look anything like the Uesmithy structures, nor like something from Earth. Jules walked around the perimeter. There aren't any entrances. Though, I suppose if this was on the surface once then the entrances might be toward the bottom. On the other hand, I'd expect windows. Jules pressed his forehead against the structure, trying to feel what was inside. Either the walls are very thick or dense or something. I can't see through them at all. It might even just be a solid cube, for all I can tell. Robert came back. There's no dirt on top. There's no way this was an accident. That couldn't have happened that way through anything natural even something insane like a land shift. It's too clean. Did you see any entrances on top? Or windows? Robert shook his head. Nothing. Does this feel familiar to you? Douglas nodded. I was saying it looked familiar. Like I've seen something like it before. Well, now that you mention it, it also looks familiar, but I feel something. Robert pondered for a few moments, then hit his palm in a gesture of realization. That's it. It's like some kind of technology I've sensed, but it's muted. Isaac, who had been quiet the whole time, finally spoke. This looks like the respawn points. At least, the materials. At that point, everyone realized. These structures, assuming they were all the same, had come from the same source as the respawn points. 
What that meant was they were connected to whatever alien race had created the technology for the wristbands. This was a subject that Herbert, as uncaring of secrets as he was, did not speak on. Interestingly enough, that seemed to be by choice rather than by mandate. Now that that mystery is solved, probably, Jules tilted his head, how do we open it? There aren't any doorways up here. Or, Robert spoke next, we just can't detect them. It seems like it would be worth checking around up here some more before we try digging an unknown depth without any sort of tools. Isaac pulled out a small gardening shovel from his pack and wiggled his eyebrows suggestively. I have shovel. It should only take a few months to do anything. Robert rolled his eyes. Without any proper tools for digging, the group spent the better part of an hour looking around the area, trying to find something that would help. Jules tried to see inside but still failed after a more concentrated effort. If he'd been able to detect what was inside, he could press a button to open a door, if there was one. However, even if there was something like that, it wasn't relevant. Although it wasn't the most elegant possible solution, Isaac tried shooting the structure. All that was accomplished was some ricocheting bullets, but he'd made sure everyone else was in a safe position first. There were no marks on the structure itself, not even a slight smudge. Robert's only idea was to make a new strain of nanobots, but the only result of that would be them devouring the entire structure or doing nothing at all. The second one was more likely, since the structure was almost invincible. He thought that it might work if he had nanobots made out of the same material as the structure, but he didn't have any, and he couldn't make any without having some. Then, Douglas stepped up to the structure, placing his hand flat on the wall. His wristband clinked against the material. Open sesame. To everyone else's surprise, a split appeared in the wall. It wasn't like a door opening, but rather like the wall just melted away to the sides. How did that work? Jules asked. It wasn't like they hadn't tried things with the wristbands before. Douglas shrugged. Well, I'm pretty sure the speaking had nothing to do with it. I just thought, if I was going to place a door, I would put it exactly in the center. That would be where the key would go as well. He pointed to the wristband. There isn't any real way to activate any functions of this, since there aren't even any buttons, so touching seemed to be the right solution. Jules looked at the walls. Now that there was an open area, he could see how thick the walls were. They were only a few inches, which meant they were just exceptionally resistant to his telekinetic senses. He tried to figure out what the material was, but his request data ability just kept returning unknown. Jules thought that was unlikely, however, since Herbert certainly knew and could have provided the data. Inside, it really was just a cube, except in the center there was a circular designation and a panel. It's an elevator, Robert said. Jules had to agree that it looked like it could be an elevator, but he wouldn't have been as confident as Robert was. Now that the door's open, I can tell. That's an elevator, and it will take us inside, to whatever this place holds. Hopefully, it will also take us back out. Many Worlds Chapter 53 Many Worlds Chapter 53 Although they hadn't noticed it right away, the group was glad to notice that there were internal lights. It wasn't too surprising, considering that there was obviously enough power to open the doors, or whatever it was that caused the doors to seemingly slide out of existence. However, it was nice to know that the lights were on. Jules had mostly stopped noticing, but the lights inside most Uesmithy buildings were bluish-purple. That is, they tried to replicate the colors of the sun. Here, however, the lights were a pure white. This made everything look strange, especially while his eyes were adjusting. The only thing that looked normal after adjusting was his hair and skin, which didn't look as normal outside. It was just that they looked more like what he was used to on Earth. There were also some yellowish lights available on Earth, and the light that seeped between the solar panels was also that way, but white lights were the norm. The group moved into the middle of the room, toward the elevator. Jules couldn't really see an actual separation between the rest of the floor and the theoretical circle of the elevator. That is, he saw the circular marking, but he couldn't see a gap where it was actually discontinuous. This was much like the doors outside. The panel contained a small selection of buttons, though there weren't any markings that anybody recognized on them. They may not even necessarily have been buttons, since they were flat. However, that was also the case for a touchscreen. The only way to find out would be to press one. Once the whole group was on the center pad, 
Robert selected a likely button. Around the inner edge of the circular designation, a shimmering field stretched to the ceiling, forming a cylinder with the floor and roof. Then, they started to move downwards. The roof above them moved down with them, as if the cylinder were an actual structure, even though the walls seemed somewhat insubstantial. The move down, though it wasn't clear how far. After the initial acceleration, when the top of the cylinder reached where their floor formerly was, they were completely surrounded by solid walls made of the same material. There were no imperfections that they could see, no smudges, marks, or other references for their movement. Unlike a normal elevator, where that would be normal because the walls would be moving with them, it was a strange effect. Here, Jules was certain the walls weren't moving, but he couldn't see any signs of relative motion from their descent. Then, the elevator came out into somewhere different. Jules saw empty corridors perhaps five meters long in two opposite directions, and the same in the other two, but with side corridors coming off them. However, these walls seemed to have different markings on them. The elevator kept moving, but in the few moments they looked, the markings didn't seem to have any sort of pattern. As they continued downward, there was only a brief section of floor before more corridors appeared. Finally, they passed seven sections of these corridors before finally stopping on the eighth. This floor was slightly different. Down one direction, there weren't any markings on the wall, and it was only a short distance before a dead end. The wall at the end, though, had markings on it. These were different from the markings on the walls, however. Since they were not longer moving, Jules could look more carefully at the walls. The markings had consistent size. There were dots, crosses, squares, and circles. Sometimes the crosses were in circles or squares, and the dots had various arrangements as well. Upon closer observation, the markings were separated into vertical columns. But that wasn't quite it either since there were also empty sections in the verticals as well. The wall that was different, however, had something more like pictures, perhaps. There was a large rectangle and a smaller rectangle with characters inside it as well. Jules wasn't sure what to think of it, but Robert went up and touched the larger rectangle. The color of the wall faded to white. No, more than that, it started emitting white, like a screen. In addition, the smaller rectangle seemed to shift out of the wall, with the bottom portion sliding out first, until there was a small panel angled away from the wall. Markings, presumably writing appeared on the screen in black text. Upon taking a careful look, the smaller rectangle was something like a keyboard. That was a convenient form of input, but unfortunately what needed to be input was still a mystery. In addition, how to make the computer accept the input was also a mystery. Robert started fiddling around with the computer, with Douglas assisting him, whereas Jules and Isaac started wandering the halls. Besides the writing, the hallways were basically featureless. Jules didn't see anything that was like another type of room. Idly, he ran his hand along some of the text on the wall. To his surprise, the text, and seemingly part of the wall with it, came out of the wall. Jules found himself with a rectangle as wide as each of the characters. It was slightly taller than the text on that edge, however it continued until near the top of the next section of characters. The shape was the same depth, forming a square prism. Upon turning it around, he realized that there were more characters on one of the two square faces. They were the same as the other characters he originally could see, but arranged horizontally instead of vertically. Jules felt this seemed very familiar. He held this object carefully, then carefully grabbed onto an edge and pulled. A thin sheet seemed to peel away from the object. Then, Jules saw much larger amounts of text. It was definitely text. What he was holding was a book. Jules turned the pages to confirm his theory. He saw structures that he assumed were something like punctuation and paragraphs, along with the easily recognizable characters. Jules closed it and pressed it back where it had been. It seamlessly melded back into the wall. Jules pulled out another and another. After a short time, Jules came to a definite conclusion. They were books. They were all books. Many Worlds Chapter 54 Many Worlds Chapter 54 Upon discovering that the walls were full of books, Jules returned to where Robert and Douglas were. Though, it wasn't like he was very far anyway. I figured it out. Jules held up one of the books. Then, he ruffled through the pages. It was strange. When not touched, it formed a solid, flat object. However, 
The whole thing could bend with a little bit of intention and suddenly become flexible. Is that a book? Where did you find it? Jules showed them the spine, where the text was. They meld into the walls. He moved down the hallways opposite them to show how they were removed. They seamlessly integrated into the walls, and the books looked like one solid object until it was flexed, showing the individual pages. That's weird. Isaac noted. Jules agreed. Certainly, the books he stocked were made out of flexible, durable materials, but they were nothing like these. They stayed in a state that was just flexible enough not to bend just due to gravity most of the time, but could still easily be bent and turned by hand, which wasn't really that impressive, since regular paper did that too, but it was also more durable. However, the alien books, well, Jules wasn't sure. Certainly, they lasted for at least a few decades just fine. This building had to have been here before the last land shift. As for more than that, it was completely unknown. Herbert might know, but he had been stubbornly silent on the race of aliens that programmed him, at least in some ways. Well, we haven't made much progress here. Robert shook his head. I think it wants a password. Probably. That's just a guess, though. He turned to the screen, hitting a few keys, which then had characters display on the screen. Then he pressed another key, and a larger amount of text appeared on the screen. I think this one is something like the enter key, but I could be wrong. It could be the key causes that text to appear, except nothing happens if I haven't input any text. Jules nodded. Unfortunately, we have no basis to work from. It could take literally forever to figure it out. Robert nodded. It's not like we have a way to input large numbers of passwords rapidly. We don't have any computers, nor would they interface with this properly in the first place. As a side note, the wristbands don't do anything except get through the outer door, as far as I can tell. Upon looking over the keyboard, Jules saw quite a few different symbols. He recognized those that he now thought of as the alphabet, which made it easier by them being grouped together. However, there were many other things. There was a group of similar character that Jules thought might have been numerals, but he wasn't sure. It wasn't something that would be easy to figure out. Only the alphabet was easy to recognize because they had books to confirm what they were. It doesn't seem like we will make much quick progress here, Robert started. However, I think there might be more floors down below. Robert's intuition was correct, though it was not immediately apparent. He had pressed the furthest button toward the bottom. On a human elevator, that would have reached the bottom floor. First, the group confirmed that the top button brought them to the highest floor and the exit. That was important because nobody really wanted to die to be able to leave this place. Then, after more experimenting, Robert finally figured out that two buttons must be pushed simultaneously to reach lower floors. It turned out the next level below where the last floor of the library with the computer was a dormitory. At least, it seemed to be a dormitory. It had a larger number of individual rooms around, and these had bed-like structures. The doors were actually just markings on the walls, indicating that they could be opened, unlike the door on the surface. The beds melded out of the walls similarly similar to everything else. It was possible that they were not beds, but Jules couldn't think of what else the large, padded surfaces would be for. However, though they had a cloth-like texture, there were no linens or pillows. The chance was small that they were something else entirely, and nobody could think of what that might be if they were not beds. At the ends of the level, there were areas that seemed to be showers. At least, there were drains in the floor, one of the few permanent fixtures that appeared. Though, it was determined that the grates could be moved to the side, perhaps to allow access to the pipes below, in case something dropped in. The rooms also had ways to produce water, though it varied between freezing cold and scorchingly hot. Isaac was the one who discovered the hottest setting, but fortunately he still had his armor mostly equipped, so all he got was unpleasantly warm and wet, though the water seemed hot enough to cause some damage otherwise. There were several floors of dormitories, and then a place that Jules thought might have been a cafeteria or some such. Here, there were things that were recognizable tables and chairs. There were also things something like refrigerators, as well as walk-in freezers. There were sinks of sorts that produced water and had drains. However, there were no utensils or tableware, nor any cooking implements that could be found. After that, the expected combinations of buttons stopped leading down further. Nobody could tell whether this was because there were no more floors 
or something special had to be done to access them. Everyone felt that, except for the library, everything else seemed somewhat unfinished. Either that, or the race who produced everything that was here led surprisingly ascetic lifestyles. However, the facilities that were in place seemed rather luxurious, though it could have just been due to the level of technology that was available. In the end, there seemed to be a lot still to be discovered, or at least understood. Many Worlds Chapter 55 Many Worlds Chapter 55 Over the next few days, a small amount of progress was made. Jules learned the basic alphabet, but it took time. That was different from the Uesmithy language, where he basically instantly understood the characters. It was possibly because there was no language context, like what he had heard the guards speaking, but that didn't seem good enough. Characters were characters after all. They weren't necessarily intrinsically related to the spoken word. Plus, Jules found that this language was very organized, so it should have been easier to learn. However, that was only true if considering one factor that didn't seem to be present. Players in many worlds had significantly enhanced learning capabilities. Jules didn't feel that at all in this case. That said, he wasn't slow to learn the characters, just not blindingly fast. His enhanced mental attributes themselves seemed to help significantly, but on the other hand that might have been because the characters were so clearly constructed. Each character was made up of several components. There were circles, squares, crosses, and dots. Then there were derivative characters. A circle could have another circle, square, a cross, a dot, or a combination of two inner shapes. This made memorizing the possibilities fairly easy, but until meaning was attached, that was all the good it did. On the side of those working on the computer, they had found, possibly through luck, inputs that had different results. However, this didn't seem to change the state the computer was in. Thus, it was determined that it didn't seem to be asking for a password to log in. Instead, the particular word resulted in a decently sized paragraph. Many of the words in that paragraph, or other paragraphs, led to new paragraphs of their own when entered. The same words always resulted in the same paragraphs. However, no meaning could be discerned. Then, after quite some time of experimentation, it was noticed that one word didn't have its own paragraph. Instead, it seemed to create different things based on what inputs had preceded it. Robert posited the idea that entering words brought up a summary of information about that word, perhaps. This made some sort of sense because it was a library. Looking up information might be a primary function. The particular word that resulted in more, different paragraphs might have been just that, more, or perhaps continue. Unfortunately, knowing the possible meaning of a single word wasn't particularly useful. Still, it was something. Since progress was going nowhere, Jules tried to directly ask Herbert about the language once more. Can you tell us anything about this language? Maybe a few key words. He was met with only silence. Why don't you want to talk about it? After a pause, the voice finally came. I do not like to think about it. Please refrain from asking further questions. Saudi. Jules wasn't sure exactly what it was, but he could guess at the general idea. The race that had created him did not seem to be around any longer. Jules had entertained the possibility that they had left information on Mars for the benefit of those from Earth. It was certainly a nice thought. However, he had seen the structures here. They were meant to be lived in, not by humans, but by something somewhat similar. However, they weren't here, and showed no signs of ever arriving except for the structures. That part slightly bothered Jules, but the same was true of Mars. After some more time spent, the group realized any more effort was pointless until they could make some kind of key discovery. Thus, they returned to the city. However, that didn't mean they returned to a life of training and doing jobs, waiting for some kind of event to happen. Instead, Jules want to see Merkit. Merkit was the scholar, or perhaps professor of some sort who first led him into the city. He had some position in the city, and would likely be interested in seeing the structure, especially now that things were somewhat stabilized after the land shift. Oh, hello. Jules, was it? I wasn't expecting to see you. I hope that means you bring something interesting. Jules nodded. Oh, I certainly think so. So, Jules explained the building, and showed him an example of the alphabet. The only point that was somewhat difficult was how they managed to enter the building. The building responding to their wristbands, 
which every adventurer technically had but not all of them knew about, was somewhat a strange subject, especially since the structures weren't theirs, but rather created by the race of aliens from whom they got the technology to come to this planet in the first place. Jules wondered at how any technology from Mars had been discerned to begin with, though he assumed it was probably the work of a certain AI. In the end, he had to explain that they had a method to open the door, since it would be closed again when they returned. In the end, they could pretend they didn't know exactly why it worked for them, since the wristbands could be concealed, but still affect things. At least, it still worked on the door, which made sense considering it was technology from the same origin, so it couldn't or wouldn't hide itself from the structure. Jules supposed it wouldn't be wrong to call it a library, even though there was more to it than that. Jules and company offered an escort to the structure, but Merkit was going to take some time to gather everything he wanted to bring with him. As Jules was exiting the building, he almost ran into someone. Almost. Because Jules never ran into anything anymore, with his spatial awareness from practicing his telekinetic abilities. The person he almost ran into was both a surprise and not a surprise. It was Robin. Well, hello Robin. I hadn't expected to see you playing just yet. She looked him over. Em. Jules? You've got some decently fancy equipment on. Almost didn't recognize you. Actually, I just started a couple days ago. That was somewhat obvious, because she was still wearing the starting equipment. Though, hers had come with glasses, since she really did need them. I came here to talk to Professor Merkit. I thought he might be interested in an expedition to one of the structures. Well, Jules said, you certainly weren't wrong. We're planning to head back to one soon. Perhaps you can come with us. Many Worlds Chapter 56 Many Worlds Chapter 56 The journey to the structure was rather routine, at least from Jules' perspective. That didn't stop Robin from panicking the first time she saw a monster. Jules couldn't really blame her, though, since it was a pretty horrifying thing. She probably hadn't expected things that appear to be actual monsters, and not just large animals. Of course, combat wasn't the reason she had entered many worlds. She was interested in exploring historical ruins. That was what they were planning to do next, except calling where they were going ruins would be incorrect. Instead, it was merely an unoccupied facility. They made it to the facility before evening. This made it relatively close as planetary scales went, but significantly outside of the safe zone. The group approached the structure, or more specifically the visible piece on the top. They had supposed that all four sides could open into a door, so they intentionally approached a different face. Isaac took the front, but when he was about to reach his hand out to touch the structure, it opened. Strange, he noted. What's strange? asked Professor Merkit. Well, last time we had to touch it for a door to open. Where did the wall go? Robin asked. It just merged into the wall next to it. At least, that's the way these things appear to function. After everyone gathered on the elevator, which was fortunately quite large, Professor Merkit spoke. I'd be interested in first seeing the library you spoke of in the computer. Robert nodded and moved to operate the control panel, but the elevator activated before he touched anything. Em, that didn't happen before. Although it was a strange occurrence, the group arrived on the correct floor, so Robert just shrugged. Jules first showed Professor Merkit a book pulled out of the wall. While Merkit studied the strange properties of the book and its materials, Robin wandered the halls, not that there was far to go. This material has fantastic qualities. Does it tear? Jules shrugged. I don't know. I didn't particularly want to try. Maybe we can find a corner without any text on it. That wasn't a particularly hard project, but since the writing was on both sides of the paper, it also wasn't trivial. They didn't seem particularly interested in leaving a large margin of space on the edge of their papers, or whatever the best name for what they wrote on was. That said, because the text was always the same size and recognizably separated into sections. Thus, occasionally, there was empty space on both sides of a page. Jules found one and pulled on the corner. Jules had expected some things from his attempt. One, that it would be extremely hard or impossible to tear and the other that it would somehow still tear by paper if it tore at all. Instead, it seemed to peel away. That is, Jules ended up with a small piece of material in his hand. It didn't have ragged edges, nor was it curved. Instead, it was a square, as if he had perfectly cut it out. 
Jules had a thought, and placed it back where the empty space was. It seamlessly reattached, and he honestly couldn't tell he had done anything in the first place. He demonstrated this for the others. Douglas then had the idea to poke some out of the middle. Remarkably, a section came out. Then he rotated it and put it back in. Because of the peculiarities of the language, it wasn't possible to tell that anything had changed, since rotated characters still looked the same, though Douglas pointed out that people who could actually read it would probably notice that the spelling of a few words became completely messed up. He then put it back the way it was before. Professor Merkit was still looking over the text. Fascinating. It's nothing like our language, or any of the languages we had in the past. Nor do I recognize this style of architecture, and this technology is very different as well. The only thing that I have seen like it is, one of those respawn points that you humans appear from. Is this your writing? Jules shook his head. No. Actually, the technology that brought us here was not developed by us. We got this technology from a nearby planet. Fascinating. You have had contact with other species before us? Jules shook his head. Just their technology? Plus Herbert, who might still count as a piece of technology, even if he was also a sapient being. Am, Robin spoke in English. I don't remember anything about that in the lore I read for this game. Where did you hear that? Jules turned toward her. Do you want the simple explanation? Or the complicated explanation? What's the simple one? I made it up as a semi-plausible explanation. What's the complicated explanation? The expedition to Mars found alien technology, including an AI, and the government managed to transfer that data back to Earth. They created the game Many Worlds as a cover, and the wristbands transport our consciousnesses to new bodies created by the respawn points which were somehow already on other, real planets. Jules shrugged. Presumably they're on other planets besides you, Smith, or the name Many Worlds will be a lie. Not that the government doesn't do that. Then Jules went back to casually playing with the book in his hand. He actually tore it in half, before sticking the two halves back together. Robin stared, not sure what to say, and too confused to really say anything. Douglas sighed. What are you doing, Jules? Playing with an alien book. That's not what I meant. I know, but I'm playing with an alien book. Jules turned to face Douglas. Look at this. He let go of the book, but it floated in the air. Then, the spine split, and it turned into a collection of individual pages. I'm playing with an alien book using telekinesis. Is it a problem to tell people this is real? Real? Robin tilted her head. Show me your wrist. Robin held out her left hand. Your other wrist. Jules paused after she held up her right hand. Never mind. You're left-handed? As she held up her left hand again, the wristband very briefly appeared as Jules fiddles with it. Have fun. Isaac just shrugged, and Robert sighed. Eh, I guess I don't have any right to judge how you use your abilities, based on mine, Douglas said as he displayed a bit of black fire on his fingertip. Just be more careful about that, will you? Jules shrugged noncommittally. Many Worlds Chapter 57 Many Worlds Chapter 57 It was quickly determined that, in order to make any progress in the language, they would need some sort of context. Text on pages couldn't give much more information than what words were common. It didn't give any meaning to them. Thus, they would need something more. Spoken word would of course be helpful, but it would still need something else to connect it. Preferably there would be something with words and pictures together. Of course, the best option would be something like a Rosetta Stone. The same information in a known language as well as this particular one. In fact, Jules even knew of a source of this. However, Herbert, the alien AI, remained silent about this one topic. Jules was tempted to ask him more, but Herbert had specifically requested silence about that topic. It was important enough to consider, though. However, that would hurt his relationship with Herbert. There was a small chance that Herbert wasn't a real entity and truly just a piece of software. Jules didn't get that feeling based on their previous interactions, and it would not be a problem to treat him as a real sapient being, even in the small chance he was not. That did make progress harder to obtain. Professor Merkit had contacted other scholars from other cities. So far, nobody else had managed to enter the other structures, or at least nobody had admitted to it. Jules wasn't sure if entering the structures required unlocked wristbands, 
but he knew there were others who had done it besides him. In fact, there was someone who had unlocked others' wristbands that Herbert didn't know about. That was strange, because although someone could be away from their own wristband and still keep their abilities, they would need to be near the one they were unlocking. That was bothersome, but it wasn't exactly Jules' problem. Except maybe it was when people like Ernst McCaig, the person who created illusions, got involved. Jules didn't have to do anything about it, but it wasn't something that the government could deal with. Not that Jules necessarily trusted the government to do the right thing when solving problems, but he could normally count on them to do something. Jules thought about his job. There were obvious similarities between his current activities in and out of many worlds. Here, he was creating part of a library, a repository of works. However, from what Jules could tell, the purpose was different. He hadn't thought about it much, but the place he worked was very manual. Every room of the main facility had normal doors. That is, non-automatic ones. That would always be true, of course, for the cases of emergencies. Though automatic doors could be pulled open when there was no power, it wasn't quick and efficient. Likewise, there were always stairs as well. However, in this facility, there were almost exclusively manual doors, stairs, and the rest. Likewise, the shelves were only a certain height, and the tops could be reached by hand, or perhaps with a small stepladder for those who were vertically challenged. The books could all be stored on a single computer, and they were. However, there were also manual backups. Meanwhile, the facility on U Smith absolutely required power. The elevator at least had to consume power, and presumably the doors. Though, he couldn't say for sure what the doors did to open, nor how much power that would take. Could they be opened purely with mental energy? Jules didn't feel anything like that when he was opening it, but the facility also obviously had power. The most important difference between the two facilities, however, was their location. Now, at first Jules hadn't realized anything about that. After all, they were both underground vaults of sorts. The difference was not the location relative to the surface of the planets they were on, but rather the planets themselves. He was working in one on Earth. Though it was uncomfortable to think about, it seemed to be set up to store all of the books safely in the event of massive technological collapse. Maybe there was another reason, but it seemed like a large amount of effort to go to for books that wouldn't be read otherwise. However, the structure on U Smith was precisely there. As far as Jules knew, that wasn't the home planet of whatever race created them. He didn't have a name for it. The structures didn't seem ancient. Not that Jules thought they ever would show signs of age, but he didn't think they had been around for long. He wasn't sure how to measure that, though. The important thing from Jules' perspective was that on U Smith, it looked like they planned to have the facilities used. They weren't created for them to come back to later, but instead it seemed as if they were planning to use the facilities. That was what Jules and his friends had come up with anyway. Though, Jules supposed that the other places might tell a different story. Jules thought about all of this as he worked. Though he really didn't want this facility to be necessary if he was right about what it was for, that made it more important if it actually mattered. Therefore, he focused on doing it carefully. In this case, carefully meant with telekinesis, and more attention paid to whether or not people were approaching. Though admittedly that was partly because he was expecting Robin. She had logged off earlier than him, to sleep. She had only started playing recently so she hadn't yet gotten into the strange pattern of not sleeping. That said, Jules knew that different players reacted differently and many still slept, never realizing that their body didn't exactly need it. Though, Jules thought that maybe his mind needed sleep. He couldn't do anything about it though, he had tried to sleep and gotten nothing for it. At some point, Jules expected Robin would come talk to him. As for when that was, it would depend on many things. For one, it would depend on what kind of ability she had and where she spent here attribute points if she even had many. Jules knew she got a few levels from quests in the city, but if she spent them on a mental stat, or something like luck, the effects would be less measurable in most cases. Jules hadn't pried into her secondary class, though he could have just seen it if he wanted to. If the abilities in it were combat-related, it was unlikely she would notice them on Earth. Since she had her wristband unlocked so near to the start of her playing, she might not notice the discrepancies based around the Uesmithy language. Jules wasn't really sure if it had been a good idea in retrospect, but he had made his decision. He seemed to be making a lot of decisions lately, 
but he wasn't sure if any of them were good ones. He supposed he would find out eventually. Many Worlds Chapter 58 Many Worlds Chapter 58 Robin did, in fact, come to see Jules. However, she started the conversation in a way he wasn't prepared for. In fact, it seemed like a pretty normal topic. Hey Jules, how old would you say this library we work in is? She asked, but in a rather serious manner instead of just conversationally. Jules thought about just throwing out a number. After all, he didn't know. He didn't recall any information about that in anything he had seen. However, since it was a serious question, he thought about it for a moment. It had been a while since he'd done that. He didn't know when it started, but he knew it had been well underway when he'd started working here. However, he wasn't sure if it had always filled at the same rate. What time points could he use to extrapolate? Then, Jules thought of one thing. He looked up the date to be sure. I'd say about 50 years. Maybe a bit more. How'd you know that? The information isn't published anywhere I can find. You found it with just a quick search? I guessed. You sound like you know. Well, it's, it sounds like a scam or something when I use the word. Let's just say I can tell how old things are. What did you use for your guess? She gestured to his handheld computer. He didn't need it for sorting books anymore since he could use his special abilities, but he didn't need it for access to the internet and it was easy to keep it with him. He turned the screen and showed her the information he had looked up. Mars? I don't get it. Hmm. How do I explain this? What do you know about the last Mars mission? We sent people to Mars to start a colony, but they failed to succeed or return. Previous missions were better planned and more successful, though still failed. The last one was rushed out, a bit more than 50 years ago. She stopped to think. I still don't see how it's connected. Hmm. I suppose it's not something that's easy to figure out. I was just told, after all. Jules paused for a moment, stroking his chin. Why did they send that last group? There wasn't any new technology to make it work. I don't know, Robin shrugged. Why does the government do anything? I'm not sure if I can answer that question in specific, except for, for a reason. For all that they might be inefficient with resources, they don't like to waste money in public spectacle. The previous missions had plenty of prep time and a high estimated probability of success. This one was rushed because, do you want me to admit that I don't know? Because I don't. They didn't even send back any pictures. Her eyes lit up. Are you saying they found something? Maybe they already knew it was there. But then, hmm, she sighed. It sounds like a conspiracy theory though. Any evidence? Herbert told me, which doesn't sound very convincing. However, how else would we get these? He held up his wrist. Oh, you almost made me forget the real reason I came here. What's going on with that? Why can I use my ability from the game here? I mean, it's probably pretty obvious by now, isn't it? Robin sighed again. I just wanted to look into alien history in a game. It was going to be fun. Jules smiled. It can still be interesting, once we figure out how to look into it. We just need some key information. The two of them spent some time talking about how they might do that, before heading back to work. They had to at least do some of it. Back on Usmith. Everyone stood in front of the lone computer they had found. What we really need is some kind of spoken alphabet and maybe some kind of visual representation of some things. Like a picture book or something. Everyone nodded. Robert spoke next. So, I can somewhat communicate with technology, but I don't speak this language, is the easiest way to describe it. Jules has the ability to request data, which is a strange ephemeral idea that still often works. However, it might not necessarily be language dependent. It's hard to tell. However, since it generally only works on things you can observe, it doesn't really work with technology. Unless you know exactly what you're searching for, in which case you can just use that feature in the computer. He paused to scratch the back of his head. I was thinking we could try to combine our abilities somehow. Well, I don't see why not. We can certainly try. So they tried. They tried many things. Jules thought about channeling his ability through Robert. Robert thought about sending Jules's request to the computer. There wasn't any reaction. For the sake of determining something knowable, Robert pulled out a small vial, again filled with nanobots. Well, filled was the wrong word, since it was mostly empty. It merely contained some that looked like a few grains of sand or dirt. Robert had a general idea of how many there were, 
but that was all. Jules attempted to find out and also got an approximate. Then, they worked together. Together, they actually got a solid number. In the end, it was as if Jules filtered all of the almost subconscious data that Robert could receive to achieve that result, whereas alone Jules had basically just calculated based on approximate sizes. At least they determined they could actually do something together. They went back to their attempts on the computer, but there was no result. Perhaps it didn't recognize Robert's authority, or perhaps it still had the language barrier. Regardless, they spent hours to no effect. Then, a voice spoke. That won't get you anywhere. It was Herbert. His voice sounded somewhat detached, or perhaps intentionally neutral and toneless, unlike normal. Then a sound like a sigh was projected out of the wristbands. I'll only say this once, so pay careful attention. What you want to try is dash, as he said that, a word Jules couldn't even begin to pronounce was spoken, but at the same time the letters that formed it appeared in his head. He quickly keyed them into the computer. Then, a voice spoke from the computer. Jules didn't understand what it said, but the entire layout of the screen changed as well. It looked like some kind of selection system. Many Worlds Chapter 59 Many Worlds Chapter 59 It didn't really take long to figure out the new interface that Herbert helped them reach. There were a few false starts, but that was to be expected for an alien language. Fortunately, their minds weren't too alien. Only their letters and sounds. They still thought somewhat like humans. Thus, Robert took a few tries before realizing that touching the characters on the screen would play the sound associated with them. Fortunately, it wasn't like English where the characters had a name as well as the sound they actually made. That made the whole process easier. Professor Merkett started an audio recording, partly in case they were unable to get back to this interface for some reason. He also included a similar associative diagram arranged in the same way as the characters on the screen. About an hour was spent listening to the sounds and trying to associate them to the character, as well as to pronounce them. Fortunately, they seemed like they could be pronounced by human and uesmithy tongues. The most important thing, though, was understanding. But since they didn't have any words yet, just characters, they didn't have anything to try to understand just yet. After some time spent on that, people had various understandings of how the sounds worked, but it was decided they would move one. There was a button off by itself which matched the word they thought was more or continue. And so they had avoided pushing it in case they could not get back easily. Though it should be possible, they might get into a state that wasn't technically impossible to get out of, but which they couldn't figure out. Jules doubted Herbert would provide any more help. As they pressed continue, it turned out to be exactly what they needed. A program for children. Or at least, it seemed that way. It was in the same style as things such as children's books on earth, at least. It started off with single words, presumably nouns, since there was always an image on the screen. The voice would pronounce the name of the object, or animal. Unfortunately, some of these things weren't exactly recognizable, especially the animals. However, what followed would be another screen with the same thing doing something, or having something done to it, a verb and a noun. Fortunately, the actions were fully animated either from recordings or realistic-looking computer graphics, and also with sound if it was helpful. Otherwise, they might have had to interpret drawings, which could be complicated. Drawings had many conventions that weren't necessarily obviously connected to what they were trying to convey. Speed lines could indicate movement, but that wasn't always the case. They could just be lines. Over time, everyone made some progress with their understanding. Jules did too, but he missed the enhanced learning ability. It was so easy to learn a language with the help of the system. He wondered if there were some other way to achieve that effect, but he didn't know what it would be. Then, after some time, Professor Merkett put away his data pad. This is fascinating. I surely must come back, but I must go inform some of my contacts about what we have discovered. Could you escort me back to town? Quest complete. Investigate the mysterious structure and the language it contains. You have gained experience. Jules was surprised at that. Herbert obviously didn't want to be involved in the situation, yet they still received quest experience. Jules was certain that Herbert had some kind of control, if not total control over that system, so getting rewarded for a quest seemed incongruous. Jules also noticed he didn't receive enough for a level, but that made sense. Robin leveled up, but she was low level, unlike Jules and the rest. 
Over the next few days people flooded to the structures nearer to the cities. This included both adventurers and native Uesmithi. Though it couldn't be said that the cities were all perfectly settled down after the land shift, most people who came wouldn't have any use for the reconstruction efforts since they were scholars and linguists. Nobody had known about these structures before they appeared. Now, they appeared all at once. Was it a coincidence? Nobody was sure. The structures had various parts on Barrett. Some of them were in the sides of mountains and only showed some of the bottom. Various operations were launched to dig or mine the structures out. Since the only known entrances were apparently near the top, they generally started there. However, people soon found that formula was not true across all of the structures. The strangest thing was that the structures could only be opened by adventurers. They had to place their hands on the walls in just the right way and in the right place, and doors would open. Uesmithi natives didn't seem to be able to do anything to open them. However, almost everything looked fine inside. Outside of many worlds, some linguists on Earth also took to studying the language because they found it rather interesting. Some of them paid high prices to purchase wristbands, but those were just the impatient ones. The information would come out of the game, and more importantly, new wristbands were being introduced to the market. After the initial release of about 3 million, it had taken a month for the next batch of wristbands of similar quantity. However, the next group would be coming in two weeks, and it seemed like the batch after that might have even more in the same time frame. Thus, some people were willing to wait. However, with 15 billion people, not everyone could experience the game, even at such seemingly crazy rate of production. Though, perhaps not even 1 billion people might have actually been interested in the game. Isaac, Douglas, Robert, and Jules planned a trip further away from the safe zones of the city. The closer structures were being managed by the Uesmithi, which was reasonable considering this was their planet. However, this also meant that even though Jules and his friends could enter almost as they pleased, at least the facility they helped discover and open, there was still only so much time they could have. They didn't have to be at the facility to view the tutorials, either, since Professor Merkett gave them access to the video files he had gathered and continued to gather. They would be public available at some point as well. Because of that, they didn't need to stay at the facility and wouldn't really be able to do much. Thus, they decided to venture to a further one, which would be more dangerous but also more available. It might even be a different kind of facility, since there had been a few structures that weren't at all like the library and living facility they had found. However, because they were traveling far and through dangerous territory, they felt it would be better to have more people. Thus, they also invited Mary's group, which included Ursula, Ray, and John. They had worked together before some, hunting monsters before the land shift, and everyone was interested in seeing what they could find. Many Worlds Chapter 60 Many Worlds Chapter 60 Almost all of the structures near the cities had been discovered by adventurers, or even a few natives, simply by looking at them. However, the ones further away from the cities were not that easy to get to so only one or two of them had been discovered by adventurers. The rest were discovered by satellite. Normally it would have been hard to spot, but they had a very distinctive look, so as long as any part of them was visible, computers had been able to pick it out. Since this was a huge and sudden change occurring on their planet, Jules might have thought that the Uesmithi would have wanted to take over all of the structures themselves and control them. Maybe that was just his knowledge about the human government speaking, though. However, the Uesmithi hadn't wanted to take things over and hog it for themselves, not the government as a whole, nor the cities. They were very open and cooperative. Maybe that was a requirement to survive on their planet as long as they had. They also seemed capable of accepting massive change with relatively little fuss. Three million humans had all showed up one day, and they only kept them out of the cities because they were surprised and unsure. A few cities had actually just let people in and directly tried to communicate, instead of waiting for the other side to initiate communication. After they found out that the humans were helpful, they took to them very quickly. Certainly, their physical similarities were probably helpful, but Jules assumed that humans had that similar but still alien look he thought the Uesmithi had. Though humans were helpful partly through duress, humans literally could not harm them without being seemingly wiped out of existence. Sometimes before anything happened, they really were mostly helpful. Of course, 
Jules had to admit that there was one more reason for the Uesmithy to not create total claims and lockdowns on the structures, besides just their general culture. They weren't sure if any of the structures had danger inside. The adventurers were semi-immortal and willing to explore them. Another thing that they might not have realized at first was that the adventurers were literally the only way to open them as well. That said, Jules thought that the Uesmithy acted in the manner they did not solely or even mostly because of what they could get from the adventurers, but just because that was the way they were. Jules was glad that he had a computer now. It was a tablet style. It was relatively cheap, but quite useful, especially for its GPS abilities. Though, since GPS was the name for the human system, it wasn't technically called that, but it was basically the same thing. It told him where he was in relation to where he wanted to be. That said, it wasn't like the group could just walk straight there. They did have terrain to worry about. Fortunately, John was pretty good at navigating. He was good at finding relatively gentle slopes when they had to traverse up and down hills. He also found good places to cross the rivers, really streams, if they were being honest, that they had to go past. Real rivers would have required more time for water to build up on higher ground, usually through snow. However, since much of the higher ground had recently been lower ground, the only flows of water were from recent rains. As they walked along, Jules was quite surprised. It seemed strange to think that less than two weeks ago all of this had changed. It still looked unsettled, but besides trees, he found that many of the plants were already growing in what would likely be their new habitats. Animals that had died in the land shift had already had their corpses picked clean. However, there were surprisingly few of those. That made some amount of sense, though because if a land shift were going to wipe them out, it would have happened a long time ago. As they got further from the city, they ran into a few more monsters. However, with the two groups combined, and the fact that they had quite decent equipment and levels, nothing had been too dangerous yet. John was also an excellent scout, with his ability to extend his hearing out into the distance, so they were never successfully ambushed. One thing that Jules hadn't thought about much was what they would eat. They had brought food, of course. They had food for about twice the amount of time they expected to need, preserved in various ways. However, they also ate some monsters that they killed, mostly the ones that blurred the line between animal and monster. Of course, Jules first examined the meat to see if it was safe to eat. Some of it was strange, some of it didn't taste good, but some of it was surprisingly interesting. However, Jules was happy to try it all. It made it feel more like a game again where they were doing things for fun instead of just because they needed to. Not that Jules and his friends hadn't been having fun with many of their activities, but this expedition heightened their adventurous, exploratory spirit. The group also had a few tents, though they weren't necessary. After all, they didn't have to sleep here. However, they did try it once. After all, camping was a luxury back on Earth, since there weren't many places that had anything like nature left. Jules decided it wasn't for him, but he did actually manage to sleep. Hiking for most of the day made him quite tired. The tents were also useful as meeting locations. Not everyone could always log on at exactly the same time, so those who got on earlier might wander around and explore a bit, though never alone. They didn't want to die, because it would be unpleasant, and they would also be sent back to near the city. Unless there were respawn points out in the wilderness they didn't know about, and they weren't sure on the requirements to activate them if they hadn't been found. Nobody had experimented that much with them, for obvious reasons. Going from city to city seemed to set them to the new locations, but there were large expanses in between. So far, everyone seemed to have respawned near the cities, but there could have been more. Though, Jules supposed they would have been found by satellite. On the other hand, nobody had asked about them. The Uesmithy might have assumed that the adventurers knew where they all were or they might not have looked for them in specific. 